Hesiod, the Homeric Hymns, and Homerica Asterisk 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 Hesiod, the Homeric Hymns, and Homerica by Homer and Hesiod Contents Preparers Note Preface Introduction General The Puteum School Life of Hesiod The Hesiodic Poems I The Works and Days II the genealogical poems date of the Hesiodic poems literary value of Homer the Ionic school the Trojan cycle the Homeric hymns the epigrams of Homer the burlesque poems the contest of Homer and Hesiod bibliography Hesiod Hesiod's works and days the divination by birds the astronomy the precepts of Chiron the great works the Idaean dactyls the theogony the catalogues of women and EOI Ie the shield of Heracles the marriage of six the great Eoie the melampodia the Egemius fragments of unknown position doubtful fragments the Homeric hymns I to Dionysius II to. to Demeter III to Apollo IV to Hermes V to Aphrodite VI to Aphrodite VII to Dionysius VIII to Ars 9 to Artemis X to Aphrodite 11 to Athena 12 to Hera 13 to Demeter 14 to the mother of the gods 15 to Heracles the lion-hearted 16 to Asclepius 17 to the Dioscuri 18 to Hermes 19 to Pan XX to Hephaestus XXI to Apollo XXII to Poseidon 23 to the son of Kronos, Most High Xiv to Hestia XXV to the Muses and Apollo XXVI to Dionysius XXI to Artemis Xate, to Athena Xix, to Hestia XXX, to Earth the mother of all XXXI, to Helios Xxi, to Selene XXXII, to the Dioscuri the epigrams of Homer the epic cycle the war of the titans the story of Oedipus the Thebaid the epigony the Cypria the Ethiopis the little Iliad the sack of Ilium the returns the telegony Homerica the expedition of Amphiroars the taking of Eshalia the Phocase the Margites the Circopes the battle of frogs and mice the contest of Homer and Hesiod end knots this file contains Translations of the following works, Hesiod, Works and Days, The Theogony, Fragments of the Catalogues of Women and the EOIAE, The Shield of Heracles, Attributed to Hesiod, and Fragments of Various Works Attributed to Hesiod. Homer, The Homeric Hymns, The Epigrams of Homer, Both Attributed to Homer. Various fragments of the epic cycle, parts of which are sometimes attributed to Homer, fragments of other epic poems attributed to Homer, the battle of frogs and mice, and the contest of Homer and Hesiod. This file contains only that portion of the book in English, Greek texts are excluded. Where Greek characters appear in the original English text, transcription in capitals is substituted. Project Gutenberg Editor's Note, 262 Footnotes Notes previously scattered through the text have been moved to the end of the file and each given a unique number. There are links to and from each footnote. Preparers note in order to make this file more accessible to the average computer user, the preparer has found it necessary to rearrange some of the material. 
the preparer takes full responsibility for his choice of arrangement. A few end knots have been added by the preparer, and some additions have been supplied to the original end knots of Mr. Evelyn White's. Where this occurs I have noted the addition with my initials DBK. Some end knots, particularly those concerning textual variations in the ancient Greek text, are here omitted. Preface This volume contains practically all that remains of the post-Homeric and pre-academic epic poetry. I have for the most part formed my own text. In the case of Hesiod I have been able to use independent collations of several MSS. By Dr. W. H. D. Rouse, otherwise I have depended on the apparatus criticus of the several editions, especially that of Attuk, 1902. The arrangement adopted in this edition by which the complete and fragmentary poems are restored to the order in which they would probably have appeared had the Hesiodic corpus survived intact, is unusual, but should not need apology. The true place for the catalogues, for example, fragmentary as they are, is certainly after the Theogony. In preparing the text of the Homeric hymns my chief debt, and it is a heavy one, is to the edition of Allen and Sykes, 1904, and to the series of articles in the Journal of Hellenic Studies, Vols 15 SQQ, by T. W. Allen. To the same scholar and to the delegates of the Clarendon Press I am greatly indebted for permission to use the restorations of the hymn to Demeter. Lines 387 to 401 and 462 to 470, printed in the Oxford text of 1912. Of the fragments of the epic cycle I have given only such as seemed to possess distinct importance or interest, and in doing so have relied mostly upon Kinkel's collection and on the fifth volume of the Oxford Homer, 1912. The texts of the Patricomi Omashia and of the Contest of Homer and Hesiod are those of Baumeister and Flack respectively, where I have diverged from these, the fact has been noted. Owing to the circumstances of the present time I have been prevented from giving to the introduction that full revision which I should have desired. Hugh G. Evelyn White, Rampton, N.R. Cambridge. The 9th of September, 1914. Introduction General The Early Greek Epic, that is, poetry as a natural and popular, and not, as it became later, an artificial and academic literary form, passed through the usual three phases, of development, of maturity, and of decline. No fragments which can be identified as belonging to the first period survive to give us even a general idea of the history of the earliest epic and we are therefore thrown back upon the evidence of analogy from other forms of literature and of inference from the two great epics which have come down to us. So reconstructed, the earliest period appears to us as a time of slow development in which the characteristic epic meter, diction, and structure grew up slowly from crude elements and were improved until the verge of maturity was reached. The second period, which produced the Iliad and the Odyssey, needs no description here, but it is very important to observe the effect of these poems on the course of post-Homeric epic. As the supreme perfection and universality of the Iliad and the Odyssey cast into oblivion whatever pre-Homeric poets had essayed, 
so these same qualities exercised a paralyzing influence over the successors of Homer. If they continued to sing like their great predecessor of romantic themes, they were drawn as by a kind of magnetic attraction into the Homeric style and manner of treatment, and became mere echoes of the Homeric voice, in a word. Homer had so completely exhausted the epic genre, that after him further efforts were doomed to be merely conventional. Only the rare and exceptional genius of Virgil and Milton could use the Homeric medium without loss of individuality, and this quality none of the later epic poets seem to have possessed. Freedom from the domination of the great tradition could only be found by seeking new subjects, and such freedom was really only illusionary, since romantic subjects alone are suitable for epic treatment. In its third period, therefore, epic poetry shows two divergent tendencies. In Ionia and the islands the epic poets followed the Homeric tradition, singing of romantic subjects in the now stereotyped heroic style, and showing originality only in their choice of legends hitherto neglected or summarily and imperfectly treated. In continental Greece 1101, on the other hand, but especially in Gitea, a new form of epic sprang up, which for the romance and pathos of the Ionian school substituted the practical and matter-of-fact. It dealt in moral and practical maxims, in information on technical subjects which are of service in daily life, agriculture, astronomy, augury, and the calendar in matters of religion and in tracing the genealogies of men. Its attitude is summed up in the words of the muses to the writer of the Theogony, we can tell many a feigned tale to look like truth, but we can, when we will, utter the truth, Theogony 26-27. Such a poetry could not be permanently successful, because the subjects of which it treats, if susceptible of poetic treatment at all, were certainly not suited for epic treatment, where unity of action which will sustain interest, and to which each part should contribute, is absolutely necessary. While, therefore, an epic like the Odyssey is an organism and dramatic in structure, a work such as the Theogony is a merely artificial collocation of facts, and, at best, a pageant. It is not surprising, therefore, to find that from the first the Butean school is forced to season its matter with romantic episodes, and that later it tends more and more to revert, as in the Shield of Heracles, to the Homeric tradition. The Butean school How did the continental school of epic poetry arise? There is little definite material for an answer to this question, but the probability is that there were at least three contributory causes. First, it is likely that before the rise of the Ionian epos there existed in Gitea a purely popular and indigenous poetry of a crude form. It comprised, we may suppose, versified proverbs and precepts relating to life in general, agricultural maxims, weather law, and the like. In this sense the Butean poetry may be taken to have its German maxims similar to our English till may be out, ne'er cast a cloud or a rainbow in the morning is the shepherd's warning. Secondly and thirdly we may ascribe the rise of the new epic to the nature of the Butean people and, as already remarked, to a spirit of revolt against the old epic. The Butians, 
people of the class of which Hesiod represents himself to be the type, were essentially unromantic. Their daily needs marked the general limit of their ideals, and, as a class, they cared little for works of fancy, for pathos, or for fine thought as such. To a people of this nature the Homeric epos would be unacceptable, and the post-Homeric epic, with its conventional atmosphere, its trite and hackneyed diction, and its insincere sentiment, would be anathema. We can imagine, therefore, that among such folk a settler, of Aeolic origin like Hesiod, who clearly was well acquainted with the Ionian epos, would naturally see that the only outlet for his gifts lay in applying epic poetry to new themes acceptable to his hearers. Though the poems of the Pythian school 1102 were unanimously assigned to Hesiod down to the age of Alexandrian criticism, they were clearly neither the work of one man nor even of one period, some, doubtless, were fraudulently fathered on him in order to gain currency, but it is probable that most came to be regarded as his partly because of their general character, and partly because the names of their real authors were lost. One fact in this attribution is remarkable, the veneration paid to Hesiod. Life of Hesiod Our information respecting Hesiod is derived in the main from notices and allusions in the works attributed to him, and to these must be added traditions concerning his death and burial gathered from later writers. Hesiod's father, whose name, by a perversion of works and days, 299 Purse Dion Genos to Purse, Dion Genos, was thought to have been Dias, was a native of Cuminealis, where he was a seafaring trader and, perhaps, also a farmer. He was forced by poverty to leave his native place, and returned to continental Greece, where he settled at a screen near Thespiae in Butea, Works and Days, 636 ff. Either in Cum or Ascra, two sons, Hesiod and Perses, were born to the settler, and these, after his death, divided the farm between them. Perses, however, who is represented as an idler and spendthrift, obtained and kept the larger share by bribing the corrupt lords who ruled from Thespiae, works and days. 37 to 39. While his brother wasted his patrimony and ultimately came to want, works and days, 34 ff. Hesiod lived a farmer's life until, according to the very early tradition preserved by the author of the Theogony, 22 to 23. The muses met him as he was tending sheep on Mount Helicon and taught him a glorious song, doubtless the works and days. The only other personal references to his victory in a poetical contest at the funeral games of Amphidamars at Chalcis in Euboea, where he won the prize, a tripod, which he dedicated to the muses of Helicon, works and days. 651 to 9. Before we go on to the story of Hesiod's death, it will be well to inquire how far the autobiographical notices can be treated as historical, especially as many critics treat some, or all of them, as spurious. In the first place attempts have been made to show that Hesiod is a significant name and therefore fictitious, it is only necessary to mention Goatling's derivation from IEMI to Odos, which would make Hesiod mean the guide in virtues and technical arts, and to refer to the pitiful attempts in the Etymologicum Magnu, 
SV, H, Ejaldus, to show how prejudiced and lacking even in plausibility such efforts are. It seems certain that Hesiod stands as a proper name in the fullest sense. Secondly, Hesiod claims that his father, if not he himself, came from Aeolus and settled in Butea. There is fairly definite evidence to warrant our acceptance of this. The dialect of the works and days is shown by Atuk 1103 to contain distinct Aeolisms apart from those which formed part of the general stock of epic poetry and that this Aeolic-speaking poet was a Butean of Ascra seems even more certain, since the tradition is never once disputed, insignificant though the place was, even before its destruction by the Thespians. Again, Hesiod's story of his relations with his brother Perses have been treated with skepticism, see Murray, A.N.C. GK Literature, pp. 53-54 Perses, it is urged, is clearly a mere dummy, set up to be the target for the poet's exhortations. On such a matter precise evidence is naturally not forthcoming, but all probability is against the skeptical view. For one, if the quarrel between the brothers were a fiction, we should expect it to be detailed at length and not noticed allusively and rather obscurely, as we find it, too, as millimeter. Quasit remark, if the poet needed a lay figure the ordinary practice was to introduce some mythological person, as, in fact, is done in the precepts of Chiron. In a word, there is no more solid ground for treating Perses and his quarrel with Hesiod as fictitious than there would be for treating Cyanus, the friend of Theonis, as mythical. Thirdly, there is the passage in the Theogony relating to Hesiod and the Muses. It is surely an error to suppose that lines 22 to 35 all refer to Hesiod. Rather, the author of the Theogony tells the story of his own inspiration by the same muses who once taught Hesiod glorious song. The lines 22 to 3 are therefore a very early piece of tradition about Hesiod, and though the appearance of muses must be treated as a graceful fiction, we find that a writer later than the works and days by perhaps no more than three quarters of a century, believed in the actuality of Hesiod and in his life as a farmer or shepherd. Lastly, there is the famous story of the contest in song at Chalcis. In later times the modest version in the works and days was elaborated first by making Homer the opponent whom Hesiod conquered, while a later period exercised its ingenuity in working up the story of the contest into the elaborate form in which it still survives. Finally the contest, in which the two poets contended with hymns to Apollo 1104, was transferred to Delos. These developments certainly need no consideration, are we to say the same of the passage in the works and days? Critics from Plutarch downwards have almost unanimously rejected the lines 654 to 662, on the ground that Hesiod's Amphidamas is the hero of the Lelantine Wars between Chalcis and Eritrea whose death may be placed circa 705 B.C. a date which is obviously too low for the genuine Hesiod. Nevertheless, there is much to be said in defense of the passage. Hesiod's claim in the works and days is modest, since he neither pretends to have met Homer, 
nor to have sung in any but an impromptu, local festival, so that the supposed interpolation lacks a sufficient motive. And there is nothing in the context to show that Hesiod's Amphidamas is to be identified with that Amphidamas whom Plutarch alone connects with the Lelantine War. The name may have been borne by an earlier Chalcidian, an ancestor, perhaps, of the person to whom Plutarch refers. The story of the end of Hesiod may be told in outline. After the contest at Chalcis, Hesiod went to Delphi and there was warned that the issue of death should overtake him in the fair grove of Nemenzus. Avoiding therefore Nemi on the Isthmus of Corinth, to which he supposed the oracle to refer, Hesiod retired to Eno in Lacris where he was entertained by Amphiphans and Ganieta, sons of a certain Phegeus. This place, however, was also sacred to Nemenzus, and the poet, suspected by his hosts of having seduced their sister 1105, was murdered there. His body, cast into the sea, was brought to shore by dolphins and buried at Eno, or, according to Plutarch, at Iskra at a later time his bones were removed to Orchomenus. The whole story is full of miraculous elements, and the various authorities disagree on numerous points of detail. The tradition seems, however, to be constant in declaring that Hesiod was murdered and buried at Eno, and in this respect it is at least as old as the time of Thucydides. In conclusion it may be worthwhile to add the graceful epigram of Alsus of Messene, Palatine Anthology, 755. When in the shady Lacrian grove Hesiod lay dead, the nymphs washed his body with water from their own springs, and heaped high his grave, and thereon the goat herds sprinkled offerings of milk mingled with yellow honey, such was the utterance of the nine muses that he breathed forth that old man who had tasted of their pure springs. The Hesiodic poems The Hesiodic poems fall into two groups according as they are didactic, technical or gnomic, or genealogical. The first group centers round the works and days, the second round the theogony. Either works and days the poem consists of four main sections. A. After the prelude, which Pausanias failed to find in the ancient copy engraved on lead seen by him on Mount Helicon, comes a general exhortation to industry. It begins with the allegory of the two strifes, who stand for wholesome emulation and quarrelsomeness respectively. Then by means of the myth of Padora the poet shows how evil and the need for work first arose, and goes on to describe the five ages of the world, tracing the gradual increase in evil, and emphasizing the present miserable condition of the world, a condition in which struggle is inevitable. Next, after the fable of the hawk and nightingale, which serves as a condemnation of violence and injustice, the poet passes on to contrast the blessing which righteousness brings to a nation, and the punishment which heaven sends down upon the violent, and the section concludes with a series of precepts on industry and prudent conduct generally. b. The second section shows how a man may escape want and misery by industry and care both in agriculture and in trading by sea. Neither subject, it should be carefully noted, is treated in any way comprehensively. c. 
the third part is occupied with miscellaneous precepts relating mostly to actions of domestic and everyday life and conduct which have little or no connection with one another. d. The final section is taken up with a series of notices on the days of the month which are favorable or unfavorable for agricultural and other operations. It is from the second and fourth sections that the poem takes its name. At first sight such a work seems to be a miscellany of myths, technical advice, moral precepts, and folklore maxims without any unifying principle, and critics have readily taken the view that the whole is a canto of fragments or short poems worked up by a redactor. Very probably Hesiod used much material of a far older date, just as Shakespeare used the Gesta Romanorum, old chronicles, and old plays, but close inspection will show that the works and days has a real unity and that the picturesque title is somewhat misleading. The poem has properly no technical object at all, but is moral. Its real aim is to show men how best to live in a difficult world. So viewed the four seemingly independent sections will be found to be linked together in a real bond of unity. Such a connection between the first and second sections is easily seen, but the links between these and the third and fourth are no less real. To make life go tolerably smoothly it is most important to be just and to know how to win a livelihood, but happiness also largely depends on prudence and care both in social and home life as well, and not least on avoidance of actions which offend supernatural powers and bring ill luck. And finally, if your industry is to be fruitful. You must know what days are suitable for various kinds of work. This moral aim, as opposed to the currently accepted technical aim of the poem, explains the otherwise puzzling incompleteness of the instructions on farming and seafaring. Of the Hesiodic poems similar in character to the works and days, only the scantiest fragments survive. One at least of these, the divination by birds, was, as we know from Proclus, attached to the end of the works until it was rejected by Apollonius Rhodius. Doubtless it continued the same theme of how to live, showing how man can avoid disasters by attending to the omens to be drawn from birds. It is possible that the astronomy or astrology, as Plutarch calls it, was in turn appended to the divination. It certainly gave some account of the principal constellations, their dates of rising and setting, and the legends connected with them, and probably showed how these influenced human affairs or might be used as guides. The Precepts of Chiron was a didactic poem made up of moral and practical precepts, resembling the gnomic sections of the works and days, addressed by the centaur Chiron to his pupil Achilles. Even less is known of the poem called The Great Works. The title implies that it was similar in subject to the second section of the works and days, but longer. Possible references in Roman writers 1106 indicate that among the subjects dealt with were the cultivation of the vine and olive and various herbs. The inclusion of the judgment of Radamanthus, Frag 1 If a man sow evil, he shall reap evil indicates a gnomic element and the note by Proclus 1107 on works and days 126 makes it likely that metals also were dealt with. It is therefore possible that another lost poem, 
the Idaean dactyls, which dealt with the discovery of metals and their working, was appended to, or even was a part of the great works, just as the divination by birds was appended to the works and days. To the genealogical poems the only complete poem of the genealogical group is the Theogony, which traces from the beginning of things the descent and vicissitudes of the families of the gods. Like the works and days this poem has no dramatic plot, but its unifying principle is clear and simple. The gods are classified chronologically. As soon as one generation is catalogued, the poet goes on to detail the offspring of each member of that generation. Exceptions are only made in special cases, as the sons of Iapetus, LL 507-616, whose place is accounted for by their treatment by Zeus. The chief landmarks in the poem are as follows, after the first 103 lines, which contain at least three distinct preludes, three primeval beings are introduced, chaos, earth, and eros, here an indefinite reproductive influence. Of these three, earth produces heaven to whom she bears the titans the Cyclopes and the Hundred-Handed Giants. The Titans, oppressed by their father, revolt at the instigation of Earth, under the leadership of Kronos, and as a result Heaven and Earth are separated, and Kronos reigns over the universe. Kronos knowing that he is destined to be overcome by one of his children, swallows each one of them as they are born until Zeus, saved by Rhea, grows up and overcomes Kronos in some struggle which is not described. Kronos is forced to vomit up the children he had swallowed, and these with Zeus divide the universe between them, like a human estate. Two events mark the early reign of Zeus, the war with the Titans and the overthrow of Typhus and as Zeus is still reigning the poet can only go on to give a list of gods born to Zeus by various goddesses. After this he formally bids farewell to the cosmic and Olympian deities and enumerates the sons born of goddess to mortals. The poem closes with an invocation of the muses to sing of the tribe of women. This conclusion served to link the Theogony to what must have been a distinct poem, the Catalogues of Women. This work was divided into four, Sudas says five, books, the last one, or two, of which was known as the EOIA and may have been again a distinct poem, the curious title will be explained presently. The catalogues proper were a series of genealogies which traced the Hellenic race, or its more important peoples and families, from a common ancestor. The reason why women are so prominent is obvious, since most families and tribes claim to be descended from a god. The only safe clue to their origin was through a mortal woman beloved by that god and it has also been pointed out that Mutterigd still left its traces in northern Greece in historical times. The following analysis, after Mark Scheffel, 1108 will show the principle of its composition. From Prometheus and Pronoia sprang Deucalion and Pyrrha, the only survivors of the Deluge, who had a son Helen, Frag 1, the reputed ancestor of the whole Hellenic race. From the daughters of Deucalion sprang Magnus and Macedon, ancestors of the Magnesians and Macedonians, who are thus represented as cousins to the true Hellenic stock. Helen had three sons, Dorus, Xuthus, 
and Eolus, parents of the Dorian, Ionic and Aeolian races, and the offspring of these was then detailed. In one instance a considerable and characteristic section can be traced from extant fragments and notices, Salmonius, son of Aeolus, had a daughter Teo who bore to Poseidon two sons, Peleus and Nelus, the latter of these, king of Pylos, refused Heracles purification for the murder of Iphitus, whereupon Heracles attacked and sacked Pylos, killing amongst the other sons of Nelus Periclymenus, who had the power of changing himself into all manner of shapes. From this slaughter Nelus alone escaped, frags 13, and 10 to 12. This summary shows the general principle of arrangement of the catalogues, each line seems to have been dealt with in turn, and the monotony was relieved as far as possible by a brief relation of famous adventures connected with any of the personages as in the case of Atalanta and Hippomenes, Frag 14. Similarly the story of the Argonauts appears from the fragments, 37-42, to, to have been told in some detail. This tendency to introduce romantic episodes led to an important development. Several poems are ascribed to Hesiod such as the Epithalamium of Peleus and Thetis, the descent of Theseus into Hades, or the circuit of the earth, which must have been connected with the story of Phineus and the Harpies, and so with the Argonaut legend, which yet seem to have belonged to the catalogues. It is highly probable that these poems were interpolations into the catalogues expanded by later poets from more summary notices in the genuine Hesiodic work and subsequently detached from their contexts and treated as independent. This is definitely known to be true of the Shield of Heracles the first 53 lines of which belong to the fourth book of the catalogues, and almost certainly applies to other episodes, such as the suitors of Helen 1109, the daughters of Leucippus, and the marriage of Six, which last Plutarch mentions as interpolated in the works of Hesiod. To the catalogues, as we have said, was appended another work, the EOIA. The title seems to have arisen in the following way 1110. The catalogues probably ended, E.P. Theogony 963 ff. With some such passage as this, but now, ye muses, sing of the tribes of women with whom the sons of heaven were joined in love, women preeminent above their fellows in beauty, such as was Niobe. Dot. Each succeeding heroine was then introduced by the formula or such as was, cp frags 88, 92, etc. A large fragment of the EOIA is extant at the beginning of the Shield of Heracles, which may be mentioned here. The supplement, LL 57-480, is nominally Heracles and Cycnus, but the greater part is taken up with an inferior description of the Shield of Heracles, in imitation of the Homeric Shield of Achilles. Iliad 18478 ff. Nothing shows more clearly the collapse of the principles of the Hesiodic school than this ultimate servile dependence upon Homeric models. At the close of the shield Heracles goes on to Trachis to the house of Six, and this warning suggests that the marriage of six may have come immediately after the or such as was of Alcmena in the EOIA, possibly Halcyn, the wife of six, was one of the heroines sung in the poem, 
and the original section was developed into the marriage, although what form the poem took is unknown. Next to the EOIAE and the poems which seem to have been developed from it, it is natural to place the great EOIAE. This, again, as we know from fragments, was a list of heroines who bear children to the gods, from the title we must suppose it to have been much longer than the simple EOIAE, but its extent is unknown. Learman remarking that the heroines are all Butione and Thessalion, while the heroines of the catalogues belong to all parts of the Greek world, believes the author to have been either a Butione or Thessalion. Two other poems are ascribed to Hesiod. Of these the Aegemius, also ascribed by Athena Ouse to Circups of Miletus, is thought by Valconair to deal with the war of Egemus against the Lepithae and the aid furnished to him by Heracles, and with the history of Egemius and his sons. Otto Muller suggests that the introduction of Thetis and of Fricus, frags 1-2, is to be connected with notices of the allies of the Lepithae from Phthetis and Iolchus and that the story of Io was incidental to a narrative of Heracles' expedition against Euboea. The remaining poem, The Melampodia, was a work in three books, whose plan it is impossible to recover. Its subject, however, seems to have been the histories of famous seers like Mopsus, Calchas, and Tiresias and it probably took its name from Melampus, the most famous of them all. Date of the Hesiodic poems There is no doubt that the works and days is the oldest, as it is the most original, of the Hesiodic poems. It seems to be distinctly earlier than the Theogony, which refers to it, apparently, as a poem already renowned. Two considerations help us to fix a relative date for the works. 1. In diction, dialect and style it is obviously dependent upon Homer, and is therefore considerably later than the Iliad and Odyssey. Moreover, as we have seen, it is in revolt against the Romantic school, already grown decadent, and while the Digamar is still living, it is obviously growing weak, and is by no means uniformly effective. 2. On the other hand while tradition steadily puts the cyclic poets at various dates from 776 BC downwards, it is equally consistent in regarding Homer and Hesiod as prehistoric. Herodotus indeed puts both poets 400 years before his own time, that is, at about 830 to 820 BC, and the evidence stated above points to the middle of the 9th century as the probable date for the works and days. The Theogony might be tentatively placed a century later and the catalogues and EOIAE are again later, but not greatly later, than the Theogony. The shield of Heracles may be ascribed to the later half of the 7th century, but there is not evidence enough to show whether the other developed poems are to be regarded as of a date so low as this. Literary value of Homer Quintilian's 1111 judgment on Hesiod that he rarely rises to great heights, and to him is given the palm in the middle class of speech is just, but is liable to give a wrong impression. Hesiod has nothing that remotely approaches such scenes as that between Priam and Achilles or the pathos of Andromache's preparations for Hector's return, even as he was falling before the walls of Troy, but in matters that come within the range of ordinary experience, he rarely fails to rise to the appropriate level. 
Take, for instance, the description of the Iron Age, works and days, 182 ff. With its catalogue of wrongdoings and violence ever increasing until Eidos and Nemesis are forced to leave mankind who thenceforward shall have no remedy against evil. Such occasions, however, rarely occur and are perhaps not characteristic of Hesiod's genius, if we would see Hesiod at his best, in his most natural vein. We must turn to such a passage as that which he himself, according to the compiler of the contest of Hesiod and Homer, selected as best in all his work, when the Pleiades, Atlas Daughters, begin to rise, works and days, 383 ff. The value of such a passage cannot be analysed. It can only be said that given such a subject, this alone is the right method of treatment. Hesiod's diction is in the main Homeric, but one of his charms is the use of quaint allusive phrases derived, perhaps, from a pre-Hesiodic peasant poetry. Thus the season when Boreas blows is the time when the boneless one gnaws his foot by his fireless hearth in his cheerless house. To cut one's nails is to sever the withered from the quick upon that which has five branches. Similarly the burglar is the day sleeper, and the serpent is the hairless one. Very similar is his reference to seasons through what happens or is done in that season. When the house carrier, fleeing the Pleiades, climbs up the plants from the earth, is the season for harvesting, or when the artichoke flowers and the clicking grasshopper, seated in a tree, pours down his shrill song, is the time for rest. Hesiod's charm lies in his childlike and sincere knived in his unaffected interest in and picturesque view of nature and all that happens in nature. These qualities, it is true, are those preeminently of the works and days. The literary values of the Theogony are of a more technical character, skill in ordering and disposing long lists of names. Sure judgment in seasoning a monotonous subject with marvellous incidents or episodes, and no mean imagination in depicting the awful, as is shown in the description of Tartarus, LL 736-745. Yet it remains true that Hesiod's distinctive title to a high place in Greek literature lies in the very fact of his freedom from classic form, and his grave, and yet childlike, outlook upon his world. The Ionic School The Ionic School of epic poetry was, as we have seen, dominated by the Homeric tradition, and while the style and method of treatment are Homeric, it is natural that the Ionic poets refrained from cultivating the ground tilled by Homer, and chose for treatment legends which lay beyond the range of the Iliad and Odyssey. Equally natural it is that they should have particularly selected various phases of the tale of Troy which preceded or followed the action of the Iliad or Odyssey. In this way, Without any preconceived intention, a body of epic poetry was built up by various writers which covered the whole Trojan story. But the entire range of heroic legend was open to these poets, and other clusters of epics grew up dealing particularly with the famous story of the bees, while others dealt with the beginnings of the world and the wars of heaven. In the end there existed a kind of epic history of the world, as known to the Greeks, down to the death of Odysseus, when the heroic age ended. In the Alexandrian age these poems were arranged in chronological order, apparently by Xenodotus of Ephesus, 
at the beginning of the 3rd century BC. At a later time the term cycle, round or course, was given to this collection. Of all this mass of epic poetry only the scantiest fragments survive, but happily Photius has preserved to us an abrigment of the synopsis made of each poem of the Trojan cycle by Proclus, i.e. Eutychius Proclus of Sicca. The pre-Trojan poems of the cycle may be noticed first. The Titanomachy ascribed both to Eumelus of Corinth and to Arctanus of Miletus, began with a kind of theogony which told of the union of heaven and earth and of their offspring the Cyclopes and the hundred-handed giants. How the poem proceeded we have no means of knowing, but we may suppose that in character it was not unlike the short account of the Titan War found in the Hesiodic Theogony, 617 ff. What links bound the Titanomachy to the Theban cycle is not clear. This latter group was formed of three poems, the story of Oedipus, the Thebae, and the Epigony. Of the Oedipodea practically nothing is known, though on the assurance of Athena Ouse, 7277 e, that Sophocles followed the epic cycle closely in the plots of his plays, we may suppose that in outline the story corresponded closely to the history of Oedipus as it is found in the Oedipus Tyrannus. The Thebae seems to have begun with the origin of the fatal quarrel between Etiocles and Polynices in the curse called down upon them by their father in his misery. The story was thence carried down to the end of the expedition under Polynices, Adrastus and Amphirus against the bees. The Epigony, ascribed to Antimachus of Tios recounted the expedition of the afterborn against the bees, and the sack of the city. The Trojan cycle six epics with the Iliad and the Odyssey made up the Trojan cycle, the Cyprian Lays, the Iliad, the Ethiopis, the Little Iliad, the sack of Troy, the Returns, the Odyssey, and the Telegony. It has been assumed in the foregoing pages that the poems of the Trojan cycle are later than the Homeric poems, but, as the opposite view has been held, the reasons for this assumption must now be given. 1. Tradition puts Homer and the Homeric poems proper back in the ages before chronological history began and at the same time assigns the purely cyclic poems to definite authors who are dated from the first Olympiad, 776 BC, downwards. This tradition cannot be purely arbitrary. 2. The cyclic poets, as we can see from the abstract of Proclus, were careful not to trespass upon ground already occupied by Homer. Thus, when we find that in the returns all the prominent Greek heroes except Odysseus are accounted for, we are forced to believe that the author of this poem knew the Odyssey and judged it unnecessary to deal in full with that hero's adventures. 1112 In a word, the cyclic poems are written round the Iliad and the Odyssey. 3. The general structure of these epics is clearly imitative. As M. M. Quasit remark, the abusive the sits in the Ethiopis is clearly copied from the the sits of the Iliad, in the same poem Antilochus slain by Memon and avenged by Achilles, is obviously modelled on Patroclus. 4. The geographical knowledge of a poem like The Returns is far wider and more precise than that of the Odyssey. 5. Moreover, 
in the cyclic poem's epic is clearly degenerating morally, if the expression may be used. The chief greatness of the Iliad is in the character of the heroes Achilles and Hector rather than in the actual events which take place, in the cyclic writers facts rather than character are the objects of interest, and events are so packed together as to leave no space for any exhibition of the play of moral forces. All these reasons justify the view that the poems with which we now have to deal were later than the Iliad and Odyssey, and if we must recognize the possibility of some conventionality in the received dating, we may feel confident that it is at least approximately just. The earliest of the post-Homeric epics of Troy are apparently the Ethiopis and the Sack of Ilium both ascribed to Arctanus of Miletus who is said to have flourished in the first Olympiad, 776 BC. He set himself to finish the tale of Troy, which, so far as events were concerned, had been left half told by Homer, by tracing the course of events after the close of the Iliad. The Ethiopis thus included the coming of the Amazon Penthesile to help the Trojans after the fall of Hector and her death, the similar arrival and fall of the Ethiopian Memon, the death of Achilles under the Arrow of Paris, and the dispute between Odysseus and Aras for the arms of Achilles. The sack of Ilium 1113 as analyzed by Proclus was very similar to Virgil's version in Aeneid II, comprising the episodes of the wooden horse, of Laocoon, of Sinon, the return of the Achaeans from Tenedos, the actual sack of Troy, the division of spoils and the burning of the city. Leestures or Leestures as Pausanias calls him, of Pyrrha or Metilne is dated at about 660 BC. In his little Iliad he undertook to elaborate the sack as related by Arctanus. His work included the adjugment of the arms of Achilles to Odysseus, the madness of Aras, the bringing of Philoctetes from Lemos and his cure the coming to the war of Neoptolemus who slays Eurypolis, son of Telephus, the making of the wooden horse, the spying of Odysseus and his theft, along with Diomedes, of the Palladium. The analysis concludes with the admission of the wooden horse into Troy by the Trojans. It is known, however, Aristotle, Poetics, 23. Pausanias, x. 25-27, that the Little Iliad also contained a description of the sack of Troy. It is probable that this and other superfluous incidents disappeared after the Alexandrian arrangement of the poems in the cycle, either as the result of some later recension, or merely through disuse or Proclus may have thought it unnecessary to give the accounts by Leestius and Arctanus of the same incident. The Cyprian Lays, ascribed to Stasinus of Cyprus 1114, but also to Hexinus of Salamis, was designed to do for the events preceding the action of the Iliad what Arctanus had done for the later phases of the Trojan War. The Cypria begins with the first causes of the war, the purpose of Zeus to relieve the overburdened earth, the apple of discord, the rape of Helen. Then follow the incidents connected with the gathering of the Achaeans and their ultimate landing in Troy, and the story of the war is detailed up to the quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon with which the Iliad begins. These four poems rounded off the story of the Iliad, and it only remained to connect this enlarged version with the Odyssey. 
This was done by means of the returns, a poem in five books ascribed to Agias or Hegias of Trozen, which begins where the sack of Troy ends. It told of the dispute between Agamemnon and Menlaws, the departure from Troy of Menlaws, the fortunes of the lesser heroes, the return and tragic death of Agamemnon, and the vengeance of Orists on Aegisthus. The story ends with the return home of Menlaws, which brings the general narrative up to the beginning of the Odyssey. But the Odyssey itself left much untold, what, for example, happened in Ithaca after the slaying of the suitors, and what was the ultimate fate of Odysseus. The answer to these questions was supplied by the Telegoni, a poem in two books by Eugamon of Siren, Fluid 568 BC. It told of the adventures of Odysseus in Thesprotis after the killing of the suitors, of his return to Ithaca, and his death at the hands of Telegonus, his son by Circe. The epic ended by disposing of the surviving personages in a double marriage, Telemachus wedding Circe, and Telegonus Penelope. The end of the cycle marks also the end of the heroic age. The Homeric Hymns The collection of 33 hymns, ascribed to Homer, is the last considerable work of the epic school, and seems, on the whole, to be later than the cyclic poems. It cannot be definitely assigned either to the Ionian or continental schools. For while the romantic element is very strong, there is a distinct genealogical interest, and in matters of diction and style the influences of both Hesiod and Homer are well marked. The date of the formation of the collection as such is unknown. Diodorus Siculus, Temp. Augustus, is the first to mention such a body of poetry and it is likely enough that this is, at least substantially, the one which has come down to us. Thucydides quotes the Delian hymn to Apollo, and it is possible that the Homeric corpus of his day also contained other of the more important hymns. Conceivably the collection was arranged in the Alexandrian period. Thucydides in quoting the hymn to Apollo, calls it Pruemion, which ordinarily means a prelude chanted by a rhapsode before recitation of a lay from Homer, and such hymns as Numbers 6, Xxi, Xxi, are clearly preludes in the strict sense, in no Xxi, for example, after celebrating Helios. The poet declares he will next sing of the race of mortal men, the demigods. But it may fairly be doubted whether such hymns as those to Demeter, to Apollo, 3, Hermes, 4, Aphrodite, v, can have been real preludes, in spite of the closing formula and now I will pass on to another hymn. The view taken by Allen and Sykes, amongst other scholars, is doubtless right, that these longer hymns are only technically preludes and show to what disproportionate lengths a simple literacy form can be developed. The hymns to Pan, 19, to Dionysius, XV, to Hestia and Hermes, VI seem to have been designed for use at definite religious festivals, apart from recitations. With the exception perhaps of the hymn to us, 8, no item in the collection can be regarded as either devotional or liturgical. The hymn is doubtless a very ancient form, but if no example of extreme antiquity survive this must be put down to the fact that until the age of literary consciousness, such things are not preserved. First, 
apparently, in the collection stood the hymn to Dionysius, of which only two fragments now survive. While it appears to have been a hymn of the longer type 1115, we have no evidence to show either its scope or date. The hymn to Demeter, extant only in the MS discovered by Mathie at Moscow, describes the seizure of Persephone by Hads, the grief of Demeter, her stay at Eleusi, and her vengeance on gods and men by causing famine. In the end Zeus is forced to bring Persephone back from the lower world, but the goddess, by the contriving of Hads, still remains partly a deity of the lower world. In memory of her sorrows Demeter establishes the Eleusinian mysteries, which, however, were purely agrarian in origin. This hymn, as a literary work, is one of the finest in the collection. It is surely Attic or Eleusinian in origin. Can we in any way fix its date? Firstly, it is certainly not later than the beginning of the 6th century, for it makes no mention of Eakchus, and the Dionysiac element was introduced at Eleusi at about that period. Further, the insignificance of Triptolemus and Eumolpus point to considerable antiquity, and the Digamar is still active. All these considerations point to the 7th century as the probable date of the hymn. The hymn to Apollo consists of two parts, which beyond any doubt were originally distinct, a Delian hymn and a Pythian hymn. The Delian hymn describes how Leto, in travail with Apollo, sought out a place in which to bear her son, and how Apollo, born in Delos, at once claimed for himself the lyre, the bow, and prophecy. This part of the existing hymn ends with an encomium of the Delian festival of Apollo and of the Delian choirs. The second part celebrates the founding of Pytho, Delphi, as the oracular seat of Apollo. After various wanderings the god comes to Telphus, near Haliotus, but is dissuaded by the nymph of the place from settling there and urged to go on to Pytho where, after slaying the she-dragon who nursed Typhon, he builds his temple. After the punishment of Telphusa for her deceit in giving him no warning of the dragoness at Pytho, Apollo, in the form of a dolphin, brings certain Cretan shipmen to Delphi to be his priests, and the hymn ends with a charge to these men to behave orderly and righteously. The Delian part is exclusively Ionian and insular both in style and sympathy, Delos and no other is Apollo's chosen seat, but the second part is as definitely continental. Delos is ignored and Delphi alone is the important center of Apollo's worship. From this it is clear that the two parts need not be of one date. The first, indeed, is ascribed, Scoli asked on Pindanem 2, 2, to Sinithus of Chios, Fluid 504 BC, a date which is obviously far too low. General considerations point rather to the 8th century. The second part is not later than 600 BC, for, 1. The chariot races at Pytho, which commenced in 586 BC, are unknown to the writer of the hymn, 2. The temple built by Trophonius and Agamedes for Apollo. LL 294-299, seems to have been still standing when the hymn was written, and this temple was burned in 548. We may at least be sure that the first part is a Chian work, 
and that the second was composed by a continental poet familiar with Delphi. The hymn to Hermes differs from others in its burlesque, quasi-comic character, and it is also the best known of the hymns to English readers in consequence of Shelley's translation. After a brief narrative of the birth of Hermes, the author goes on to show how he won a place among the gods. First the newborn child found a tortoise and from its shell contrived the lyre, next, with much cunning circumstance, he stole Apollo's cattle and, when charged with the theft by Apollo, forced that god to appear in undignified guise before the tribunal of Zeus. Zeus seeks to reconcile the pair, and Hermes by the gift of the lyre wins Apollo's friendship and purchases various prerogatives, a share in divination, the lordship of herds and animals, and the office of messenger from the gods to Hades. The hymn is hard to date. Hermes lyre has seven strings and the invention of the seven-stringed lyre is ascribed to Tapanda, Fla 676 BC. The hymn must therefore be later than that date, though Tapanda, according to Weirsmith 1116, may have only modified the scale of the lyre. Yet while the burlesque character precludes an early date, this feature is far removed, as Alan and Sykes remark, from the silliness of the Battle of the Frogs and Mice, so that a date in the earlier part of the 6th century is most probable. The hymn to Aphrodite is not the least remarkable, from a literary point of view, of the whole collection exhibiting as it does in a masterly manner a divine being as the unwilling victim of an irresistible force. It tells how all creatures, and even the gods themselves, are subject to the will of Aphrodite, saving only Artemis, Athena, and Hestia, how Zeus to humble her pride of power caused her to love a mortal, Anchises and how the goddess visited the hero upon Mount Ida. A comparison of this work with the Lay of Demodocus, Odyssey 8, 266 ff. which is superficially similar, will show how far superior is the former in which the goddess is but a victim to forces stronger than herself. The Lines 247 to 255, in which Aphrodite tells of her humiliation and grief are specially noteworthy. There are only general indications of date. The influence of Hesiod is clear, and the hymn has almost certainly been used by the author of the hymn to Demeter, so that the date must lie between these two periods and the 7th century seems to be the latest date possible. The hymn to Dionysius relates how the god was seized by pirates and how with many manifestations of power he avenged himself on them by turning them into dolphins. The date is widely disputed, for while Ludwig believes it to be a work of the 4th or 3rd century, Allen and Sykes consider a 6th or 7th century date to be possible. The story is figured in a different form on the reliefs from the Karajic Monument of Lysocrates, now in the British Museum 1117. Very different in character is the hymn to us, which is Orphic in character. The writer after lauding the god by detailing his attributes, prays to be delivered from feebleness and weakness of soul, as also from impulses to wanton and brutal violence. The only other considerable hymn is that to Pan, which describes how he roams hunting among the mountains and thickets and streams, 
how he makes music at dusk while returning from the chase, and how he joins in dancing with the nymphs who sing the story of his birth. This, beyond most works of Greek literature, is remarkable for its fresh and spontaneous love of wild natural scenes. The remaining hymns are mostly of the briefest compass, merely hailing the god to be celebrated and mentioning his chief attributes. The hymns to Hermes, 18, to the Dioscuri, 17, and to Demeter, 13, are mere abstracts of the longer hymns for XXXIII and to the epigrams of Homer. The epigrams of Homer are derived from the pseudo Herodotian life of Homer, but many of them occur in other documents such as the Contest of Homer and Hesiod, or are quoted by various ancient authors. These poetic fragments clearly antedate the life itself, which seems to have been so written round them as to supply appropriate occasions for their composition. Epigram 3 on Midas of Larissa was otherwise attributed to Cleobulus of Lindus, one of the seven sages. The address to Glaucus, 11, is purely Hesiodic, 13 according to Millimeter. Quasit, is a fragment from a gnomic poem. Epigram 14 is a curious poem attributed on no very obvious grounds to Hesiod by Julius Pollux. In it the poet invokes Athena to protect certain potters and their craft, if they will, according to promise, give him a reward for his song. If they prove false, malignant gnomes are invoked to wreck the kill and hurt the potters. The burlesque poems to Homer were popularly ascribed certain burlesque poems in which Aristotle, Poetics for, saw the germ of comedy. Most interesting of these, were it extant, would be the Margites. The hero of the epic is at once Silist and Simpleton, knowing many things, but knowing them all badly. It is unfortunately impossible to trace the plan of the poem, which presumably detailed the adventures of this unheroic character. The meter used was a curious mixture of hexametric and iambic lines. The date of such a work cannot be high. Quasit thinks it may belong to the period of Archilochus, c. 650 BC, but it may well be somewhat later. Another poem, of which we know even less, is the Circopes. These Circopes, monkey men, were a pair of malignant dwarfs who went about the world mischief-making. Their punishment by Heracles is represented on one of the earlier metopes from Salinus. It would be idle to speculate as to the date of this work. Finally there is the battle of the frogs and mice. Here is told the story of the quarrel which arose between the two tribes, and how they fought, until Zeus sent crabs to break up the battle. It is a parody of the warlike epic, but has little in it that is really comic or of literary merit, except perhaps the list of quaint arms assumed by the warriors. The text of the poem is in a chaotic condition, and there are many interpolations, some of Byzantine date. Though popularly ascribed to Homer, its real author is said by Sudas to have been Pigres, a Carian, brother of Artemisia, wife of Morsulus, who distinguished herself at the Battle of Salamis. Sudas is confusing the two Artemisias, but he may be right in attributing the poem to about 480 BC. 
The contest of Homer and Hesiod This curious work dates in its present form from the lifetime or shortly after the death of Hadrian, but seems to be based in part on an earlier version by the sophist Alcidamas, c. 400 BC. Plutarch, Conviv. September Sap, 40, uses an earlier, or at least a shorter, version than that which we possess 1118. The extant contest, however, has clearly combined with the original document much other ill-digested matter on the life and descent of Homer probably drawing on the same general sources as does the Herodotian life of Homer. Its scope is as follows, 1. The descent, as variously reported, and relative dates of Homer and Hesiod, 2. Their poetical contest at Chalcis, 3. The death of Hesiod, 4. The wanderings and fortunes of Homer with brief notices of the circumstances under which his reputed works were composed, down to the time of his death. The whole tract is, of course, mere romance, its only values are, 1. The insight it gives into ancient speculations about Homer, 2. A certain amount of definite information about the cyclic poems, and, 3. The epic fragments included in the Stichomythia of the contest proper, many of which, did we possess the clue, would have to be referred to poems of the epic cycle. Bibliography Hesiod. The classification and numerations of MSS. Here followed is that of Attuk, 1913. It is only necessary to add that on the whole the recovery of Hesiodic papyri goes to confirm the authority of the medieval MSS. At the same time these fragments have produced much that is interesting and valuable, such as the new lines, works and days 169 AD, and the improved reading zib. 278, Theogony 91, 93. Our chief gains from papyri are the numerous and excellent fragments of the catalogues which have been recovered. Works and Days, Esoxiinchus Papyri 1090. A Vienna, Rainer Papyri LP 21-9, 4th cent. B. Geneva, Naville Papyri Pap. 94, 6th cent. C. Paris, Bibel. Nat. 2771, 11th cent. D. Florence, Law. XXZ 39, 12th cent. E. Messina, Univ. Lib. Preexistence 11, 12th to 13th cent. F. Rome, Vatican 38, 14th cent. G. Venice, Mark. 96, 14th cent. H. Florence, Law. XXZ 37, 14th cent. I. Florence, Law. XXZ 16, 13th cent. K. Florence, Law. XXZ 2, 14th cent. L. Milan, Ambrose. G. 32 sup. 14th cent. M. Florence, Bibel. Ricardiana 71, 15th cent. N. Milan, Ambrose. J. 15 Sup. 15th Cent. O. Paris, Bibel. Nat. 2773, 14th Cent. P. 
P. Cambridge, Trinity College, Gale MS, 0.9.27, 13th to 14th cent. Ann Arbor, Massachusetts, 0.9.27, 13th to 14th cent. Fourteenth cent. These MSS are divided by a took into the following families, issuing from a common original A equals C, B equals F, G, H A equals D, B equals I, K, L, M A equals E, B equals N, O, P, Q, Theogony, N, Manchester, Rylands, G, K. Papyri number 54, first cent. B. C. 1 st cent. A. D. O. Oxyine chus papyri 873, third cent. A. Paris, Bibble. Nat. Sipil. Greek. Papyrus. 1099, fourth to fifth cent. B. London, British Museum Clicks, fourth cent. R. Vienna, Rainer Papyri LP 21 to 9, fourth cent. C. Paris, Bibble. Nat. Sipil. Greek. 663. 12th cent. D. Florence, Law. Xxxe 16, 13th cent. E. Florence, Law, Conv. Super. 158, 14th cent. F. Paris, Bibble. Nat. 2833. 15th cent. G. Rome, Vatican 915, 14th cent. H. Paris, Bibble. Nat. 2772, 14th cent. I. Florence, Law. Xxxe 32, 15th cent. K. Venice, Mark. 9-6, 15th cent. L. Paris, Bibble. Nat. 2708, 15th cent. These MSS are divided into two families, A equals C, D, B equals E, F, C equals G, H, I, C equals K, L, Shield of Heracles. P. Oxyine chus papyri 689, second cent. A. Vienna, Rainer papyri LP 21 to 29, fourth cent. Q. Berlin papyri 9774, first cent. B. Paris, Bibel. Nat, Sipil. Greek. 663, twelfth cent. C. Paris, Bibble. Nat, Sipil. Greek. 663, twelfth cent. D. Milan, Ambrose. C. 222, thirteenth cent. E. Florence. Law. Xxe 16, 13th cent. F. Paris, Bibble. Nat. 2773, 14th cent. G. Paris, Bibble. Nat. 2772, 14th cent. H. Florence, Law. Xxe 32, 15th cent. I. London, British Museum Harlianus, 14th cent. K. Rome, Bibble. Cassanet. 
356, 14th cent. L. Florence, La. Conf. Super. 158, 14th cent. M. Paris, Bible. Nat. 2833, 15th cent. These MSS belong to two families, A equals B, C, D, F, B equals G, H, I, A equals E, B equals K, L, M. To these must be added two MSS of mixed family, N. Venice, Mark. 9 6, 14th cent. O Paris, Bible. Nat. 2708, 15th cent. Editions of Hesiod, Demetrius Chalkandiles, Milan. 1493. Editio Princeps, containing, however, only the works and days. Aldus Manutius, Aldine edition, Venice, 1495, complete works. Juntine editions, 1515 and 1540. Trincavli, Venice, 1537 with scolia of modern editions the following may be noticed gaysford oxford 1814 to 1820 leipzig 1823 with scolia in pot greek min 2 gotling gotter 1831 third edition leipzig 1878. Didot edition, Paris, 1840. Scomon, 1869. Coetchley and Kinkle, Leipzig, 1870. Flack, Leipzig, 1874 8. Attuck, Leipzig, 1902, larger edition. 1913, smaller edition. On the Hesiodic poems generally the ordinary histories of Greek literature may be consulted, but especially the hist. De la literature grec ipp. 459 ff. Of millimeter. Quasit. The summary account in Professor Murray's ANC GK Lit is written with a strong skeptical bias. Very valuable is the appendix to Mayer's translation, Oxford, 1908, on the farmer's year in Hesiod. Recent work on the Hesiodic poems is reviewed in full by a Turk in Bergian's Jarezberikt Vols. 100, 1899, and 152, 1911. For the fragments of Hesiodic poems the work of Mark Scheffel, Hesiodi Fragmenta, Leipzig, 1840, is most valuable, important also is Kinkel's Epicorum Graecorum Fragmenta I, Leipzig, 1877 and the editions of a took noticed above. For recently discovered papyrus fragments see Wylamowitz, Neu Brush Stuck D. Hesiod Catalog, Sit Sungs der Caprius. Akad. Fur Wissenskift, 1900, pp. 839 to 851-851. A list of papyri belonging to lost Hesiodic works may here be added, all other catalogues. 1. Berlin Papyri 7497-1201, 2nd cent. 
frag. 72. Oxyine chus papyri 421, second scent. Frag. 73. Petri papyri 33. Dot, frag. 14.4. Papyri grisii Latin, number 130, second to third scent. Frag. 14.5. Strasbourg papyri, 55, second scent. Frag. 58.6, Berlin papyri 9739, second scent. Frag. 58.7, Berlin papyri 10560, third scent. Frag. 588 Berlin papyri 9777 fourth cent frag 989 papyri grisii latin number 131 second to third cent frag 9910 Oxyine chus papyri 1358 to 9. The Homeric Hymns. The text of the Homeric Hymns is distinctly bad in condition, a fact which may be attributed to the general neglect under which they seem to have labored at all periods previously to the revival of learning. Very many defects have been corrected by the various editions of the hymns, but a considerable number still defy all efforts, and especially an abnormal number of undoubted lacuna disfigure the text. Unfortunately no papyrus fragment of the hymns has yet emerged, though one such fragment, Bull. Classica text v.1 pp. 7ff, contains a paraphrase of a poem very closely parallel to the hymn to Demeter. The Medieval MSS. 1202 are thus enumerated by Dr. T. W. Allen, a Paris, Bible. Nat. 2763 at Athos. Vitopedi 587. B. Paris, Bible. Nat. 2765. C. Paris, Bible. Nat. 2833. Gamma Brussels, Bible. Royal 11377 to 11380, 16th cent. D. Milan, Ambo. B. 98 sup. E. Modna, Estens 3 11. G. Rome, Vatican, Regina 91, 16th cent. H. London, British Muse. Harley 1752. J. Modna, Estense, 2B14. K. Florence, Law. 31, 32. L. Florence, Law. 32, 45. L. 2 Florence, Law. 70. 35. L3 Florence, Law. 32, 4. Emliden, The Moscow MS, 33H, 14th cent. Monday Munich, Royal Lib. 333 C. Enliden, 74 C. O. Milan, Ambrose. C. Teninf. P. Rome, Vatican Pal. Greek. 179 Pi Paris, Bible. Nat. Sipil. 
Greek. 1095 Q Milan, Ambrose. S31 Sup. R1 Florence, Bibel. Ricard. 53 K213. R2 Florence, Bibel. Ricard. 52 K214. S Rome, Vatican, Vaticani Greek. 1880 T Madrid, Public Library 24. V Venice, Mark. 456 The same scholar has traced all the MSS. Back to a common parent from which three main families are derived, M had a separate descent and is not included in any family, X1 equals E, TX2 equals L, Pi, and more remotely, at, D, S, H, J, K, Y equals E, L, Pi, T, marginal readings, P equals O, B, C, Gamma, G, L2, L3, N, O, P, Q, R1, R2, V, Monday editions of the Homeric Hymns, and C. Demetrius Chalkandilis, Florence, 1488, with the epigrams and the Battle of the Frogs and Mice in the EDPR of Homer. Aldine edition, Venice. 1504. Juntine edition, 1537. Stephanus, Paris, 1566 and 1588. More modern editions or critical works of value are Martin, Variarum Lectionum Lib. 4. Paris, 1605. Barnes, Cambridge, 1711. Runken, Lydon, 1782. Epist. Crit. And him to Demeter. Ilgen, Halley, 1796 with epigrams and the Battle of the Frogs and Mice. Matthew, Leipzig, 1806, with the Battle of the Frogs and Mice. Hermann, Bulling, 1806, with epigrams. Frank, Leipzig, 1828, with epigrams and the Battle of the Frogs and Mice. Dindorf, Didot Edition, Paris, 1837. Baumeister, Battle of the Frogs and Mice, Gottingen, 1852. Baumeister, Hymns, Leipzig, 1860. Gemol, Leipzig, 1886. Goodwin, Oxford, 1893. Ludwig. Battle of the Frogs and Mice, 1896. Allen and Sykes, London, 1904. Allen, Homery Opera v. Oxford, 1912. Of these editions that of Messrs. Allen and Sykes is by far the best, not only is the text purged of the load of conjectures for which the frequent obscurities of the hymns offer a special opening, but the introduction and the notes throughout are of the highest value. For a full discussion of the MSS and textual problems, reference must be made to this edition as also to Dr. T. W. Allen's series of articles in the Journal of Hellenic Studies Vols. 15 FF. Among translations those of J. Edgar, Edinburgh, 1891, and of Andrew Lang, London, 1899, may be mentioned. The Epic Cycle. 
the fragments of the epic cycle, being drawn from a variety of authors, no list of MSS can be given. The following collections and editions may be mentioned, Muller, Leipzig, 1829. Dindorf, Didot edition of Homer, Paris, 1837-56. Kinkel, Epicorum Graecorum Fragmenta I, Leipzig, 1877. Allen, Homery Opera V, Oxford, 1912. The fullest discussion of the problems and fragments of the epic cycle is F. G. Welker's Der Epische Cyclus, Bonn, Volume I, 1835, Volume II, 1849, Volume I, Second Edition, 1865. The appendix to Monroe's Homer's Odyssey 12 Xiv, pp. 340 ff. deals with the cyclic poets in relation to Homer, and a clear and reasonable discussion of the subject is to be found in Quasit's Hist. De la Literature Grec, Volume I. On Hesiod. The Hesiodic poems and the problems which these offer Seatica's most important article Hesiodus in Paulywizoa, Real Encyclopedia 15, 1912. A discussion of the evidence for the date of Hesiod is to be found in Jern. Hell. Stud. XXXV, 85FF. T. W. Allen. Of translations of Hesiod, the following may be noticed: The Georgics of Hesiod, by George Chapman, London, 1618. The works of Hesiod translated from the Greek, by Thomas Cook, London, 1728. The Remains of Hesiod Translated from the Greek into English Verse, by Charles Abraham Elton, The Works of Hesiod, Colomachus, and Theonis, by the Reverend J. Banks, M.A., Hesiod, by Professor James Mayer, Oxford, 1908-1203. Hesiod Hesiod's Works and Days, LL 1-10. Muses of Peria who give glory through song, come hither, tell of Zeus your father and chant his praise. Through him mortal men are famed or you enfamed, sung or unsung alike, as great Zeus wills. For easily he makes strong, and easily he brings the strong man low, easily he humbles the proud and raises the obscure and easily he straightens the crooked and blasts the proud, Zeus who thunders aloft and has his dwelling most high. Attend thou with eye and ear, and make judgments straight with righteousness. And I, Perses, would tell of true things. LL 11-24 So, after all, there was not one kind of strife alone but all over the earth there are two. As for the one, a man would praise her when he came to understand her, but the other is blameworthy, and they are wholly different in nature. For one fosters evil war and battle, being cruel, her no man loves, but perforce, through the will of the deathless gods, men pay harsh strife her on a due but the other is the elder daughter of Dark Knight, and the son of Kronos who sits above and dwells in the ether, set her in the roots of the earth, and she is far kinder to men. She stirs up even the shiftless to toil, for a man grows eager to work when he considers his neighbor, a rich man who hastens to plough and plant and put his house in good order and neighbor vies with his neighbor as he hurries after wealth. 
This strife is wholesome for men. And potter is angry with potter, and craftsman with craftsman, and beggar is jealous of beggar, and minstrel of minstrel. LL 25-41, Purses, lay up these things in your heart, and do not let that strife who delights in mischief hold your heart back from work, while you peep and peer and listen to the wrangles of the courthouse. Little concern has he with quarrels and courts who has not a year's victuals laid up but hims, even that which the earth bears, Demeter's grain. When you have got plenty of that, you can raise disputes and strive to get another's goods. But you shall have no second chance to deal so again, nay. Let us settle our dispute here with true judgment divided our inheritance, but you seized the greater share and carried it off, greatly swelling the glory of our bribe-swallowing lords who love to judge such a cause as this. Fools! They know not how much more the half is than the whole nor what great advantage there is in Mallow and Asphodel 1301. LL 42-53, For the gods keep hidden from men the means of life. Else you would easily do work enough in a day to supply you for a full year even without working, soon would you put away your rudder over the smoke and the fields worked by ox and sturdy mule would run to waste. But Zeus in the anger of his heart hid it, because Prometheus the crafty deceived him, therefore he planned sorrow and mischief against men. He hid fire, but that the noble son of Iapetus stole again four men from Zeus the counsellor in a hollow fennel stalk so that Zeus who delights in thunder did not see it. But afterwards Zeus who gathers the clouds said to him in anger, LL 54-59, Son of Iapetus, surpassing all in cunning, you are glad that you have outwitted me and stolen fire, a great plague to you yourself and to men that shall be. But I will give men as the price for fire an evil thing in which they may all be glad of heart while they embrace their own destruction. LL 60-68 So said the father of men and gods, and laughed aloud. And he bade famous Hephaestus make haste and mix earth with water and to put in it the voice and strength of humankind, and fashion a sweet lovely maiden shape, like to the immortal goddesses in face, and Athene to teach her needlework and the weaving of the varied web, and golden Aphrodite to shed grace upon her head and cruel longing and cares that weary the limbs. And he charged Hermes the guide, the slayer of Argus, to put in her a shameless mind and a deceitful nature. LL 69-82, so he ordered. And they obeyed the Lord Zeus the son of Kronos. Forthwith the famous lame god molded clay in the likeness of a modest maid, as the son of Kronos purposed. And the goddess bright-eyed Athene girded and clothed her and the divine graces and queenly persuasion put necklaces of gold upon her, and the rich hair dowers crowned her head with spring flowers. And Pallas Athene bedecked her form with all manners of finery. Also the guide, the slayer of Argus, contrived within her lies and crafty words and a deceitful nature at the will of loud thundering Zeus and the herald of the gods put speech in her. And he called this woman Padora 1302, because all they who dwelt on Olympus gave each a gift, a plague to men who eat bread. LL 83-89 But when he had finished the sheer, hopeless snare, 
the Father sent glorious Argus Slayer, the swift messenger of the gods, to take it to Epimetheus as a gift. And Epimetheus did not think on what Prometheus had said to him, bidding him never take a gift of Olympian Zeus, but to send it back for fear it might prove to be something harmful to men. But he took the gift, and afterwards, when the evil thing was already his, he understood. LL 90-105 for ere this the tribes of men lived on earth remote and free from ills and hard toil and heavy sickness which bring the fates upon men, for in misery men grow old quickly. But the woman took off the great lid of the jar 1303 with her hands and scattered all these and her thought caused sorrow and mischief to men. Only hope remained there in an unbreakable home within under the rim of the great jar, and did not fly out at the door, for ere that, the lid of the jar stopped her, by the will of Aegis holding Zeus who gathers the clouds. But the rest, countless plagues, wander amongst men, for earth is full of evils and the sea is full. Of themselves diseases come upon men continually by day and by night, bringing mischief to mortals silently, for wise Zeus took away speech from them. So is there no way to escape the will of Zeus. LL 106-108, or if you will, I will sum you up another tale well and skillfully, and do you lay it up in your heart how the gods and mortal men sprang from one source. LL 109-120 First of all the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos when he was reigning in heaven. And they lived like gods without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them, but with legs and arms never failing they made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all evils. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things, for the fruitful earth unforced bare them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon their lands with many good things rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. LL 121-139 But after earth had covered this generation, they are called pure spirits dwelling on the earth, and are kindly, delivering from harm, and guardians of mortal men, for they roam everywhere over the earth clothed in mist and keep watch on judgments and cruel deeds, givers of wealth, for this royal right also they received, then they who dwell on Olympus made a second generation which was of silver and less noble by far. It was like the golden race neither in body nor in spirit. A child was brought up at his good mother's side an hundred years an utter simpleton, playing childishly in his own home. But when they were full grown and were come to the full measure of their prime, they lived only a little time in sorrow because of their foolishness, for they could not keep from sinning and from wronging one another, nor would they serve the immortals, nor sacrifice on the holy altars of the blessed ones as it is right for men to do wherever they dwell. Then Zeus the son of Kronos was angry and put them away, because they would not give honor to the blessed gods who live on Olympus. LL 140-155 But when earth had covered this generation also, they are called blessed spirits of the underworld by men, and, though they are of second order, yet honor attends them also, 
Zeus the father made a third generation of mortal men, a brazen race, sprung from ash trees 1304, and it was in no way equal to the Silver Age, but was terrible and strong. They loved the lamentable works of ours and deeds of violence, they ate no bread, but were hard of heart like adamant, fearful men. Great was their strength and unconquerable the arms which grew from their shoulders on their strong limbs. Their armor was of bronze, and their houses of bronze, and of bronze were their implements, there was no black iron. These were destroyed by their own hands and passed to the dank house of chill hats, and left no name, terrible though they were. Black death seized them, and they left the bright light of the sun. LL 156-169b But when earth had covered this generation also, Zeus the son of Kronos made yet another, the fourth, upon the fruitful earth, which was nobler and more righteous, a godlike race of hero men who are called demigods the race before our own, throughout the boundless earth. Grim war and dread battle destroyed a part of them, some in the land of Cadmus at seven gated Thub when they fought for the flocks of Oedipus, and some, when it had brought them in ships over the great sea gulf to Troy for rich-haired Helen's sake, their death's end enshrouded a part of them. But to the others father Zeus the son of Kronos gave a living and an abode apart from men, and made them dwell at the ends of earth. And they live untouched by sorrow in the islands of the blessed along the shore of deep swirling ocean, happy heroes for whom the grain-giving earth bears honey-sweet fruit flourishing thrice a year, far from the deathless gods and Kronos rules over them 1305, for the father of men and gods released him from his bonds. And these last equally have honor and glory. LL 169C 169D, and again far-seeing Zeus made yet another generation, the fifth, of men who are upon the bounteous earth. LL 170-201, Thereafter, would that I were not among the men of the fifth generation, but either had died before or been born afterwards. For now truly is a race of iron, and men never rest from labor and sorrow by day, and from perishing by night, and the gods shall lay sore trouble upon them. But, Notwithstanding, even these shall have some good mingled with their evils. And Zeus will destroy this race of mortal men also when they come to have grey hair on the temples at their birth 1306. The father will not agree with his children, nor the children with their father, nor guest with his host, nor comrade with comrade nor will brother be dear to brother as aforetime. Men will dishonor their parents as they grow quickly old, and will carp at them, chiding them with bitter words, hard-hearted they, not knowing the fear of the gods. They will not repay their aged parents the cost their nurture, for might shall be their right, and one man will sack another's city. There will be no favor for the man who keeps his oath or for the just or for the good, but rather men will praise the evildoer and his violent dealing. Strength will be right and reverence will cease to be, and the wicked will hurt the worthy man, speaking false words against him, and will swear an oath upon them. Envy, foul-mouthed, delighting in evil with scowling face, will go along with wretched men one and all. And then Eidos and Nemesis 1307, 
with their sweet forms wrapped in white robes, will go from the wide path to earth and forsake mankind to join the company of the deathless gods, and bitter sorrows will be left for mortal men, and there will be no help against evil. LL 202-211 and now I will tell a fable for princes who themselves understand. Thus said the hawk to the nightingale with speckled neck, while he carried her high up among the clouds, gripped fast in his talons, and she, pierced by his crooked talons, cried pitifully. To her he spoke disdainfully, miserable thing, why do you cry out? One far stronger than you now holds you fast, and you must go wherever I take you, songstress as you are. And if I please I will make my meal of you, or let you go. He is a fool who tries to withstand the stronger, for he does not get the mastery and suffers pain besides his shame. So said the swiftly flying hawk, the long-winged bird. LL 212 to 224, but you, purses, listen to right and do not foster violence, for violence is bad for a poor man. Even the prosperous cannot easily bear its burden, but is weighed down under it when he has fallen into delusion. The better path is to go by on the other side towards justice for justice beats outrage when she comes at length to the end of the race. But only when he has suffered does the fool learn this. For oath keeps pace with wrong judgments. There is a noise when justice is being dragged in the way where those who devour bribes and give sentence with crooked judgments, take her. And she, wrapped in mist, follows to the city and haunts of the people, weeping, and bringing mischief to men, even to such as have driven her forth in that they did not deal straightly with her. LL 225-237 But they who give straight judgments to strangers and to the men of the land, and go not aside from what is just, their city flourishes and the people prosper in it, peace, the nurse of children, is abroad in their land, and all-seeing Zeus never decrees cruel war against them. Neither famine nor disaster ever haunt men who do true justice, but light-heartedly they tend the fields which are all their care. The earth bears them victual in plenty and on the mountains the oak bears acorns upon the top and bees in the midst. Their woolly sheep are laden with fleeces, their women bear children like their parents. They flourish continually with good things, and do not travel on ships, for the grain-giving earth bears them fruit. LL 238 to 247 But for those who practice violence and cruel deeds far seeing Zeus the son of Kronos ordains a punishment Often even a whole city suffers for a bad man who sins and devises presumptuous deeds and the son of Kronos lays great trouble upon the people famine and plague together, so that the men perish away, and their women do not bear children, and their houses become few, through the contriving of Olympian Zeus. And again, at another time, the son of Kronos either destroys their wide army, or their walls, or else makes an end of their ships on the sea. LL 248-264, you princes, mark well this punishment you also, for the deathless gods are near among men and mark all those who oppress their fellows with crooked judgments, and wreck not the anger of the gods. 
for upon the bounteous earth Zeus has thrice ten thousand spirits, watchers of mortal men, and these keep watch on judgments and deeds of wrong as they roam, clothed in mist, all over the earth. And there is virgin justice, the daughter of Zeus, who is honored and reverenced among the gods who dwell on Olympus, and whenever anyone hurts her with lying slander, she sits beside her father, Zeus the son of Kronos, and tells him of men's wicked heart, until the people pay for the mad folly of their princes who, evilly minded, pervert judgment and give sentence crookedly. Keep watch against this, you princes, and make straight your judgments, you who devour bribes. Put crooked judgments altogether from your thoughts. LL 265 to 266. He does mischief to himself who does mischief to another, and evil planned harms the plotter most. LL 267 to 273. The eye of Zeus, seeing all and understanding all beholds these things too, if so he will, and fails not to mark what sort of justice is this that the city keeps within it. Now, therefore, may neither I myself be righteous among men, nor my son, for then it is a bad thing to be righteous, if indeed the unrighteous shall have the greater right. But I think that all wise Zeus will not yet bring that to pass. LL 274 to 285. But you, Perses, lay up these things within your heart and listen now to right, ceasing altogether to think of violence. For the son of Kronos has ordained this law for men that fishes and beasts and winged fowls should devour one another, for right is not in them, but to mankind he gave right which proves far the best. For whoever knows the right and is ready to speak it, far-seeing Zeus gives him prosperity, but whoever deliberately lies in his witness and forswears himself, and so hurts justice and sins beyond repair that man's generation is left obscure thereafter. But the generation of the man who swears truly is better thenceforward. LL 286-292 To you, foolish purses, I will speak good sense. Badness can be got easily and in shoals, the road to her is smooth and she lives very near us. But between us and goodness the gods have placed the sweat of our brows, long and steep is the path that leads to her, and it is rough at the first, but when a man has reached the top, then is she easy to reach, though before that she was hard. LL 293-319 that man is altogether best who considers all things himself and marks what will be better afterwards and at the end, and he, again, is good who listens to a good adviser, but whoever neither thinks for himself nor keeps in mind what another tells him, he is an unprofitable man. But do you at any rate, always remembering my charge, work? high-born purses, that hunger may hate you, and venerable Demeter richly crowned may love you and fill your barn with food, for hunger is altogether a meat comrade for the sluggard. Both gods and men are angry with a man who lives idle, for in nature he is like the stingless drones who waste the labor of the bees, eating without working but let it be your care to order your work properly, that in the right season your bonds may be full of victual. Through work men grow rich in flocks and substance, 
and working they are much better loved by the immortals 1308. Work is no disgrace, it is idleness which is a disgrace. But if you work, the idol will soon envy you as you grow rich, for fame and renown attend on wealth. And whatever be your lot, work is best for you. If you turn your misguided mind away from other men's property to your work and attend to your livelihood as I bid you. An evil shame is the needy man's companion, shame which both greatly harms and prospers men, shame is with poverty, but confidence with wealth. LL 322-341 Wealth should not be seized, God-given wealth is much better, for if a man take great wealth violently and perforce, or if he steal it through his tongue, as often happens when gain deceives men's sense and dishonor tramples down honor, the gods soon blot him out and make that man's house low, and wealth attends him only for a little time. Alike with him who does wrong to a suppliant or a guest, or who goes up to his brother's bed and commits unnatural sin in lying with his wife, or who infatuately offends against fatherless children, or who abuses his old father at the cheerless threshold of old age and attacks him with harsh words, truly Zeus himself is angry and at the last lays on him a heavy requital for his evil doing. But do you turn your foolish heart altogether away from these things, and, as far as you are able, sacrifice to the deathless gods purely and cleanly, and burn rich meats also, and at other times propitiate them with libations and incense? both when you go to bed and when the holy light has come back, that they may be gracious to you in heart and spirit, and so you may buy another's holding and not another yours. LL 342-351 Call your friend to a feast, but leave your enemy alone, and especially call him who lives near you. For if any mischief happen in the place, neighbors come ungirt, but kinsmen stay to gird themselves 1309. A bad neighbor is as great a plague as a good one is a great blessing, he who enjoys a good neighbor has a precious possession. Not even an ox would die but for a bad neighbor. Take fair measure from your neighbor and pay him back fairly with the same measure, or better, if you can, so that if you are in need afterwards, you may find him sure. LL 352-369 Do not get base gain, base gain is as bad as ruin. Be friends with the friendly and visit him who visits you. Give to one who gives, but do not give to one who does not give. A man gives to the free-handed, but no one gives to the close-fisted. Give is a good girl, but take is bad and she brings death. For the man who gives willingly, even though he gives a great thing, rejoices in his gift and is glad in heart, but whoever gives way to shamelessness and takes something himself, even though it be a small thing, it freezes his heart. He who adds to what he has, will keep off bright-eyed hunger, for if you add only a little to a little and do this often, soon that little will become great. What a man has by him at home does not trouble him, it is better to have your stuff at home, for whatever is abroad may mean loss. It is a good thing to draw on what you have, but it grieves your heart to need something and not to have it, and I bid you mark this. 
Take your fill when the cask is first opened and when it is nearly spent, but midways be sparing, it is poor saving when you come to the lees. LL 370-372 Let the wage promised to a friend be fixed, even with your brother smile, and get a witness, for trust and mistrust, alike ruin men. LL 373-375 Do not let a flaunting woman coax and cousin and deceive you. She is after your barn. The man who trusts womankind trusts deceivers. LL 376 to 380. There should be an only son, to feed his father's house, for so wealth will increase in the home, but if you leave a second son you should die old. Yet Zeus can easily give great wealth to a greater number. More hands mean more work and more increase. LL 381-382 If your heart within you desires wealth, do these things and work with work upon work. LL 383-404 When the Pleiades daughters of Atlas, are rising 1310, begin your harvest, and your plowing when they are going to set 1311. Forty nights and days they are hidden and appear again as the year moves round, when first you sharpen your sickle. This is the law of the plains, and of those who live near the sea and who inhabit rich country, the glens and dingles far from the tossing sea, strip to sow and strip to plough and strip to reap, if you wish to get in all Demeter's fruits in due season, and that each kind may grow in its season. Else, afterwards, you may chance to be in want, and go begging to other men's houses, but without avail as you have already come to me. But I will give you no more nor give you further measure. Foolish Purses Work the work which the gods ordained for men, lest in bitter anguish of spirit you with your wife and children seek your livelihood amongst your neighbours, and they do not heed you. Two or three times, maybe, you will succeed. But if you trouble them further, it will not avail you, and all your talk will be in vain, and your word play unprofitable. Nay, I bid you find a way to pay your debts and avoid hunger. LL 405-413 First of all, get a house, and a woman and an ox for the plough, a slave woman and not a wife to follow the oxen as well, and make everything ready at home, so that you may not have to ask of another, and he refuses you, and so, because you are in lack, the season pass by and your work come to nothing. Do not put your work off till tomorrow and the day after, for a sluggish worker does not fill his barn, nor one who puts off his work. Industry makes work go well, but a man who puts off work is always at hand grips with ruin. LL 414-447 When the piercing power and sultry heat of the sun abate, and Almighty Zeus sends the autumn rains 1312, and men's flesh comes to feel far easier. For then the star Sirius passes over the heads of men, who are born to misery, only a little while by day and takes greater share of night. Then, when it showers its leaves to the ground and stops sprouting, the wood you cut with your axe is least liable to worm. Then remember to hew your timber, it is the season for that work. 
Kutamorta 1313 3 feet wide and a pestle 3 cubits long, and an axle of 7 feet, for it will do very well so, but if you make it 8 feet long, you can cut a beetle 1314 from it as well. Cut a fellow a three spans across for a wagon of ten palms width. Hew also many bent timbers, and bring home a plough tree when you have found it, and look out on the mountain or in the field for one of home oak, for this is the strongest for oxen to plough with when one of Athena's handmen has fixed in the share beam and fastened it to the pole with dowels. Get two ploughs ready work on them at home, one all of a piece, and the other jointed. It is far better to do this, for if you should break one of them, you can put the oxen to the other. Poles of laurel or elm are most free from worms, and a share beam of oak and a plough tree of home oak. Get two oxen, bulls of nine years for their strength is unspent and they are in the prime of their age, they are best for work. They will not fight in the furrow and break the plough and then leave the work undone. Let a brisk fellow of forty years follow them, with a loaf of four quarters one thousand three hundred and fifteen and eight slices one thousand three hundred and sixteen for his dinner one who will attend to his work and drive a straight furrow and is past the age for gaping after his fellows, but will keep his mind on his work. No younger man will be better than he at scattering the seed and avoiding double sowing, for a man less staid gets disturbed, hankering after his fellows. LL 448 to 457, Mark, when you hear the voice of the crane 1317 who cries year by year from the clouds above, for she give the signal for ploughing and shows the season of rainy winter, but she vexes the heart of the man who has no oxen. Then is the time to feed up your horned oxen in the byre, for it is easy to say, Give me a yoke of oxen and a wagon and it is easy to refuse, I have work for my oxen. The man who is rich in fancy thinks his wagon as good as built already, the fool. He does not know that there are a hundred timbers to a wagon. Take care to lay these up beforehand at home. LL 458 to 464. So soon as the time for ploughing is proclaimed to men, then make haste, you and your slaves alike, in wet and in dry, to plough in the season for ploughing, and bestir yourself early in the morning so that your fields may be full. Plough in the spring, but fallow broken up in the summer will not belie your hopes. Sow fallow land when the soil is still getting light, fallow land is a defender from harm and a soother of children. LL 465-478 Pray to Zeus of the earth and to pure Demeter to make Demeter's holy grain sound and heavy. When first you begin ploughing, when you hold in your hand the end of the plough tail and bring down your stick on the backs of the oxen as they draw on the pole bar by the yoke straps. Let a slave follow a little behind with a mattock and make trouble for the birds by hiding the seed, for good management is the best for mortal men as bad management is the worst. In this way your corn ears will bow to the ground with fullness if the Olympian himself gives a good result at the last, and you will sweep the cobwebs from your bins and you will be glad, I ween, as you take of your garnered substance. 
and so you will have plenty till you come to grey 1318 springtime, and will not look wistfully to others, but another shall be in need of your help. LL 479-492 But if you plough the good ground at the solstice 1319, you will reap sitting, grasping a thin crop in your hand, binding the sheaves awry, dust covered, not glad at all, so you will bring all home in a basket and not many will admire you. Yet the will of Zeus who holds the aegis is different at different times, and it is hard for mortal men to tell it, for if you should plough late, you may find this remedy, when the cuckoo first calls 1320 in the leaves of the oak and makes men glad all over the boundless earth, if Zeus should send rain on the third day and not cease until it rises neither above an ox's hoof nor falls short of it, then the late plower will vie with the early. Keep all this well in mind and fail not to mark grey spring as it comes and the season of rain. LL 493-501 Pass by the smithy and its crowded lounge in winter time when the cold keeps men from field work, for then an industrious man can greatly prosper his house lest bitter winter catch you helpless and poor and you chafe a swollen foot with a shrunk hand. The idle man who waits on empty hope, lacking a livelihood, lays to heart mischief-making, it is not an wholesome hope that accompanies a need man who lolls at ease while he has no sure livelihood. LL 502-503 while it is yet midsummer command your slaves, it will not always be summer, build barns. LL 504-535, avoid the month laney on 1321, wretched days, all of them fit to skin an ox, and the frosts which are cruel when Boreas blows over the earth. He blows across horse breeding Thrace upon the wide sea and stirs it up, while earth and the forest howl. On many a high-leafed oak and thick pine he falls and brings them to the bounteous earth in mountain glens. Then all the immense wood roars and the beasts shudder and put their tails between their legs, even those whose hide is covered with fur for with his bitter blast he blows even through them although they are shaggy-breasted. He goes even through an ox's hide, it does not stop him. Also he blows through the goat's fine hair. But through the fleeces of sheep, because their wool is abundant, the keen wind Boreas pierces not at all, but it makes the old man curved as a wheel and it does not blow through the tender maiden who stays indoors with her dear mother, unlearned as yet in the works of golden Aphrodite, and who washes her soft body and anoints herself with oil and lies down in an inner room within the house, on a winter's day when the boneless one 1322 gnaws his foot in his fireless house and wretched home for the sun shows him no pastures to make for, but goes to and fro over the land and city of dusky men 1323, and shines more sluggishly upon the whole. Race of the Hellenes Then the horned and unhorned denizens of the wood, with teeth chattering pitifully, flee through the copses and glades, and all, as they seek shelter, have this one care, to gain thick coverts or some hollow rock. Then, like the three-legged one 1324 whose back is broken and whose head looks down upon the ground, 
like him, I say, they wander to escape the white snow. LL 536 to 563, then put on, as I bid you, a soft coat and a tunic to the feet to shield your body, and you should weave thick woof on thin warp. In this clothe yourself so that your hair may keep still and not bristle and stand upon end all over your body. Lace on your feet close-fitting boots of the hide of a slaughtered ox, thickly lined with felt inside. And when the season of frost comes on, stitch together skins of firstling kids with ox sinew, to put over your back and to keep off the rain. On your head above wear a shaped cap of felt to keep your ears from getting wet, for the dawn is chill when Boreas has once made his onslaught, and at dawn a fruitful mist is spread over the earth from starry heaven upon the fields of blessed men, it is drawn from the ever-flowing rivers and is raised high above the earth by windstorm, and sometimes it turns to rain towards evening and sometimes to wind when Thracian Boreas huddles the thick clouds. Finish your work and return home ahead of him, and do not let the dark cloud from heaven wrap round you and make your body clammy and soak your clothes. Avoid it, for this is the hardest month, wintry, hard for sheep and hard for men. In this season let your oxen have half their usual food, but let your man have more, for the helpful nights are long. Observe all this until the year is ended and you have nights and days of equal length, and earth, the mother of all, bears again her various fruit. LL 564-570 when Zeus has finished sixty wintry days after the solstice, then the star Archerus 1325 leaves the holy stream of ocean and first rises brilliant at dusk. After him the shrilly wailing daughter of Pandion, the swallow, appears to men when spring is just beginning. Before she comes, prune the vines for it is best so. LL 571 to 581, but when the house carrier 1326 climbs up the plants from the earth to escape the Pleiades, then it is no longer the season for digging vineyards, but to wet your sickles and rouse up your slaves. Avoid shady seats and sleeping until dawn in the harvest season, when the sun scorches the body. Then be busy, and bring home your fruits, getting up early to make your livelihood sure. For dawn takes away a third part of your work, dawn advances a man on his journey and advances him in his work. Dawn which appears and sets many men on their road, and puts yokes on many oxen. LL 582-596 But when the artichoke flowers 1327, and the chirping grasshopper sits in a tree and pours down his shrill song continually from under his wings in the season of wearisome heat. Then goats are plumpest and wine sweetest, women are most wanton, but men are feeblest, because Sirius parches head and knees and the skin is dry through heat. But at that time let me have a shady rock and wine of Biblis, a clot of curds and milk of drained goats with the flesh of an heifer fed in the woods, that has never calved, and of firstling kids. Then also let me drink bright wine, sitting in the shade, when my heart is satisfied with food, and so, turning my head to face the fresh zephyr, 
from the ever-flowing spring which pours down unfouled thrice pour an offering of water, but make a fourth libation of wine. LL 597-608, Set your slaves to winnow Demeter's holy grain, when strong Orion 1328 first appears, on a smooth threshing floor in an airy place. Then measure it and store it in jars. And so soon as you have safely stored all your stuff indoors, I bid you put your bondman out of doors and look out for a servant girl with no children, for a servant with a child to nurse is troublesome. And look after the dog with jagged teeth, do not grudge him his food or some time the day sleeper 1329 may take your stuff. Bring in fodder and litter so as to have enough for your oxen and mules. After that, let your men rest their poor knees and unioke your pair of oxen. LL 609-617 but when Orion and Sirius are come into mid-heaven, and rosy-fingered dawn sees Archerus 1330, then cut off all the grape clusters, purses, and bring them home. Show them to the sun ten days and ten nights, then cover them over for five, and on the sixth day draw off into vessels the gifts of joyful Dionysius. But when the Pleiades and Hyades and strong Orion begin to set 1331, then remember to plough in season, and so the completed year 1332 will fitly pass beneath the earth. LL 618-640 but if desire for uncomfortable seafaring sees you, when the Pleiades plunge into the misty sea 1333 to escape Orion's rude strength, then truly gales of all kinds rage. Then keep ships no longer on the sparkling sea, but bethink you to till the land as I bid you. Haul up your ship upon the land and pack it closely with stones all round to keep off the power of the winds which blow damply, and draw out the bilge plug so that the rain of heaven may not rot it. Put away all the tackle and fittings in your house, and stow the wings of the seagoing ship neatly, and hang up the well-shaped rudder over the smoke. You yourself wait until the season for sailing is come, and then haul your swift ship down to the sea and stow a convenient cargo in it, so that you may bring home profit, even as your father and mine, foolish purses, used to sail on shipboard because he lacked sufficient livelihood. And one day he came to this very place crossing over a great stretch of sea. He left Aeolian come and fled, not from riches and substance, but from wretched poverty which Zeus lays upon men, and he settled near Helicon in a miserable hamlet, Ascra, which is bad in winter, sultry in summer, and good at no time. LL 641-645 But you, Perses, Remember all works in their season but sailing especially. Admire a small ship, but put your freight in a large one, for the greater the lading, the greater will be your piled gain, if only the winds will keep back their harmful gales. LL 646-662 if ever you turn your misguided heart to trading and with to escape from debt and joyless hunger, I will show you the measures of the loud roaring sea, though I have no skill in seafaring nor in ships, for never yet have I sailed by ship over the wide sea, 
but only to you be a from all ease where the chains once stayed through much storm when they had gathered a great host from divine Hellas for Troy, the land of fair women. Then I crossed over to Chalcis, to the games of wise Amphidamars where the sons of the great-hearted hero proclaimed and appointed prizes. And there I boast that I gained the victory with a song and carried off an handled tripod which I dedicated to the muses of Helicon, in the place where they first set me in the way of clear song. Such is all my experience of many pegged ships, nevertheless I will tell you the will of Zeus who holds the Aegis, for the muses have taught me to sing in marvellous song. LL 663-677, 50 days after the solstice 1334, when the season of wearisome heat is come to an end, is the right time for me to go sailing. Then you will not wreck your ship, nor will the sea destroy the sailors, unless Poseidon the earth shaker be set upon it or Zeus, the king of the deathless gods, wish to slay them, for the issues of good and evil alike are with them. At that time the winds are steady, and the sea is harmless. Then trust in the winds without care, and haul your swift ship down to the sea and put all the freight on board but make all haste you can to return home again and do not wait till the time of the new wine and autumn rain and oncoming storms with the fierce gales of notice who accompanies the heavy autumn rain of Zeus and stirs up the sea and makes the deep dangerous. LL 678-694 Another time for men to go sailing is in spring when a man first sees leaves on the topmost shoot of a fig tree as large as the footprint that a cow makes. Then the sea is passable, and this is the spring sailing time. For my part I do not praise it, for my heart does not like it. Such a sailing is snatched, and you will hardly avoid mischief. Yet in their ignorance men do even this, for wealth means life to poor mortals, but it is fearful to die among the waves. But I bid you consider all these things in your heart as I say. Do not put all your goods in hollow ships, leave the greater part behind, and put the lesser part on board for it is a bad business to meet with disaster among the waves of the sea, as it is bad if you put too great a load on your wagon and break the axle, and your goods are spoiled. Observe due measure, and proportion is best in all things. LL 695-705 Bring home a wife to your house when you are of the right age while you are not far short of thirty years nor much above, this is the right age for marriage. Let your wife have been grown up four years, and marry her in the fifth. Marry a maiden, so that you can teach her careful ways, and especially marry one who lives near you, but look well about you and see that your marriage will not be a joke to your neighbors. For a man wins nothing better than a good wife, and, again, nothing worse than a bad one, a greedy soul who roasts her man without fire, strong though he may be, and brings him to a raw 1335 old age. LL 706-714 Be careful to avoid the anger of the deathless gods. Do not make a friend equal to a brother, but if you do, do not wrong him first, and do not lie to please the tongue. But if he wrongs you first, offending either in word or in deed, remember to repay him double, 
but if he ask you to be his friend again and be ready to give you satisfaction, welcome him. He is a worthless man who makes now one and now another his friend, but as for you, do not let your face put your heart to shame 1336. LL 715 to 716. Do not get a name either as lavish or as churlish, as a friend of rogues or as a slanderer of good men. LL 717 to 721. Never dare to taunt a man with deadly poverty which eats out the heart, it is sent by the deathless gods. The best treasure a man can have is a sparing tongue, and the greatest pleasure, one that moves orderly, for if you speak evil, you yourself will soon be worse spoken of. LL 722-723 Do not be boorish at a common feast where there are many guests. The pleasure is greatest and the expense is least 1,337. LL 724 to 726. Never pour a libation of sparkling wine to Zeus after dawn with unwashen hands, nor to others of the deathless gods, else they do not hear your prayers but spit them back. LL 727 to 732. Do not stand upright facing the sun when you make water, but remember to do this when he has set towards his rising. And do not make water as you go, whether on the road or off the road, and do not uncover yourself, the nights belong to the blessed gods. A scrupulous man who has a wise heart sits down or goes to the wall of an enclosed court. LL 733 to 736. Do not expose yourself befooled by the fireside in your house, but avoid this. Do not beget children when you are come back from ill omened burial, but after a festival of the gods. LL 737 to 741 Never cross the sweet flowing water of ever rolling rivers afoot until you have prayed, gazing into the soft flood, and washed your hands in the clear, lovely water. Whoever crosses a river with hands unwashed of wickedness, the gods are angry with him and bring trouble upon him afterwards. LL 742-743 At a cheerful festival of the gods do not cut the withered from the quick upon that which has five branches 1338 with bright steel. LL 744-745 Never put the ladle upon the mixing bowl at a wine party for malignant ill luck is attached to that. LL 746-747 When you are building a house, do not leave it rough-hewn, or a cawing crow may settle on it and croak. LL 748-749 Take nothing to eat or to wash with from uncharmed pots for in them there is mischief. LL 750-759 Do not let a boy of twelve years sit on things which may not be moved 1339, for that is bad, and makes a man unmanly, nor yet a child of twelve months, for that has the same effect. A man should not clean his body with water in which a woman has washed, for there is bitter mischief in that also for a time. When you come upon a burning sacrifice, do not make a mock of mysteries, 
for heaven is angry at this also. Never make water in the mouths of rivers which flow to the sea, nor yet in springs, but be careful to avoid this. And do not ease yourself in them, it is not well to do this. LL 760-763, So do, and avoid the talk of men. For talk is mischievous, light, and easily raised, but hard to bear and difficult to be rid of. Talk never wholly dies away when many people voice her, even talk is in some ways divine. LL 765-767 Mark the days which come from Zeus, duly telling your slaves of them, and that the thirtieth day of the month is best for one to look over the work and to deal out supplies. LL 769-768 1344 These are days which come from Zeus the All-Wise, when men discern aright. LL 770-779 To begin with, the first, the fourth, and the seventh on which Leto bear Apollo with the blade of gold, each is a holy day. The eighth and the ninth, two days at least of the waxing month 1341, are specially good for the works of man. Also the eleventh and twelfth are both excellent, alike for shearing sheep and for reaping the kindly fruits but the twelfth is much better than the eleventh, for on it the air-swinging spider spins its web in full day, and then the wise one 1342, gathers her pile. On that day women should set up her loom and get forward with her work. LL 780-781 Avoid the thirteenth of the waxing month for beginning to sow, yet it is the best day for setting plants. LL 782-789 The sixth of the mid-month is very unfavorable for plants, but is good for the birth of males, though unfavorable for a girl either to be born at all or to be married. Nor is the first sixth a fit day for a girl to be born, but a kindly for gelding kids and sheep and for fencing in a sheep coat. It is favorable for the birth of a boy, but such will be fond of sharp speech, lies, and cunning words, and stealthy converse. LL 790-791 on the eighth of the month geld the boar and loud bellowing bull, but hard-working mules on the twelfth. LL 792-799, on the great twentieth, in full day, a wise man should be born. Such an one is very sound-witted. The tenth is favorable for a male to be born, but for a girl, the fourth day of the mid-month. On that day tame sheep and shambling, horned oxen, and the sharp-fanged dog and hardy mules to the touch of the hand. But take care to avoid troubles which eat out the heart on the fourth of the beginning and ending of the month, it is a day very fraught with fate. LL 800-801 on the fourth of the month bring home your bride, but choose the omens which are best for this business. LL 802-804, avoid fifth days, they are unkindly and terrible. On a fifth day, they say, the Aaron is assisted at the birth of Horcus, Oath, who marries, strife, bear to trouble the forsworn. 0 to 9, 
L L eight hundred and five to eight hundred and nine. Look about you very carefully and throw out Demeter's holy grain upon the well rolled one thousand three hundred and forty three threshing floor on the seventh of the mid month. Let the woodman cut beams for house building and plenty of ship's timbers, such as are suitable for ships. On the fourth day begin to build narrow ships. LL 810 to 813. The ninth of the mid month improves towards evening, but the first ninth of all is quite harmless for men. It is a good day on which to beget or to be born both for a male and a female, it is never an holy evil day. LL 814 to 818, again, few know that the 27th of the month is best for opening a wine jar, and putting yokes on the necks of oxen and mules and swift-footed horses and for hauling a swift ship of many thwarts down to the sparkling sea, few call it by its right name. LL 819-821, on the fourth day open a jar. The fourth of the mid-month is a day holy above all. And again, few men know that the fourth day after the twentieth is best while it is morning. Towards evening it is less good. LL 822-828 These days are a great blessing to men on earth, but the rest are changeable, luckless, and bring nothing. Everyone praises a different day but few know their nature. Sometimes a day is a stepmother, sometimes a mother. That man is happy and lucky in them who knows all these things and does his work without offending the deathless gods, who discerns the omens of birds and avoids transgressions. The divination by birds proclass on works and days, 828, some make the divination by birds, which Apollonius of Rhodes rejects as spurious, follow this verse. Works and Days, 828 The Astronomy Fragment Hash 1, Athena Us 11, p 491d, and the author of the Astronomy, which is attributed for Suth to Hesiod, always calls them, the Pleiades, Peleiades, but mortals call them Peleiades, and again, the stormy Peleiads go down, and again, then the Peleiads hide away. Scoli asked on Pindar, Nem. 216, the Pleiades. Whose stars are these, lovely Tigarte, and dark-faced Electra, and Alcin, and bright Asterop, and Kalino, and Maya, and Merup? whom glorious Atlas Bago. Lacuna, in the mountains of Kaleen she, Maya, bear Hermes, the herald of the gods. Fragment hash 2, Scoli asked on Aratus 254, but Zeus made them, the sisters of Hyas, into the stars which are called Hyads. Hesiod in his book about stars tells us their names as follows, Nymphs like the Graces 1401, Fissile and Coronis and rich-crowned Cleia and lovely Foucault and long-robed Eudora, whom the tribes of men upon the earth call Hyads. Fragment hash 3, Pseudoeratosthenes Catast. Frag. 1. 1402 The Great Bear Dot Hesiod says she, Callisto, was the daughter of Lycon and lived in Arcadia. She chose to occupy herself with wild beasts in the mountains together with Artemis, and, when she was seduced by Zeus, 
continued some time undetected by the goddess, but afterwards, when she was already with child, was seen by her bathing and so discovered. Upon this, the goddess was enraged and changed her into a beast. Thus she became a bear and gave birth to a son called Arcus. But while she was in the mountains, she was hunted by some goat herds and given up with her babe to Lycon. Some while after, she thought fit to go into the forbidden precinct of Zeus, not knowing the law, and being pursued by her own son and the Arcadians, was about to be killed because of the said law, but Zeus delivered her because of her connection with him and put her among the stars, giving her the name Bear because of the misfortune which had befallen her. Com. Suppleme. On Aratus, P. 547M8, of Boötes, also called the Bear Warden. The story goes that he is Arcus the son of Callisto and Zeus, and he lived in the country about Lysum. After Zeus had seduced Callisto, Lycon, pretending not to know of the matter, entertained Zeus, as Hesiod says and set before him on the table the babe which he had cut up. Fragment hash for Pseudoeratosthens, Catast. Fuxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
offer good sacrifices to the eternal gods. Fragment hash 2, Plutarch more. 1034 e, decide no suit until you have heard both sides speak. Fragment hash 3, Plutarch de Loric. Defecture 2. 415 c, a chattering crow lives out nine generations of aged men, but a stag's life is four times a crow's, and a raven's life makes three stags old, while the phoenix outlives nine ravens, but we, the rich-haired nymphs, daughters of Zeus the Aegis Holder, outlive ten phoenixes. Fragment hash four. Quintilian, I-15, some consider that children under the age of seven should not receive a literary education. That Hesiod was of this opinion very many writers affirm who were earlier than the critic Aristophanes, for he was the first to reject the precepts, in which book this maxim occurs, as a work of that poet. The Great Works Fragment Hash 1, Com. On Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics. V8. The verse, however, the slaying of Radamanthus, is in Hesiod in the Great Works and is as follows, If a man sow evil, he shall reap evil increase, if men do to him as he has done, it will be true justice. Fragment hash 2, Proclus on Hesiod, Works and Days, 126, Some believe that the silver race, is to be attributed to, the earth, declaring that in the great works Hesiod makes silver to be of the family of earth. The Idaean Dactyls Fragment hash 1, Pliny, Natural History 7. 56, 197, Hesiod says that those who are called the Idaean Dactyls taught the smelting and tempering of iron in Crete. Fragment hash 2, Clement, Stromatii I 16. 75, Selmis, again, and Damnomenus, the first of the Idaean Dactyls, discovered iron in Cyprus but bronze smelting was discovered by Dalas, another Idaean, though Hesiod calls him Scythes 1501. The Theogony, LL 1-25, from the Helicanian Muses let us begin to sing, who hold the great and holy mount of Helicon and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring and the altar of the almighty son of Kronos, and, when they have washed their tender bodies in Permisus or in the horse's spring or Omeus, make their fair, lovely dances upon highest helicon and move with vigorous feet. Thence they arise and go abroad by night, veiled in thick mist, and utter their song with lovely voice, praising Zeus the Aegis Holder and queenly Hera of Argus who walks on golden sandals and the daughter of Zeus the Aegis Holder bright-eyed Athene, and Phbus Apollo, and Artemis who delights in arrows, and Poseidon the Earth Holder who shakes the earth, and reverend Themis and quick-glancing 1601 Aphrodite and Heb with the crown of gold, and fair Dion, Leto, Iapetus, and Cronos the crafty. Counselor, Eos and great Helios and bright Selene, Earth too, and great Oceanus, and dark night, and the holy race of all the other deathless ones that are forever. And one day they taught Hesiod glorious song while he was shepherding his lambs under holy Helicon, and this word first the goddesses said to me, the muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus who holds the Aegis, LL 26-28, shepherds of the wilderness, wretched things of shame, 
mere bellies, we know how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know, when we will, to utter true things. LL 29-35 So said the redivoiced daughters of great Zeus, and they plucked and gave me a rod, a shoot of sturdy laurel, a marvellous thing and breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate things that shall be and things there were aforetime, and they bade me sing of the race of the blessed gods that are eternally, but ever to sing of themselves both first and last. But why all this about oak or stone? 1602 LL 36-52 Come thou. Let us begin with the muses who gladden the great spirit of their father Zeus in Olympus with their songs, telling of things that are and that shall be and that were aforetime with consenting voice. Unwearying flows the sweet sound from their lips, and the house of their father Zeus the loud thunderer is glad at the lily-like voice of the goddesses as it spread abroad and the peaks of snowy Olympus resound, and the homes of the immortals. And they uttering their immortal voice, celebrate in song first of all the reverend race of the gods from the beginning, those whom earth and wide heaven bego, and the gods sprung of these, givers of good things. Then, next, the goddesses sing of Zeus, the father of gods and men, as they begin and end their strain, how much he is the most excellent among the gods and supreme in power. And again, they chant the race of men and strong giants, and gladden the heart of Zeus within Olympus, the Olympian muses, daughters of Zeus the Aegis Holder. LL 53-74 The Minperia did Mnemosyne memory, who reigns over the hills of Eleutha, bearer of union with the father, the son of Kronos, a forgetting of ills and a rest from sorrow. For nine nights did wise Zeus lie with her, entering her holy bed remote from the immortals. And when a year was past and the seasons came round as the months waned, and many days were accomplished, she bare nine daughters, all of one mind, whose hearts are set upon song and their spirit free from care, a little way from the topmost peak of snowy Olympus. There are their bright dancing places and beautiful homes, and beside them the graces and Imerus, desire, live in delight. And they, uttering through their lips a lovely voice, Sing the laws of all and the goodly ways of the immortals, uttering their lovely voice. Then went they to Olympus, delighting in their sweet voice, with heavenly song, and the dark earth resounded about them as they chanted, and a lovely sound rose up beneath their feet as they went to their father. And he was reigning in heaven himself holding the lightning and glowing thunderbolt, when he had overcome by might his father Kronos, and he distributed fairly to the immortals their portions and declared their privileges. LL 75-103 These things, then, the muses sang who dwell on Olympus, nine daughters begotten by great Zeus, Cleo and Eutip, Thalea, Melpomne and Tipsicor, and Ereto and Polyhymnia and Urania and Calliope 1603, who is the chiefest of them all, for she attends on worshipful princes, whomsoever of heaven nourished princes the daughters of great Zeus honour, and behold him at his birth, they pour sweet dew upon his tongue and from his lips flow gracious words. All the people look towards him while he settles causes with true judgments, and he, speaking surely, would soon make wise end even of a great quarrel, 
for therefore are their princes wise in heart, because when the people are being misguided in their assembly, they set right the matter again with ease, persuading them with gentle words. And when he passes through a gathering, they greet him as a god with gentle reverence, and he is conspicuous amongst the assembled, such is the holy gift of the muses to men. For it is through the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there are singers and harpers upon the earth, but princes are of Zeus, and happy is he whom the muses love, sweet flows speech from his mouth. For though a man have sorrow and grief in his newly troubled soul and live in dread because his heart is distressed, yet, when a singer, the servant of the muses, chants the glorious deeds of men of old and the blessed gods who inhabit Olympus, at once he forgets his heaviness and remembers not his sorrows at all, but the gifts of the goddesses soon turn him away from these. LL 104-115 Hail, children of Zeus! Grant lovely song and celebrate the holy race of the deathless gods who are forever, those that were born of earth and starry heaven and gloomy night and them that briny sea did rear. Tell how at the first gods and earth came to be, and rivers, and the boundless sea with its raging swell, and the gleaming stars, and the white heaven above, and the gods who were born of them givers of good things, and how they divided their wealth, and how they shared their honours amongst them, and also how at the first they took many folded Olympus. These things declare to me from the beginning, ye muses who dwell in the house of Olympus, and tell me which of them first came to be. LL 116-138 Verily at the first chaos came to be, but next wide-bosomed earth, the ever-sure foundations of all 1,604 the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, and dim Tartarus in the depth of the wide-pathed earth, and Eros, love, fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus and black night, but of night were born Ether 1605 and day, whom she conceived and bare from union in love with Erebus. And earth first bare starry heaven, equal to herself to cover her on every side, and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. And she brought forth long hills, graceful haunts of the goddess nymphs who dwell amongst the glens of the hills. She bare also the fruitless deep with his raging swell, Pontus, without sweet union of love. But afterwards she lay with heaven and bare deep swirling Oceanus, Coeus and Creus and Hyperion and Iapetus, Thea and Rhea, Themis and Mnemosyne and gold crowned Phoebe and lovely Tethys. After them was born Cronos the wily, youngest and most terrible of her children, and he hated his lusty sire. LL 139-146, and again, she bare the Cyclopes, overbearing in spirit, Brontes, and Strapes and stubborn-hearted Arges 1606, who gave Zeus the thunder and made the thunderbolt, in all else they were like the gods but one eye only was set in the midst of their foreheads. And they were surnamed Cyclopes, Orbide, because one orbed eye was set in their foreheads. Strength and might and craft were in their works.
LL 147 to 163, and again, three other sons were born of earth and heaven, great and doughty beyond telling, Cotus and Briarius and Gis, presumptuous children. From their shoulders sprang an hundred arms, not to be approached, and each had fifty heads upon his shoulders on their strong limbs, and irresistible was the stubborn strength that was in their great forms. For of all the children that were born of earth and heaven, these were the most terrible, and they were hated by their own father from the first and he used to hide them all away in a secret place of earth so soon as each was born, and would not suffer them to come up into the light, and heaven rejoiced in his evil doing. But vast earth groaned within, being straightened, and she made the element of grey flint and shaped a great sickle, and told her plan to her dear sons. And she spoke cheering them, while she was vexed in her dear heart, LL 164-166, My children, gotten of a sinful father, if you will obey me, we should punish the vile outrage of your father, for he first thought of doing shameful things. LL 167-169 so she said, but fear seized them all, and none of them uttered a word. But great Cronos the wily took courage and answered his dear mother, LL 170-172, Mother, I will undertake to do this deed, for I reverence not our father of evil name, for he first thought of doing shameful things. LL 173-175, so he said, and vast earth rejoiced greatly in spirit, and set and hid him in an ambush, and put in his hands a jagged sickle, and revealed to him the whole plot. LL 176-206, and heaven came bringing on night and longing for love, and he lay about earth spreading himself full upon her 1607. Then the sun from his ambush stretched forth his left hand and in his right took the great long sickle with jagged teeth, and swiftly lopped off his own father's members and cast them away to fall behind him. And not vainly did they fall from his hand, for all the bloody drops that gushed forth earth received, and as the seasons moved round she bare the strong Erinys and the great giants with gleaming armour, holding long spears in their hands and the nymphs whom they call Malii 1608 all over the boundless earth. And so soon as he had cut off the members with flint and cast them from the land into the surging sea, they were swept away over the main a long time, and a white foam spread around them from the immortal flesh, and in it there grew a maiden. First she drew near holy Scythra, and from there, afterwards, she came to see girt Cyprus and came forth an awful and lovely goddess, and grass grew up about her beneath her shapely feet. Her gods and men call Aphrodite, and the foam-born goddess and rich-crowned Scythera, because she grew amid the foam, and Scythera because she reached Scythra, and Cyprogens because she was born in billowy Cyprus and Philomedes 1609 because sprang from the members. And with her went arrows, and comely desire followed her at her birth at the first and as she went into the assembly of the gods. This honour she has from the beginning, and this is the portion allotted to her amongst men and undying gods 
the whisperings of maidens and smiles and deceits with sweet delight and love and graciousness. LL 207 to 210. But these sons whom he bego himself great heaven used to call titans, strainers, in reproach, for he said that they strained and did presumptuously a fearful deed, and that vengeance for it would come afterwards. LL 211 to 225 and night bear hateful doom and black fate and death, and she bear sleep and the tribe of dreams. And again the goddess murky night, though she lay with none, bear blame and painful woe, and the Hesperides who guard the rich, golden apples and the trees bearing fruit beyond glorious ocean. Also she bear the destinies and ruthless avenging fates, Clotho and Lachesis and Atropo 1610, who give men at their birth both evil and good to have, and they pursue the transgressions of men and of gods, and these goddesses never cease from their dread anger until they punish the sinner with a sore penalty. Also deadly night bear nemesis, indignation, to afflict mortal men, and after her, deceit and friendship and hateful age and hard-hearted strife. LL 226-232, but abhorred strife bear painful toil and forgetfulness and famine and tearful sorrows, fightings also, battles murders, manslaughters, quarrels, lying words, disputes, lawlessness and ruin, all of one nature, and oath who most troubles men upon earth when anyone willfully swears a false oath. LL 233-239, and C. begat Nereus, the eldest of his children, who is true and lies not, and men call him the old man because he is trusty and gentle and does not forget the laws of righteousness, but thinks just and kindly thoughts. And yet again he got great thaumas and proud phsis, being mated with earth, and fair-cheeked Seto and Eurybia who has a heart of flint within her. LL 240-264, and of Nereus and rich-haired Doris, daughter of Ocean the perfect river, were born children 1611, passing lovely amongst goddesses, Ploto, Eucrint, Saun, and Amphitrite, and Eudora, and Thetis, Galen and Glauce, Cumet, Spo, Thu and lovely Halle, and Pasithea, and Erato, and rosy-armed Eunice, and gracious Melite, and Eulamen, and Agor, Doto, Prota, Ferusa, and Dynamen, and Nicaea, and Actae, and Protomede, Doris, Panopia, and comely Galatea, and lovely Hippot, and rosy-armed Hippono and Kamodos who with Kamatolage 1612 and Amphitrite easily calms the waves upon the misty sea and the blasts of raging winds, and Kamo, and Ione, and rich-crowned Alamod, and Glauconome, fond of laughter, and Pontoporia, Ligor, Euagor, and Laomede, and Polino, and Ortono, and Lysianasa, and Yun, lovely of shape and without blemish of form, and Samoth of charming figure and divine menip, Niso, Eupomp, Themisto, Prino, and Nemertz 1613 who has the nature of her deathless father. These fifty daughters sprang from blameless Nereus, skilled in excellent crafts. LL 265-269, to 
and Thaumas wedded Electra the daughter of deep flowing ocean, and she bare him swift Iris and the long haired harpies, Ilo, storm swift, and Osipetus, swift flyer, who on their swift wings keep pace with the blasts of the winds and the birds, for quick as time they dart along. LL 270 to 294, and again, Seto bear to Fsis the fair cheeked Gri, sisters grey from their birth, and both deathless gods and men who walk on earth call them Gri, Pemfredo well clad, and saffron robed Enio, and the Gorgons who dwell beyond glorious ocean in the frontier land towards night where are the clear voiced Hesperides, Stheno, and Uriel, and Medusa who suffered a woeful fate. She was mortal, but the two were undying and grew not old. With her lay the dark-haired one one thousand six hundred and fourteen in a soft meadow amid spring flowers. And when Perseus cut off her head, there sprang forth great Chrysa and the horse Pegasus who is so called because he was born near the springs, Pege, of ocean and that other, because he held a golden blade, Aeor, in his hands. Now Pegasus flew away and left the earth, the mother of flocks, and came to the deathless gods, and he dwells in the house of Zeus and brings to wise Zeus the thunder and lightning. But Chrysa was joined in love to call her, the daughter of glorious ocean, and Bago three-headed true ones. Him mighty Heracles slew in Seagirt Erythia by his shambling oxen on that day when he drove the wide-browed oxen to holy Tyrins, and had crossed the ford of ocean and killed Orthus and Eurytion the herdsmen in the dim stead out beyond glorious ocean. LL 295-305 and in a hollow cave she bare another monster, irresistible, in no wise like either to mortal men or to the undying gods, even the goddess fierce Echidna who is half a nymph with glancing eyes and fair cheeks, and half again a huge snake, great and awful, with speckled skin, eating raw flesh beneath the secret parts of the holy earth. And there she has a cave deep down under a hollow rock far from the deathless gods and mortal men. There, then, did the gods appoint her a glorious house to dwell in, and she keeps guard in a rima beneath the earth, grim echidna, a nymph who dies not nor grows old all her days. LL 306-332 Men say that Typhon the terrible, outrageous and lawless, was joined in love to her, the maid with glancing eyes. So she conceived and brought forth fierce offspring, first she bare Orthus the hound of Druans, and then again she bare a second, a monster not to be overcome and that may not be described, Cerberus who eats raw flesh the brazen-voiced hound of Hads, fifty-headed, relentless and strong. And again she bore a third, the evil-minded Hydra of Lerna, whom the goddess, white-armed Hera nourished, being angry beyond measure with the mighty Heracles. And her Heracles, the son of Zeus, of the house of Amphitryon, together with warlike Iolaus, destroyed with the unpitying sword through the plans of Athene the spoil driver. She was the mother of Chimera who breathed raging fire, a creature fearful, great, swift-footed and strong, who had three heads, one of a grim-eyed lion, in her hinder part, a dragon, and in her middle, a goat, breathing forth a fearful blast of blazing fire. Her did Pegasus and noble Bellerophon slay, 
but Echidna was subject in love to Orthus and brought forth the deadly Sphinx which destroyed the Cadmines, and the Nemean Lion, which Hera, the good wife of Zeus, brought up and made to haunt the hills of Nemi, a plague to men. There he preyed upon the tribes of her own people and had power over Tretus of Nemi and Apses, yet the strength of stout Heracles overcame him. LL 333-336 And Seto was joined in love to Phsis and bare her youngest the awful snake who guards the apples all of gold in the secret places of the dark earth at its great bounds. This is the offspring of Seto and Phsis. LL 334-345, and Tethys bear to ocean-eddying rivers, Nilus, and Alpheus, and deep-swirling Eridanus, Strimon, and Meander and the fair stream of Ista, and Phasis, and Rhesus, and the silver eddies of Ichelus, Nessus, and Rhodius, Haliacmon, and Heptoporus, Granicus, and Esepus, and Holy Simoi, and Penus, and Hermus, and Caicus fair stream, and great Sangorus, Ladon, Parthenius, Euonus, Ardiscus, and divine Scamander. LL 346 to 370. Also, she brought forth a holy company of daughters 1615 who, with the Lord Apollo and the rivers, have youths in their keeping. To this charge, Zeus appointed them Pytho, and Admet, and Eumth, and Electra, and Doris, and Primo and Urania divine in form, Hippo, Clemen, Rhodi, and Kaulur, Zuxo and Clyte, and Idea, and Pasithu, Plexra, and Galaxora, and lovely Dion, Melibosis and Thu and handsome Polydora, Circe's lovely of form, and soft-eyed Pluto, Persis, Ianera, Acast, Xanth, Petra Ea the Fair, Menestho, and Europa, Metis, and Eurinome, and Telesto Saffron Clad, Chrysis and Asia and Charming Calypso, Eudora, and Titch, Ampherho, and Osir, and Styx who is the chiefest of them all. These are the eldest daughters that sprang from Ocean and Tethys, but there are many besides. For there are three thousand neat ankled daughters of ocean who are dispersed far and wide, and in every place alike serve the earth and the deep waters, children who are glorious among goddesses. And as many other rivers are there, babbling as they flow, sons of ocean, whom queenly Tethys bear, but their names it is hard for a mortal man to tell but people know those by which they severally dwell. LL 371-374 And Thea was subject in love to Hyperion and bare great Helios, Sun, and clear Selene, Moon, and Eos, Dawn, who shines upon all that are on earth and upon the deathless gods who live in the wide heaven. LL 375 to 377, and Eurybia, bright goddess, was joined in love to Creus and bare great Astraeus, and Pallas, and Perses, who also was eminent among all men in wisdom. LL 378 to 382, and Eos bare to Astraeus the strong hearted winds brightening Zephyrus, and Boreas, headlong in his course, and Notus, a goddess mating in love with a god. And after these Erigenia 1616 bear the starry Osphorus, Dawnbringer, and the gleaming stars with which heaven is crowned. 
LL 383 to 403, and STYX the daughter of Ocean was joined to Polis and Bear Zealous, Emulation, and Trim Ankled Nike, Victory, in the house. Also she brought forth Kratos, Strength, and Bia, Force, Wonderful Children. These have no house apart from Zeus, nor any dwelling nor path except that wherein God leads them, but they dwell always with Zeus the loud thunderer. For so did Styx the deathless daughter of Ocean plan on that day when the Olympian Lightener called all the deathless gods to great Olympus and said that whosoever of the gods would fight with him against the Titans, he would not cast him out from his rights, but each should have the office which he had before amongst the deathless gods. And he declared that he who was without office and rights under Kronos, should be raised to both office and rights as is just. So Deathless Styx came first to Olympus with her children through the wit of her dear father. And Zeus honoured her, and gave her very great gifts, for her he appointed to be the great oath of the gods, and her children to live with him always. And as he promised, so he performed fully unto them all but he himself mightily reigns and rules. LL 404-452 Again, Phoebe came to the desired embrace of Coeus. Then the goddess through the love of the god conceived and brought forth dark-gowned Leto, always mild, kind to men and to the deathless gods, mild from the beginning gentlest in all Olympus. Also she bear Asteria of happy name, whom Perses once led to his great house to be called his dear wife. And she conceived and bear Hecate whom Zeus the son of Cronos honoured above all. He gave her splendid gifts, to have a share of the earth and the unfruitful sea. She received honour also in starry heaven, and is honoured exceedingly by the deathless gods. For to this day, whenever any one of men on earth offers rich sacrifices and prays for favour according to custom, he calls upon Hecate. Great honour comes full easily to him whose prayers the goddess receives favourably, and she bestows wealth upon him for the power surely is with her. For as many as were born of earth and ocean amongst all these she has her due portion. The son of Kronos did her no wrong nor took anything away of all that was her portion among the former titan gods, but she holds, as the division was at the first from the beginning, privilege both in earth, and in heaven, and in sea. Also, because she is an only child, the goddess receives not less honour, but much more still, for Zeus honours her. Whom she will she greatly aids and advances, she sits by worshipful kings in judgment, and in the assembly whom she will is distinguished among the people. And when men arm themselves for the battle that destroys men, then the goddess is at hand to give victory and grant glory readily to whom she will. Good is she also when men contend at the games, for there too the goddess is with them and profits them, and he who by might and strength gets the victory wins the rich prize easily with joy, and brings glory to his parents. And she is good to stand by horsemen whom she will, and to those whose business is in the grey discomfortable sea, and who pray to Hecate and the loud crashing earth shaker, easily the glorious goddess gives great catch, and easily she takes it away as soon as seen, if so she will. 
she is good in the buyer with Hermes to increase the stock. The droves of kine and white herds of goats and flocks of fleecy sheep, if she will, she increases from a few, or makes many to be less. So, then, albeit her mother's only child 1617, she is honoured amongst all the deathless gods. And the son of Kronos made her a nurse of the young who after that day saw with their eyes the light of all-seeing dawn. So from the beginning she is a nurse of the young, and these are her honours. LL 453-491 But Rhea was subject in love to Kronos and bare splendid children. Hestia 1618, Demeter, and gold shod Hera and strong Hads, pitiless in heart, who dwells under the earth, and the loud crashing earth shaker, and wise Zeus, father of gods and men, by whose thunder the wide earth is shaken. These great Kronos swallowed as each came forth from the womb to his mother's knees with this intent, that no other of the proud sons of heaven should hold the kingly office amongst the deathless gods. For he learned from earth and starry heaven that he was destined to be overcome by his own son, strong though he was through the contriving of great Zeus 1619. Therefore he kept no blind outlook, but watched and swallowed down his children, and unceasing grief seized Rhea. But when she was about to bear Zeus, the father of gods and men, then she besought her own dear parents, earth and starry heaven to devise some plan with her that the birth of her dear child might be concealed, and that retribution might overtake great, crafty Kronos for his own father and also for the children whom he had swallowed down. And they readily heard and obeyed their dear daughter, and told her all that was destined to happen touching Kronos the king and his stout-hearted son. So they sent her to Laetus, to the rich land of Crete, when she was ready to bear great Zeus, the youngest of her children. Him did vast earth receive from Rhea in wide Crete to nourish and to bring up. Thither came earth carrying him swiftly through the black night to Lyctus first, and took him in her arms and hid him in a remote cave beneath the secret places of the holy earth on thick-wooded Mount Aegeum, but to the mightily ruling son of heaven, the earlier king of the gods, she gave a great stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. Then he took it in his hands and thrust it down into his belly, wretch, he knew not in his heart that in place of the stone his son was left behind, unconquered and untroubled, and that he was soon to overcome him by force and might and drive him from his honours, himself to reign over the deathless gods. LL 492-506 After that the strength and glorious limbs of the prince increased quickly, and as the years rolled on, great Kronos the wily was beguiled by the deep suggestions of earth, and brought up again his offspring, vanquished by the arts and might of his own son, and he vomited up first the stone which he had swallowed last. And Zeus set it fast in the wide path dearth at goodly Pytho under the glens of Parnassus, to be a sign thenceforth and a marvel to mortal men 1620. And he set free from their deadly bonds the brothers of his father, sons of heaven whom his father in his foolishness had bound. And they remembered to be grateful to him for his kindness, 
and gave him thunder and the glowing thunderbolt and lightning, for before that, a huge earth had hidden these. In them he trusts and rules over mortals and immortals. LL 507-543 Now Iapetus took to wife the neat-ankled mad Clemen, daughter of Ocean, and went up with her into one bed. And she bare him a stout-hearted son, Atlas, also she bare very glorious Menoetius and clever Prometheus, full of various wiles and scatter-brained Epimetheus who from the first was a mischief to men who eat bread, for it was he who first took of Zeus the woman, the maiden whom he had formed. But Menoetius was outrageous, and far-seeing Zeus struck him with a lurid thunderbolt and sent him down to Erebus because of his mad presumption and exceeding pride. And Atlas through hard constraint upholds the wide heaven with unwearying head and arms, standing at the borders of the earth before the clear-voiced Hesperides, for this lot wise Zeus assigned to him. And ready-witted Prometheus he bound with inextricable bonds, cruel chains, and drove a shaft through his middle, and set on him a long-winged eagle which used to eat his immortal liver, but by night the liver grew as much again ever I weigh as the long-winged bird devoured in the whole day. That bird Heracles, the valiant son of shapely ankled Alcman, slew, and delivered the son of Iapetus from the cruel plague, and released him from his affliction, not without the will of Olympian Zeus who reigns on high that the glory of Heracles the Thebanborn might be yet greater than it was before over the plenteous earth. This, then, he regarded, and honoured his famous son, though he was angry, he ceased from the wrath which he had before because Prometheus matched himself in wit with the almighty son of Cronos. For when the gods and mortal men had a dispute at Mekon, even then Prometheus was forward to cut up a great ox and set portions before them, trying to befool the mind of Zeus. Before the rest he set flesh and inner parts thick with fat upon the hide, covering them with an ox paunch. But for Zeus he put the white bones dressed up with cunning art and covered with shining fat. Then the father of men and of God said to him, LL 543-544, son of Iapetus, most glorious of all lords, good sir, how unfairly you have divided the portions. LL 545 to 547, so said Zeus whose wisdom is everlasting, rebuking him. But wily Prometheus answered him, smiling softly and not forgetting his cunning trick, LL 548 to 558, Zeus most glorious and greatest of the eternal gods, take whichever of these portions your heart within you bids. So he said, thinking trickery. But Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, saw and failed not to perceive the trick, and in his heart he thought mischief against mortal men which also was to be fulfilled. With both hands he took up the white fat and was angry at heart, and wrath came to his spirit when he saw the white ox bones craftily tricked out, and because of this the tribes of men upon earth burn white bones to the deathless gods upon fragrant altars. But Zeus who drives the clouds was greatly vexed and said to him, LL 559-560, son of Iapetus, clever above all. So, sir, you have not yet forgotten your cunning arts. 
LL 561 to 584, so spake Zeus in anger, whose wisdom is everlasting, and from that time he was always mindful of the trick, and would not give the power of unwearying fire to the Malayan 1621 race of mortal men who live on the earth. But the noble son of Iapetus outwitted him and stole the far-seen gleam of unwearying fire in a hollow fennel stalk. And Zeus who thunders on high was stung in spirit, and his dear heart was angered when he saw amongst men the far-seen ray of fire. Forthwith he made an evil thing for men as the price of fire for the very famous limping god formed of earth the likeness of a shy maiden as the son of Cronos willed. And the goddess bright-eyed Athene girded and clothed her with silvery aiment, and down from her head she spread with her hands a broidered veil, a wonder to see, and she, Pallas Athene, put about her head lovely garlands, flowers of new-grown herbs. Also she put upon her head a crown of gold which the very famous limping god made himself and worked with his own hands as a favour to Zeus his father. On it was much curious work, wonderful to see, for of the many creatures which the land and sea rear up, he put most upon it, wonderful things, like living beings with voices and great beauty shone out from it. LL 585-589 But when he had made the beautiful evil to be the price for the blessing, he brought her out, delighting in the finery which the bright-eyed daughter of a mighty father had given her, to the place where the other gods and men were. And wonder took hold of the deathless gods and mortal men when they saw that which was sheer guile, not to be withstood by men. LL 590-612 For from her is the race of women and female kind, of her is the deadly race and tribe of women who live amongst mortal men to their great trouble, no help meets in hateful poverty but only in wealth. And as in thatched hives bees feed the drones whose nature is to do mischief, by day and throughout the day until the sun goes down the bees are busy and lay the white combs, while the drones stay at home in the covered skeps and reap the toil of others into their own bellies, even so Zeus who thunders on high made women to be an evil to mortal men with a nature to do evil. And he gave them a second evil to be the price for the good they had, whoever avoids marriage and the sorrows that women cause, and will not wed, reaches deadly old age without anyone to tend his years, and though he at least has no lack of livelihood while he lives, yet, when he is dead, his kinsfolk divide his possessions amongst them. And as for the man who chooses the lot of marriage and takes a good wife suited to his mind, evil continually contends with good, for whoever happens to have mischievous children, lives always with unceasing grief in his spirit and heart within him, and this evil cannot be healed. LL 613-616 so it is not possible to deceive or go beyond the will of Zeus, for not even the son of Iapetus, kindly Prometheus, escaped his heavy anger, but of necessity strong bands confined him, although he knew many a while. LL 617-643 but when first their father was vexed in his heart with Abrarius and Cottus and Gyes, he bound them in cruel bonds, because he was jealous of their exceeding manhood and comeliness and great size, 
And he made them live beneath the wide path earth, where they were afflicted, being set to dwell under the ground, at the end of the earth, at its great borders, in bitter anguish for a long time and with great grief at heart. But the son of Kronos and the other deathless gods whom rich haired Rhea bear from union with Kronos, brought them up again to the light at Earth's advising. For she herself recounted all things to the gods fully, how that with these they would gain victory and a glorious cause to vaunt themselves. For the Titan gods and as many as sprang from Kronos had long been fighting together in stubborn war with heart-grieving toil, the lordly Titans from high Athis, but the gods, givers of good, whom rich haired Rhea bear in union with Kronos, from Olympus. So they, with bitter wrath, were fighting continually with one another at that time for ten full years, and the hard strife had no close or end for either side, and the issue of the war hung evenly balanced. But when he had provided those three with all things fitting, nectar and ambrosia which the gods themselves eat, and when their proud spirit revived within them all after they had fed on nectar and delicious ambrosia, then it was that the father of men and gods spoke amongst them, LL 644-653, Hear me, bright children of earth and heaven, that I may say what my heart within me bids. A long while now have we, who are sprung from Kronos and the Titan gods, fought with each other every day to get victory and to prevail. But do you show your great might and unconquerable strength, and face the Titans in bitter strife, for remember our friendly kindness, and from what sufferings you are come back to the light from your cruel bondage under misty gloom through our counsels. LL 654-663, so he said. And blameless Cotus answered him again, Divine One, you speak that which we know well, nay, even of ourselves we know that your wisdom and understanding is exceeding, and that you became a defender of the deathless ones from chill doom. And through your devising we are come back again from the murky gloom and from our merciless bonds, enjoying what we looked not for, O Lord, son of Kronos. And so now with fixed purpose and deliberate counsel we will aid your power in dreadful strife and will fight against the Titans in hard battle. LL 664-686, so he said, and the gods, givers of good things, applauded when they heard his word, and their spirit longed for war even more than before, and they all, both male and female, stirred up hated battle that day, the titan gods, and all that were born of Kronos together with those dread mighty ones of overwhelming strength whom Zeus brought up to the light from Erebus beneath the earth. An hundred arms sprang from the shoulders of all alike, and each had fifty heads growing upon his shoulders upon stout limbs. These, then, stood against the titans in grim strife, holding huge rocks in their strong hands and on the other part the titans eagerly strengthened their ranks, and both sides at one time showed the work of their hands and their might. The boundless sea rang terribly around, and the earth crashed loudly, wide heaven was shaken and groaned, and high Olympus reeled from its foundation under the charge of the undying gods and a heavy quaking reached dim Tartarus and the deep sound of their feet in the fearful onset and of their hard missiles. So, then, 
they launched their grievous shafts upon one another, and the cry of both armies as they shouted reached to starry heaven, and they met together with a great battle cry. LL 687-712 Then Zeus no longer held back his might, but straight his heart was filled with fury and he showed forth all his strength. From heaven and from Olympus he came forth with, hurling his lightning. The bolts flew thick and fast from his strong hand together with thunder and lightning, whirling an awesome flame. The life-giving earth crashed around in burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all about. All the land seethed, and oceans streams and the unfruitful sea. The hot vapor lapped round the earth-born titans, flame unspeakable rose to the bright upper air, the flashing glare of the thunderstone and lightning blinded their eyes for all that there were strong. Astounding heat seized chaos, and to see with eyes and to hear the sound with ears it seemed even as if earth and wide heaven above came together. For such a mighty crash would have arisen if earth were being hurled to ruin, and heaven from on high were hurling her down, so great a crash was there while the gods were meeting together in strife. Also the winds brought rumbling earthquake and dust storm, thunder and lightning and the lurid thunderbolt, which are the shafts of great Zeus and carried the clangor and the war cry into the midst of the two hosts. An horrible uproar of terrible strife arose, mighty deeds were shown and the battle inclined. But until then, they kept at one another and fought continually in cruel war. LL 713-735 and amongst the foremost Cotus and Briarias and Gies insatiate for war raised fierce fighting, three hundred rocks, one upon another, they launched from their strong hands and overshadowed the Titans with their missiles, and buried them beneath the wide path earth, and bound them in bitter chains when they had conquered them by their strength for all their great spirit as far beneath the earth to Tartarus. For a brazen anvil falling down from heaven nine nights and days would reach the earth upon the tenth, and again, a brazen anvil falling from earth nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the tenth. Round it runs a fence of bronze, and night spreads in triple line all about it like a neck circlet while above grow the roots of the earth and unfruitful sea. Thereby the counsel of Zeus who drives the clouds the titan gods are hidden under misty gloom, in a dank place where are the ends of the huge earth. And they may not go out, for Poseidon fixed gates of bronze upon it, and a wall runs all round it on every side. Their Gies and Cotus and great soul Debrius live, trusty warders of Zeus who holds the Aegis. LL 736-744, and there, all in their order, are the sources and ends of gloomy earth and misty Tartarus and the unfruitful sea and starry heaven, loathsome and dank, which even the gods abhor. It is a great gulf, and if once a man were within the gates, he would not reach the floor until a whole year had reached its end, but cruel blast upon blast would carry him this way and that. And this marvel is awful even to the deathless gods. LL 744-757 there stands the awful home of murky night wrapped in dark clouds. 
in front of it the son of Iapetus 1622 stands immovably upholding the white heaven upon his head and unwearying hands, where night and day draw near and greet one another as they pass the great threshold of bronze, and while the one is about to go down into the house, the other comes out at the door. And the house never holds them both within but always one is without the house passing over the earth, while the other stays at home and waits until the time for her journeying come, and the one holds all-seeing light for them on earth, but the other holds in her arms sleep the brother of death, even evil night, wrapped in a vaporous cloud. LL 758-766 and there the children of dark night have their dwellings, sleep and death, awful gods. The glowing sun never looks upon them with his beams, neither as he goes up into heaven, nor as he comes down from heaven. And the former of them roams peacefully over the earth and the seas broad back and is kindly to men, but the other has a heart of iron and his spirit within him is pitiless as bronze, whomsoever of men he has once seized he holds fast, and he is hateful even to the deathless gods. LL 767-774 There, in front, stand the echoing halls of the god of the lower world, strong hads, and of awful Persephone. A fearful hound guards the house in front, pitiless, and he has a cruel trick. On those who go in he fawns with his tail and both his ears, but suffers them not to go out back again, but keeps watch and devours whomsoever he catches going out of the gates of strong hads and awful Persephone. LL 775 to 806, and there dwells the goddess loathed by the deathless gods, terrible Styx, eldest daughter of back flowing 1623 ocean. She lives apart from the gods in her glorious house vaulted over with great rocks and propped up to heaven all round with silver pillars. Rarely does the daughter of Thaumas, swift-footed Iris, come to her with a message over the sea's wide back. But when strife and quarrel arise among the deathless gods, and when any of them who live in the house of Olympus lies, then Zeus sends Iris to bring in a golden jug the great oath of the gods from far away the famous cold water which trickles down from a high and beetling rock. Far under the white path earth a branch of Oceanus flows through the dark night out of the holy stream, and a tenth part of his water is allotted to her. With nine silver swirling streams he winds about the earth and the sea's wide back and then falls into the main 1624, but the tenth flows out from a rock, a sore trouble to the gods. For whoever of the deathless gods that hold the peaks of snowy Olympus pours a libation of her water is forsworn, lies breathless until a full year is completed, and never comes near to taste ambrosia and nectar, but lies spiritless and voiceless on a strewn bed, and a heavy trance overshadows him. But when he has spent a long year in his sickness, another penance and an harder follows after the first. For nine years he is cut off from the eternal gods and never joins their councils of their feasts, nine full years but in the tenth year he comes again to join the assemblies of the deathless gods who live in the house of Olympus. Such an oath, then, did the gods appoint the eternal and primeval water of Styx to be, 
and it spouts through a rugged place. LL 807 to 819, and there, all in their order, are the sources and ends of the dark earth and misty Tartarus and the unfruitful sea and starry heaven, loathsome and dank, which even the gods abhor. And there are shining gates and an immovable threshold of bronze having unending roots and it is grown of itself 1625. And beyond, away from all the gods, live the titans, beyond gloomy chaos. But the glorious allies of loud crashing Zeus have their dwelling upon ocean's foundations, even Cotus and Gyes. But Briarias, being goodly, the deep roaring earth shaker made his son in law, giving him Kamapoli his daughter to wed. LL 820 to 868. But when Zeus had driven the Titans from heaven, a huge earth bare her youngest child Typhus of the love of Tartarus, by the aid of golden Aphrodite. Strength was with his hands in all that he did and the feet of the strong god were untiring. From his shoulders grew an hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon, with dark, flickering tongues, and from under the brows of his eyes in his marvellous heads flashed fire, and fire burned from his heads as he glared. And there were voices in all his dreadful heads which uttered every kind of sound unspeakable, for at one time they made sounds such that the gods understood, but at another, the noise of a bull bellowing aloud in proud ungovernable fury, and at another, the sound of a lion, relentless of heart, and at another, sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear, and again, at another, he would hiss, so that the high mountains re-echoed. And truly a thing past help would have happened on that day, and he would have come to reign over mortals and immortals, had not the father of men and gods been quick to perceive it. But he thundered hard and mightily, and the earth around resounded terribly and the wide heaven above and the sea and ocean's streams and the nether parts of the earth. Great Olympus reeled beneath the divine feet of the king as he arose and earth groaned thereate. And through the two of them he took hold on the dark blue sea, through the thunder and lightning, and through the fire from the monster, and the scorching winds and blazing thunderbolt. The whole earth seethed and sky and sea, and the long waves raged along the beaches round and about, at the rush of the deathless gods, and there arose an endless shaking. Hads trembled where he rules over the dead below, and the titans under Tartarus who live with Kronos, because of the unending clamour and the fearful strife. So when Zeus had raised up his might and seized his arms, thunder and lightning and lurid thunderbolt, he leaped from Olympus and struck him, and burned all the marvellous heads of the monster about him. But when Zeus had conquered him and lashed him with strokes, Typhus was hurled down, a maimed wreck, so that the huge earth groaned and flame shot forth from the thunder-stricken lord in the dim rugged glens of the mount 1626, when he was smitten. A great part of huge earth was scorched by the terrible vapour and melted as tin melts when heated by men's art in channeled 1627 crucibles, or as iron which is hardest of all things, is softened by glowing fire in mountain glens and melts in the divine earth through the strength of Hephaestus 1628. Even so, then, 
the earth melted in the glow of the blazing fire. And in the bitterness of his anger Zeus cast him into white Tartarus. LL 869-880, and from typhoons come boisterous winds which blow damply, except Notus and Boreas and clear Zephyr. These are a godsend kind, and a great blessing to men, but the others blow fitfully upon the seas. Some rush upon the misty sea and work great havoc among men with their evil, raging blasts, for varying with the season they blow, scattering ships and destroying sailors. And men who meet these upon the sea have no help against the mischief. Others again over the boundless, flowering earth spoil the fair fields of men who dwell below, filling them with dust and cruel uproar. LL 881-885 But when the blessed gods had finished their toil, and settled by force their struggle for honours with the titans, they pressed far-seeing Olympian Zeus to reign and to rule over them by Earth's prompting. So he divided their dignities amongst them. LL 886-900 Now Zeus, king of the gods, made Metis his wife first, and she was wisest among gods and mortal men. But when she was about to bring forth the goddess bright-eyed Athene, Zeus craftily deceived her with cunning words and put her in his own belly, as earth and starry heaven advised. For they advised him so, to the end that no other should hold royal sway over the eternal gods in place of Zeus, for very wise children were destined to be born of her, first the maiden bright-eyed Tritogenea equal to her father in strength and in wise understanding, but afterwards she was to bear a son of overbearing spirit, king of gods and men. But Zeus put her into his own belly first, that the goddess might devise for him both good and evil. LL 901-906 Next he married bright Themis who bare the hoary, ours, and Unamaya, order, dyke, justice, and blooming Irene, peace, who mind the works of mortal men, and the Moari, fates, to whom wise Zeus gave the greatest honor, Clotho, and Lachesis, and Atropo who give mortal men evil and good to have. LL 907-911, and Eurynome, the daughter of Ocean, beautiful in form, bear him three fair-cheeked chariots, Graces, Aglaia, and Euphrosyne, and lovely Thalea, from whose eyes as they glanced flowed love that unnerves the limbs, and beautiful is their glance beneath their brows. LL 912-914, also he came to the bed of all-nourishing Demeter, and she bare white-armed Persephone who made Unus carried off from her mother, but wise Zeus gave her to him. LL 915-917, and again, he loved Mnemosyne with the beautiful hair and of her the nine gold-crowned muses were born who delight in feasts and the pleasures of song. LL 918-920, and Leto was joined in love with Zeus who holds the Aegis, and bear Apollo and Artemis delighting in arrows, children lovely above all the sons of heaven. LL 921-923, lastly, he made Hera his blooming wife, and she was joined in love with the king of gods and men, and brought forth Heb and Ars and Dilathea. LL 924-929, 
but Zeus himself gave birth from his own head to bright-eyed Tritogenia 1629, the awful, the strife-stirring, the host leader, the unwearying, the queen, who delights in tumults and wars and battles. But Hera without union with Zeus, for she was very angry and quarrelled with her mate, bare famous Hephaestus, who is skilled in crafts more than all the sons of heaven. LL 929A 929T 1630 But Hera was very angry and quarrelled with her mate. And because of this strife she bare without union with Zeus who holds the Aegis a glorious son, Hephaestus, who excelled all the sons of heaven in crafts. But Zeus lay with the fair-cheeked daughter of Ocean and Tethys apart from Hera. Lacuna, deceiving Metis, thought, although she was full wise. But he seized her with his hands and put her in his belly, for fear that she might bring forth something stronger than his thunderbolt. Therefore did Zeus, who sits on high and dwells in the ether, swallow her down suddenly. But she straightway conceived Polysothene, and the father of men and gods gave her birth by way of his head on the banks of the river Trito. And she remained hidden beneath the inward parts of Zeus, even Metis, Athena's mother, worker of righteousness, who was wiser than gods and mortal men. There the goddess, Athena, received that 1631 whereby she excelled in strength all the deathless ones who dwell in Olympus. She who made the host scaring weapon of Athena. And with it, Zeus, gave her birth, arrayed in arms of war. LL 930-933 And of Amphitrite and the loud roaring earth shaker was born great, wide ruling Triton, and he owns the depths of the sea living with his dear mother and the Lord his father in their golden house, an awful God. LL 933-937 Also Scythera bear to us the shield pierce of panic and fear, terrible gods who drive in disorder the close ranks of men in numbing war, with the help of us, sacker of towns and Harmonia whom high-spirited Ctmus made his wife. LL 938-939, and Maya, the daughter of Atlas, bear to Zeus glorious Hermes, the herald of the deathless gods, for she went up into his holy bed. LL 940-942, and Seamal daughter of Ctmus was joined with him in love and bare him a splendid son, joyous Dionysius, a mortal woman an immortal son. And now they both are gods. LL 943-944 And Alcmena was joined in love with Zeus who drives the clouds and bare mighty Heracles. LL 945-946, and Hephaestus, the famous lame one, made Aglaia, youngest of the graces, his buxom wife. LL 947-949, and golden-haired Dionysius made brown-haired Ariadne, the daughter of Minos his buxom wife, and the son of Cronos made her deathless and unaging for him. LL 950-955, and mighty Heracles, the valiant son of Neat ankled Alcmena, when he had finished his grievous toils, 
made Heb the child of great Zeus and gold shod Hera his shy wife in snowy Olympus. Happy he! For he has finished his great works and lives amongst the undying gods, untroubled and unaging all his days. LL 956-962, and Persis, the daughter of Ocean, bear to unwearying Helios Circe and Aetis the king. And Aetis, the son of Helios who shows light to men, took to wife fair-cheeked Idea, daughter of Ocean the perfect stream, by the will of the gods and she was subject to him in love through golden Aphrodite and bare him neat ankled Medi. LL 963-968 And now farewell, you dwellers on Olympus and you islands and continents and thou briny sea within. Now sing the company of goddesses, sweet-voiced muses of Olympus daughter of Zeus who holds the Aegis, even those deathless one who lay with mortal men and bear children like unto gods. LL 969-974 Demeter, bright goddess, was joined in sweet love with the hero Eosioin in a thrice-ploughed fallow in the rich land of Crete, and bear Plutus a kindly god who goes everywhere over land and the seas wide back, and him who finds him and into whose hands he comes he makes rich, bestowing great wealth upon him. LL 975-978 And Harmonia, the daughter of golden Aphrodite, Bear to Ktmasino and Seemal and fair-cheeked Agave and Autono whom long-haired Arista Elis wedded, and Polydorus also in rich crowned Thib. LL 979-983, and the daughter of Ocean, Kolura was joined in the love of rich Aphrodite with stout-hearted Chrysa and bear a son who was the strongest of all men. True ones, whom mighty Heracles killed in sea girt Erythia for the sake of his shambling oxen. LL 984 991, and Eos bear to Tythonus brazen crested Memon, king of the Ethiopians, and the Lord Emathian. And to Cephalus she bear a splendid son, strong Phaethon a man like the gods, whom, when he was a young boy in the tender flower of glorious youth with childish thoughts, laughter-loving Aphrodite seized and caught up and made a keeper of her shrine by night, a divine spirit. LL 993-1002, and the son of Aeson by the will of the gods led away from Aetes the daughter of Aetes the heaven-nurtured king when he had finished the many grievous labours which the great king, overbearing Peleus, that outrageous and presumptuous door of violence, put upon him. But when the son of Aeson had finished them, he came to Iolcus after long toil bringing the coy-eyed girl with him on his swift ship, and made her his buxom wife. And she was subject to Eason, shepherd of the people, and bare a son Medeus whom Chiron the son of Philera brought up in the mountains. And the will of great Zeus was fulfilled. LL 1003-1007 But of the daughters of Nereus, the old man of the sea, Sameth the fair goddess, was loved by Iacchus through golden Aphrodite and bare Phocus. And the silver-shod goddess Thetis was subject to Peleus and brought forth lion-hearted Achilles, the destroyer of men. LL 1008-1010, and Cythera with the beautiful crown was joined in sweet love with the hero Anchises and Berenice on the peaks of Ida with its many wooded glens. 
LL 1011 to 1016, and Circe the daughter of Helios, Hyperion's son, loved steadfast Odysseus and bare Agrius and Latinus who was faultless and strong, also she brought forth Telegonus by the will of golden Aphrodite. And they ruled over the famous Tyrrhenians, very far off in a recess of the holy islands. LL 1017-1018, and the bright goddess Calypso was joined to Odysseus in sweet love, and bare him Norsithus and Norsinus. LL 1019-1020, these are the immortal goddesses who lay with mortal men and bear them children like unto gods. LL 1021-1022, but now. Sweet-voiced muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus who holds the Aegis, sing of the company of women. The Catalogues of Women and EOIAE 1701 Fragment Hash 1, Scoliast on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 3186, that Deucalion was the son of Prometheus and Prania. Hesiod states in the first catalogue, as also that Helen was the son of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Fragment hash 2, Ions Lygus 1702, Demens. I 13, they came to call those who followed local manners Latins, but those who followed Hellenic customs Greeks after the brothers Latinus and Gracus, as Hesiod says, and in the palace Padora the daughter of noble Deucalion was joined in love with Father Zeus, leader of all the gods, and bear Gracus, staunch in battle. Fragment Hush 3, Constantinus Porphroginitus 1703, De them. 2 p.m. 48 b. The district Macedonia took its name from Macedon the son of Zeus and Thyre, Deucalion's daughter, as Hesiod says, and she conceived and bare to Zeus who delights in the thunderbolt two sons, Magnus and Macedon, rejoicing in horses, who dwell round about Peria and Olympus. Lacuna, and Magnus again. Bago, Dictus and godlike Polydectes. Fragment hash 4, Plutarch, more. P747, Skull. On Pinder Pyth. 4263, and from Helen the war-loving king sprang Dorus and Xuthus and Aeolus delighting in horses and the sons of Aeolus, kings dealing justice, were Cretheus, and Athamas, and clever Sisyphus, and wicked Salmoneus and overbold Pyrias. Fragment Hush 5, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 4266, those who were descended from Deucalion used to rule over Thessaly as Hecatias and Hesiod say. Fragment hash 6, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. I-482, Aloiiade. Hesiod said that they were sons of Aloeus, called so after him, and of Iphimede but in reality sons of Poseidon and Iphimede, and that Alice a city of Italia was founded by their father. Fragment hash 7, Berlin Papyri, number 7497, Oxyinchus Papyri, 421-1704, LL1-24, Eurynome the daughter of Nisus. Pandion's son, to whom Pallas Athene taught all her art, both wit and wisdom too, for she was as wise as the gods. A marvellous scent rose from her silvern eye as she moved, and beauty was wafted from her eyes. 
her, then, Glaucus sought to win by Athena's advising, and he drove oxen 1705 for her. But he knew not at all the intent of Zeus who holds the Aegis. So Glaucus came seeking her to wife with gifts, but cloud-driving Zeus, king of the deathless gods, bent his head in oath that the son of Sisyphus should never have children born of one father 1706. So she lay in the arms of Poseidon and bare in the house of Glaucus blameless Belrophon, surpassing all men in over the boundless sea. And when he began to roam, his father gave him Pegasus who would bear him most swiftly on his wings, and flew unwearying everywhere over the earth, for like the gales he would course along. With him Belrophon caught and slew the fire-breathing Chimera. And he wedded the dear child of the great-hearted Iobates, the worshipful king. Lord, of. And she bare, fragment hash eight, scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodes, arg. 457, Hesiod says that Endymion was the son of Aethelius the son of Zeus and Calii, and received the gift from Zeus, to be, keeper of death for his own self when he was ready to die. Fragment hash nine, scoli asked ven on Homer, ill. 11750, the two sons of Acta and Molion. Hesiod has given their descent by calling them after Acta and Molion, but their father was Poseidon. Porphyrius 1707, Quarist. Whom? Adelaide. Pert, 265. But Aristarchus is informed that they were twins, not such as were the Dioscuri, but, on Hesiod's testimony, double in form and with two bodies and joined to one another. Fragment hash 10, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. I-156. But Hesiod says that he changed himself in one of his wonted shapes and perched on the yoke boss of Heracles' horses, meaning to fight with the hero, but that Heracles, secretly instructed by Athena, wounded him mortally with an arrow. And he says as follows, and lordly Periclymenus. Happy he! For earth-shaking Poseidon gave him all manner of gifts. At one time he would appear among birds, an eagle, and again at another he would be an ant, a marvel to see, and then a shining swarm of bees, and again at another time a dread relentless snake. And he possessed all manner of gifts which cannot be told and these then ensnared him through the devising of Athene. Fragment hash 11, Stephanus of Byzantium 1708, S.V., Heracles, slew the noble sons of steadfast Nelus, eleven of them, but the twelfth, the horseman Gerenian Nestor chanced to be staying with the horse-taming Gerenians. Lacuna Nestor alone escaped in flowery Gerenon. Fragment hash 12, Eustathius 1709, whom? 1796.39, so well girded Polycast, the youngest daughter of Nestor, Nilu's son was joined in love with Telemachus through golden Aphrodite and bear Perspolis. Fragment hash 13, Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. 1269, Teo the daughter of Salmoneus, having two sons by Poseidon, 
Nilus and Pelias, married Crethus, and had by him three sons, Aeson, Thiers and Amithon. And of Aeson and Polymed, according to Hesiod, Aeson was born, Aeson, who bego a son Aeson, shepherd of the people, whom Chiron brought up in Woody Pelion. Fragment hash 14, Petri Papyri, E.D. Mahaffey, P.L. 3. 3. Of the glorious Lord, fair Atalanta, swift of foot, the daughter of Scoenus, who had the beaming eyes of the graces, though she was ripe for wedlock rejected the company of her equals and sought to avoid marriage with men who eat bread. Scoli asked on Homer, Iliad 23. 683, Hesiod is therefore later in date than Homer since he represents Hippomenes as stripped when contending with Atalanta 1710. Papyri Grisae Latini, 2. Number 130, 2nd to 3rd century. 1711, LL 1 to 7, then straightway there rose up against him the trim ankled maiden, Atalanta, peerless in beauty, a great throng stood round about her as she gazed fiercely, and wonder held all men as they looked upon her. As she moved, the breath of the west wind stirred the shining garment about her tender bosom, but Hippomenes stood where he was, and much people was gathered together. All these kept silence, but Scoenus cried and said, LL 8 to 20, Hear me all, both young and old, while I speak as my spirit within my breast bids me. Hippomenes seeks my coy eyed daughter to wife, but let him now hear my wholesome speech. He shall not win her without contest, yet, if he be victorious and escape death, and if the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus grant him to win renown, verily he shall return to his dear native land, and I will give him my dear child and strong, swift-footed horses besides which he shall lead home to be cherished possessions and may he rejoice in heart possessing these, and ever remember with gladness the painful contest. May the Father of men and of gods, grant that splendid children may be born to him. 1712, Lacuna, LL 21-27, on the right. And he, rushing upon her, drawing back slightly towards the left. And on them was laid an unenviable struggle, for she, even fair, swift-footed Atalanta, ran scorning the gifts of golden Aphrodite, but with him the race was for his life, either to find his doom, or to escape it. Therefore with thoughts of guile he said to her, LL 28-29, O daughter of Scoenus, pitiless in heart, receive these glorious gifts of the goddess, golden Aphrodite, Lacuna, LL 30-36, but he, following lightly on his feet, cast the first apple 1713, and, swiftly as a harpy, she turned back and snatched it. Then he cast the second to the ground with his hand. And now fair, swift-footed Atalanta had two apples and was near the goal, but Hippomenes cast the third apple to the ground, and therewith escaped death and black fate. And he stood panting and, fragment hush 15, Strabo 1714, IP 42, and the daughter of Arabus, whom worthy Hermaan begat with Thranaya, daughter of the Lord Bullus. Fragment hash 16, 
Eustathius, whom 461 to Argus which was waterless Danors made well watered. Fragment hash 17, Hikitius 1715 in Scoliast on Euripides, Aurists, 872, Egyptus himself did not go to Argus, but sent his sons, 50 in number, as Hesiod represented. Fragment hash 18, 1716 Strabo, 8. P 370, and Apollodorus says that Hesiod already knew that the whole people were called both Hellenes and Panhellens, as when he says of the daughters of Proetus that the Panhellens sought them in marriage. Apollodorus, 2. 2.1.4, Acrisius was king of Argus and Proetus of Tyrins. And Acrisius had by Eurydice the daughter of Lacedemon, Dani, and Proetus by Sthenebi Elisip and Iphino and Iphianasa. And these fell mad, as Hesiod states, because they would not receive the rites of Dionysius. Probus 1717 on Virgil, Eclogue 6. 48. These, the daughters of Proetus, because they had scorned the divinity of Juno, were overcome with madness, such that they believed they had been turned into cows, and left Argus their own country. Afterwards they were cured by Melampus the son of Amidon. Sudas, SV, 1718 Because of their hideous wantonness they lost their tender beauty. Eustathius, whom 1746.7, for he shed upon their heads a fearful itch, and leprosy covered all their flesh and their hair dropped from their heads, and their fair scalps were made bare. Fragment hash 19 o, 1719 Oxyine chus papyri 1358 fr1, third cent. AD 1720, LL 1 to 32, so she, Europa crossed the briny water from afar to Crete, beguiled by the wiles of Zeus. Secretly did the father snatch her away and gave her a gift, the golden necklace, the toy which Hephaestus the famed craftsman once made by his cunning skill and brought and gave it to his father for a possession. And Zeus received the gift and gave it in turn to the daughter of proud Phoenix. But when the father of men and of gods had mated so far off with trim ankled Europa, then he departed back again from the rich-haired girl. So she bare sons to the almighty son of Kronos, glorious leaders of wealthy men, Minos the ruler and just Radamanthus and noble Sarpedon the blameless and strong. To these did wise Zeus give each a share of his honour. Verily Sarpedon reigned mightily over wide Lycia and ruled very many cities filled with people, wielding the scepter of Zeus, and great honour followed him, which his father gave him, the great-hearted shepherd of the people. For wise Zeus ordained that he should live for three generations of mortal men and not waste away with old age. He sent him to Troy, and Sarpedon gathered a great host, men chosen out of Lycia to be allies to the Trojans. These men did Sarpedon lead, skilled in bitter war. And Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, sent him forth from heaven a star, showing tokens for the return of his dear son, for well he, Sarpedon, 
knew in his heart that the sign was indeed from Zeus. Very greatly did he excel in war together with man slaying Hector and break down the wall, bringing woes upon the Danaans. But so soon as Patroclus had inspired the Argives with hard courage, fragment 19, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 12292 Zeus saw Europa the daughter of Phoenix gathering flowers in a meadow with some nymphs and fell in love with her. So he came down and changed himself into a bull and breathed from his mouth a crocus 1721. In this way he deceived Europa, carried her off and crossed the sea to Crete where he had intercourse with her. Then in this condition he made her live with Asterion the king of the Cretans. There she conceived and bore three sons, Minos, Sarpedon and Radamanthus. The tale is in Hesiod and Bacchylides. Fragment hash 20, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 2-178 but according to Hesiod, Phinus, was the son of Phoenix, Agenor's son and Cassiopeia. Fragment hash 21, Apollodorus 1722, 3. 14.4.1, but Hesiod says that he, Adonis, was the son of Phoenix and Alpha Sibia. Fragment hash 22, Porphyrius, Quarist. Whom? Adelaide. Pert. P. 189, as it is said in Hesiod in the Catalogue of Women concerning Demodos, the daughter of Agenor, Demodos, whom very many of men on earth, mighty princes, wooed, promising splendid gifts because of her exceeding beauty. Fragment hash 23, Apollodorus, 3. 5.6.2, Hesiod says that, the children of Amphion and Niobe, were ten sons and ten daughters. Ilion 1723, Va. Hist. 1236. But Hesiod says they were nine boys and ten girls, unless after all the verses are not Hesiod but are falsely ascribed to him as are many others. Fragment hash 24, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 23679, and Hesiod says that when Oedipus had died at Thebes. Arja the daughter of Adrastus came with others to the funeral of Oedipus. Fragment hash 25, Herodian 1724 in Etymologicum Magnum, p. 60, 40, Titios the son of Illyria. Fragment hash 26, 1725 argument, Pindar, Ol. 14. Cephisus is a river in Orchomenus where also the graces are worshipped. Eteocles the son of the river Cephisus first sacrificed to them, as Hesiod says. Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 2522, which from Lilia spouts forth its sweet flowing water. Strabo, 9. 424, and which flows on by Panopus and through fenced Glycan and through Orchomenus, winding like a snake. Fragment hash 27, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 79, for the father of Menestheus, Ariathus was a Butean living at Arne, and this is in Gitea, as also Hesiod says. Fragment hash 28, Stephanus of Byzantium, 
on Chistus, a grove 1726. It is situate in the country of Haliotus and was founded by Onchistus the Butean, as Hesiod says. Fragment hash 29, Stephanus of Byzantium, there is also a plain of Ega bordering on Syra, according to Hesiod. Fragment hash 30, Apollodorus, 2. 1.1.5 but Hesiod says that Pelasgus was Autarchthonus. Fragment hash 31, Strabo, VP 221, that this tribe, the Pelasgi, were from Arcadia, Ephrus states on the authority of Hesiod, for he says, sons were born to God like Lycon whom Pelasgus once begot. Fragment hash 32, Stephanus of Byzantium, Palantium. A city of Arcadia, so named after Pallas, one of Lycon's sons, according to Hesiod. Fragment hash 33, unknown famous Melibia bear Phellus the good spearman. Fragment hash 34, Herodian, on peculiar diction, p18 in Hesiod in the second catalogue, who once hid the torch 1727 within. Fragment hash 35, Herodian, on peculiar diction, p42, Hesiod in the third catalogue writes, and a resounding thud of feet rose up. Fragment hash 36, Apollonius Discolus 1728, on the pronoun, p 125, and a great trouble to themselves. Fragment hash 37, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. I 45, neither Homer nor Hesiod speak of Ipiclus as amongst the Argonauts. Fragment hash 38, Eratosthenes 1729, Catast 19 p 124, the ram dot. This it was that transported Fricus and Hell. It was immortal and was given them by their mother Nephael, and had a golden fleece, as Hesiod and Phaeacids say. Fragment hash 39, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. 2 181, Hesiod in the great Eoiae says that Phineus was blinded because he revealed to Fricus the road, but in the third catalogue, because he preferred long life to sight. Hesiod says he had two sons, Thinus and Mariandinus. Ephrus 1730 in Strabo, 7. 302, Hesiod, in the so-called journey round the earth, says that Phineus was brought by the harpies to the land of milk feeders 1731 who have wagons for houses. Fragment hash 40 CP Father 43 and 44, Oxyinchus Papyri 1358 FR2, 3rd cent. AD 1732, Lacuna, slight remains of seven lines, LL8 to 35, the sons of Boreas pursued the harpies to the lands of the Massagite and of the proud half-dog men, of the underground folk and of the feeble pygmies, and to the tribes of the boundless black skins and the Libyans. A huge earth bear these to Epaphus, soothsaying people, knowing seer craft by the will of Zeus the lord of oracles, but deceivers to the end that men whose thought passes their utterance 1733 might be subject to the gods and suffer harm, 
Ethiopians and Libyans and mare-milking Scythians. For verily Epaphus was the child of the almighty son of Kronos, and from him sprang the dark Libyans, and high-souled Ethiopians, and the underground folk and feeble pygmies. All these are the offspring of the Lord, the loud thunderer. Round about all these, the sons of Boreas, sped in darting flight, of the well-horsed Hyperboreans, who mirth the all-nourishing bear far off by the tumbling streams of deep-flowing Eridanus, of Amber, feeding her wide-scattered offspring, and about the steep fawn mountain and rugged Etna to the Isle Ortigia and the people sprung from Lestrigan who was the son of wide-reigning Poseidon. Twice ranged the sons of Boreas along this coast and wheeled round and about yearning to catch the harpies, while they strove to escape and avoid them. And they sped to the tribe of the haughty Cephalenians, the people of patient-souled Odysseus whom in after-time Calypso the queenly nymph detained for Poseidon. Then they came to the land of the Lord the son of Oz they heard. Yet still, the sons of Boreas, ever pursued them with instant feet. So they, the harpies, sped over the sea and through the fruitless air, fragment hash 40, Strabo, 7. P300, the Ethiopians and Ligurians and mare-milking Scythians. Fragment hash 41. Apollodorus, I 9.21.6, as they were being pursued, one of the harpies fell into the river Tigris, in Peloponnesus which is now called Harpis after her. Some call this one Nicot, and others Ilopus. The other who was called Osipete, or as some say Osidu, though Hesiod calls her Osipus fled down the Propontis and reached as far as to the Echinades Islands which are now called because of her, Strophades, Turning Islands. Fragment hash 42, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 2.297, Hesiod also says that those with Zetis 1734 turned and prayed to Zeus, there they prayed to the Lord of Inos who reigns on high. Apollonius indeed says it was Iris who made Zetis and his following turn away, but Hesiod says Hermes. Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 296, others say, the islands, were called Strophades, because they turned there and prayed Zeus to seize the harpies. But according to Hesiod, they were not killed. Fragment hash 43, Philodemus 1735, on piety, 10 nor let anyone mock at Hesiod who mentions, or even the troglodytes and the pygmies. Fragment hash 44, Strabo, IP 43, no one would accuse Hesiod of ignorance though he speaks of the half-dog people and the great-headed people and the pygmies. Fragment hash 45, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 4284, but Hesiod says they, the Argonauts, had sailed in through the Phasis. Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 4259, but Hesiod, says. They came through the ocean to Libya, and so, carrying the Argo, reached our sea. Fragment hash 46, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 3311, Apollonius, following Hesiod, 
says that Circe came to the island over against Tyrrhenia on the chariot of the sun. And he called it Hesperian, because it lies toward the west. Fragment hash 47, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. For 892, he, Apollonius, followed Hesiod who thus names the island of the Sirens, to the island and the Mosa, flowery, which the son of Kronos gave them. And their names are Thelxiope or Thelxino, Molp and Aglaufinus 1736. Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. 12168, hence Hesiod said that they charmed even the winds. Fragment hash 48, Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. I-85, Hesiod says that Ogygia is within towards the west, but Ogygia lies over against Crete, the Ogygian Sea and, the island Ogygia. Fragment hash 49, Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. 754, Hesiod regarded Art as the sister of Alcinus. Fragment hash 50, Scoli asked on Pindar, Ol. X46, her Hippostratus, did wed, a scion of Oz, the splendid son of Fietes, of the line of Amarinches. Leader of the Epians. Fragment hash 51, Apollodorus, I 8.4.1. When old Hea was dead, Enus married Perabea, the daughter of Hipponus. Hesiod says that she was seduced by Hippostratus, the son of Amarinches, and that her father Hipponus sent her from Olenus in a chai to Enus because he was far away from Hellas bidding him kill her. She used to dwell on the cliff of Olenus by the banks of Wideperus. Fragment hash 52, Diodorus 1737 v 81, Macarius was a son of Crinacus the son of Zeus as Hesiod says, and dwelt in Olenus in the country then called Ionian, but now a chain. Fragment hash 53, Scoli asked on Pindar, Nem. 221, concerning the Myrmidons Hesiod speaks thus, and she conceived and bare Iacus, delighting in horses. Now when he came to the full measure of desired youth, he chafed at being alone. And the father of men and gods made all the ants that were in the lovely isle into men and wide girdled women. These were the first who fitted with thwarts ships with curved sides, and the first who used sails, the wings of a seagoing ship. Fragment hash 54, Polybius, v2, the sons of Iacus who rejoiced in battle as though a feast. Fragment hash 55, Porphyrius, Quarist. Whom? Adelaide. Pertin. P93, he has indicated the shameful deed briefly by the phrase to lie with her against her will, and not like Hesiod who recounts at length the story of Peleus and the wife of Acastus. Fragment hash 56, Scoli asked on Pindar, Nem. 495, and this seemed to him, Acastus, in his mind the best plan, to keep back himself, but to hide beyond guessing the beautiful knife which the very famous lame one had made for him, that in seeking it alone over steep Pelion, he, Peleus, might be slain forthwith by the mountain-bred centaurs. Fragment hash 57, Vol. Herculan. Papyri from Herculaneum, 2nd Collection, 8. 
105, the author of the Cypria 1738 says that Thetis avoided wedlock with Zeus to please Hera, but that Zeus was angry and swore that she should mate with a mortal. Hesiod also has the like account. Fragment hash 58, Strasbourg Greek Papyri 55, 2nd century AD, LL 1 to 13, Pelus the son of Iacus, dear to the deathless gods, came to Phthia the mother of flocks, bringing great possessions from spacious Iolcus. And all the people envied him in their hearts seeing how he had sacked the well-built city, and accomplished his joyous marriage, and they all spake this word, thrice, yet, four times blessed son of Iacus, happy Pelus. For far-seeing Olympian Zeus has given you a wife with many gifts and the blessed gods have brought your marriage fully to pass and in these halls you go up to the holy bed of a daughter of Nereus. Truly the father, the son of Cronos, made you very preeminent among heroes and honoured above other men who eat bread and consume the fruit of the ground. Fragment Hush 59, 1739 Origen, Against Celsus, 4. 79, for in common then were the banquets, and in common the seats of deathless gods and mortal men. Fragment hash 60, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 16175, whereas Hesiod and the rest call her, Pelu's daughter, Polydora. Fragment hash 61, Eustathius. Whom? 112 44 square. It should be observed that the ancient narrative hands down the account that Patroclus was even a kinsman of Achilles, for Hesiod says that Menoetheus, the father of Patroclus, was a brother of Peleus, so that in that case they were first cousins. Fragment 62. Scoli asked on Pindar, Ol. X83, some write Cyrus the son of Halerathius, whom Hesiod mentions, he, Bago, Cyrus and Elizigus, goodly sons. And Cyrus was the son of Halerathius Pereus son, and of Alcin. Fragment hash 63. Pausanias 1740, 2. 26 7. This oracle most clearly proves that Asclepius was not the son of Arsino, but that Hesiod or one of Hesiod's interpolators composed the verses to please the Messenians. Scoli asked on Pindar, Pyth. 314. Some say, Asclepius, was the son of Arsino, others of Coronis. But Asclepiades says that Arsino was the daughter of Leucippus, Pyrrhus' son, and that to her and Apollo Asclepius and a daughter, Ariapis, were born, and she bare in the palace Asclepius, leader of men, and Ariapis with the lovely hair, being subject in love to Phbus and of Arsino likewise, and Arsino was joined with the son of Zeus and Leto and bare a son Asclepius, blameless and strong. 1741 Fragment Hash 64 For how does he say that the same persons, the Cyclopes, were like the gods? and yet represent them as being destroyed by Apollo in the catalogue of the daughters of Leucippus. Fragment hash 65, Echemus made Timundra his buxom wife. Fragment hash 66, Hesiod in giving their descent makes them, Castor and Polydeuces, both sons of Zeus. Hesiod, however, 
makes Helen the child neither of Leda nor Nemesis, but daughter of Ocean and Zeus. Fragment hash 67, Scoli asked on Euripides, Aorists 249, Stiscorus says that while sacrificing to the gods Tyndareus forgot Aphrodite and that the goddess was angry and made his daughters twice and thrice wed and deserters of their husbands. And Hesiod also says, LL 1-7, and laughter loving Aphrodite felt jealous when she looked on them and cast them into evil report. Then Timundra deserted Echemus and went and came to Philus, dear to the deathless gods, and even so Clytemnistra deserted godlike Agamemnon and lay with Aegisthus and chose a worse mate, and even so Helen dishonored the couch of golden-haired menlaws. Fragment hash 68, 1742 Berlin Papyri Number 9739, LL 1 to 10, Philoctetes sought her, a leader of spearmen. Most famous of all men at shooting from afar and with the sharp spear. And he came to Tyndareus' bright city for the sake of the Argive maid who had the beauty of golden Aphrodite, and the sparkling eyes of the Graces and the dark-faced daughter of Ocean, very lovely of form, bare her when she had shared the embraces of Zeus and the King Tyndareus in the bright palace, and sought her to wife offering as gifts, Lacuna, LL 11-15, and as many women skilled in blameless arts, each holding a golden bowl in her hands. And truly Castor and strong Polyduces would have made him 1743 their brother perforce, but Agamemnon, being son-in-law to Tyndareus, wooed her for his brother Menlaws. LL 16-19, and the two sons of Amphiroas the Lord, Icleus son, sought her to wife from Argus very near at hand, yet. Fear of the blessed gods and the indignation of men caused them also to fail. Lacuna, L20, but there was no deceitful dealing in the sons of Tyndareus. LL21-27, and from Ithaca the sacred might of Odysseus, Laird's son, who knew many fashioned whiles, sought her to wife. He never sent gifts for the sake of the neat ankled maid, for he knew in his heart that golden haired men laws would win, since he was greatest of the Achaeans in possessions and was ever sending messages 1744 to horse taming Castor and prize winning Polyduces. LL 28 30, and on son sought her to wife, and brought, bridal gifts, cauldrons. Lacuna, LL 31-33, to horse taming Castor and prize winning Polyduces, desiring to be the husband of rich haired Helen, though he had never seen her beauty, but because he heard the report of others. LL 34-41, and from Phyllis two men of exceeding worth sought her to wife, Podas's son of Iphiclus, Philicus' son, and Actor's noble son, overbearing Protselaus. Both of them kept sending messages to Lacedaemon, to the house of wise Tyndareus, Ebalus' son, and they offered many bridal gifts. For great was the girl's renown, brazen, golden. Lacuna, L42, desiring to be the husband of rich haired Helen. LL43 to 49, from Athens, the son of Peteus, Menestheus, sought her to wife, and offered many bridal gifts, 
for he possessed very many stored treasures, gold and cauldrons and tripods, fine things which lay hid in the house of the Lord Peteus, and with them his heart urged him to win his bride by giving more gifts than any other, for he thought that no one of all the heroes would surpass him in possessions and gifts. LL 50-51 there came also by ship from Crete to the house of the son of Ebalus strong Lycomedes for rich-haired Helen Sarke. Berlin Papyri, number 10560, LL 52-54, sought her to wife. And after golden-haired men laws he offered the greatest gifts of all the suitors and very much he desired in his heart to be the husband of our give Helen with the rich hair. LL 55-62, and from Salamis Uras, blameless warrior, sought her to wife, and offered fitting gifts, even wonderful deeds, for he said that he would drive together and give the shambling oxen and strong sheep of all those who lived in Trozen and Epidaurus near the sea, and in the island of Aegina and in Marses, sons of the Achaeans, and shadowy Megara and frowning Corinthus, and Hermione and Assine which lie along the sea, for he was famous with the long spear. LL 63-66, but from Eubia Elephina, leader of men, the son of Chalcodon, prince of the bold Abants, sought her to wife. And he offered very many gifts, and greatly he desired in his heart to be the husband of rich-haired Helen. LL 67-74, and from Crete the mighty Idomenus sought her to wife, Deucalion's son, offspring of renowned Minos. He sent no one to woo her in his place, but came himself in his black ship of many thwarts over the Ogygian Sea across the dark wave to the home of wise Tyndareus, to see our give Helen and that no one else should bring back for him the girl whose renown spread all over the holy earth. L75, and at the prompting of Zeus the all-wise came. Lacuna, 13 lines lost. LL89-100, to but of all who came for the maid Sarke, the Lord Tyndareus sent none away nor yet received the gift of any, but asked of all the suitors sure oaths, and bade them swear and vow with unmixed libations that no one else henceforth should do aught apart from him as touching the marriage of the maid with shapely arms, but if any man should cast off fear and reverence and take her by force, he bade all the others together follow after and make him pay the penalty. And they, each of them hoping to accomplish his marriage, obeyed him without wavering. But warlike Menlaws, the son of Atreus, prevailed against them altogether, because he gave the greatest gifts. LL 100-106 But Chiron was tending the son of Peleus, swift-footed Achilles preeminent among men, on Woody Pelion, for he was still a boy. For neither warlike men laws nor any other of men on earth would have prevailed in suit for Helen, if fleet Achilles had found her unwed. But, as it was, warlike men laws won her before. 2 1745, LL 1-2 and she, Helen, bare-neat ankled Hermione in the palace, a child unlooked for. LL 2-13, now all the gods were divided through strife, for at that very time Zeus who thunders on high was meditating marvellous deeds, even to mingle storm and tempest over the boundless earth, 
and already he was hastening to make an utter end of the race of mortal men, declaring that he would destroy the lives of the demigods, that the children of the gods should not mate with wretched mortals, seeing their fate with their own eyes, but that the blessed gods henceforth even as aforetime should have their living and their habitations apart from men. But on those who were born of immortals and of mankind verily Zeus laid toil and sorrow upon sorrow. Lacuna, two lines missing. LL 16-30, nor any one of men, should go upon black ships, to be strongest in the might of his hands of mortal men declaring to all those things that were, and those that are, and those that shall be, he brings to pass and glorifies the counsels of his father Zeus who drives the clouds. For no one, either of the blessed gods or of mortal men, knew surely that he would contrive through the sword to send to Hads full many a one of heroes fallen in strife. But at that time he knew not as yet the intent of his father's mind, and how men delight in protecting their children from doom. And he delighted in the desire of his mighty father's heart who rules powerfully over men. LL 31-43 From stately trees the fair leaves fell in abundance fluttering down to the ground and the fruit fell to the ground because Boreas blew very fiercely at the behest of Zeus, the deep seethed and all things trembled at his blast, the strength of mankind consumed away and the fruit failed in the season of spring, at that time when the hairless one 1746 in a secret place in the mountains gets three young every three years. In spring he dwells upon the mountain among tangled thickets and brushwood, keeping afar from and hating the path of men, in the glens and wooded glades. But when winter comes on, he lies in a close cave beneath the earth and covers himself with piles of luxuriant leaves, a dread serpent whose back is speckled with awful spots. LL 44-50, but when he becomes violent and fierce unspeakably, the arrows of Zeus lay him low. Only his soul is left on the holy earth, and that fits gibbering about a small unformed den. And it comes enfeebled to sacrifices beneath the broad path earth. And it lies, lacuna traces of 37 following lines. Fragment hash 69, sitzes 1747, exeg. Iliad. 68-19-H, Agamemnon and men laws likewise according to Hesiod and Ischylus are regarded as the sons of Pleisthenes, Atreus' son. And according to Hesiod, Pleisthenes was a son of Atreus and Arup, and Agamemnon, Menlaus and Anaxabia were the children of Pleisthenes and Cleola the daughter of Dias. Fragment hash 70, Laurentian Scoli asked on Sophocles Electra, 539, and she, Helen, bare to Menlaus, famous with the spear. Hermione and her youngest born, Nicostratus, a scion of Oz. Fragment hash 71, Pausanias, I 43. 1. I know that Hesiod in the catalogue of women represented that Iphigenia was not killed but, by the will of Artemis, became Hecate 1748. Fragment hash 72, used Atheus, whom? 1344. Square, Butes, it is said, was a son of Poseidon, so Hesiod in the catalogue. 
Fragment hash 73, Pausanias, 2. 65. Hesiod represented Sicyon as the son of Erechtheus. Fragment hash 74, Plato, Minos, p. 320. d. Minos, who was most kingly of mortal kings and reigned over very many people dwelling round about, holding the scepter of Zeus where herewith he ruled many. Fragment hash 75, Hesychius 1749, the athletic contest in memory of Eurages Melisagrus says that Androgios the son of Minos was called Eurages, and that a contest in his honour is held near his tomb at Athens in the Keramicus. And Hesiod writes, and Eurages 1750, while yet a lad in holy Athens, fragment hash 76, Plutarch, Theseus 20, there are many tales about Ariadne, how that she was deserted by Theseus for love of another woman, for strong love for Eagle the daughter of Panopus overpowered him. For Herias of Megara says that Pisistratus removed this verse from the works of Hesiod. Athena Ouse 1751, 13. 557 oh, but Hesiod says that Theseus wedded both Hip and Eagle lawfully. Fragment hash 77, Strabo, 9. P. 393. The snake of Cycreus, Hesiod says that it was brought up by Cycreus, and was driven out by Eurylochus as defiling the island, but that Demeter received it into Eleusi, and that it became her attendant. Fragment hash 78. Argument I to the shield of Heracles. But Apollonius of Rhodes says that it. The shield of Heracles, is Hesiod's both from the general character of the work and from the fact that in the catalogue we again find Io laws as charioteer of Heracles. Fragment hash 79, Scoli asked on Soph. Trick, 266, LL1-6. And fair girdled Stratonica conceived and bare in the palace Eurytus her well loved son. Of him sprang sons, Didaeon and Clytius and godlike Tocus and Iphitus, a scion of Oz. And after these Antiope the queen, daughter of the aged son of Norbois, bare her youngest child, golden haired Iolea. Fragment hash 80, Herodian in Etymologicum Magnum, who bear Autolycus and Philemon, famous in speech. All things that he, Autolius, took in his hands, he made to disappear. Fragment hash 81, Apollonius, whom Lexicon, Epitus again, Bogotal Senor and Perithus. Fragment hash 82, Strabo, 7. p. 322, for Lacris truly was leader of the Lelegian people, whom Zeus the son of Cronos, whose wisdom is unfailing, gave to Deucalion, stones gathered out of the earth. So out of stones mortal men were made, and they were called people. 1752 Fragment Hash 83, Sipsis, Skoll. In Exeg. Iliad. 126, Ilus whom the Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, loved. And he named him by his name, because he found a nymph complacent 1753 and was joined with her in sweet love, on that day when Poseidon and Apollo raised high the wall of the well-built city. 
Fragment hash 84, Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. 11326, Clement the daughter of Menias the son of Poseidon and of Uranusa, Hyperphaz daughter, was wedded to Philicus the son of Dion, and Beripiclus, a boy fleet of foot. It is said of him that through his power of running he could race the winds and could move along upon the ears of corn 1754. The tale is in Hesiod, he would run over the fruit of the asphodel and not break it, nay, he would run with his feet upon wheaten ears and not hurt the fruit. Fragment hash 85 Coeroboscus 1755, I 123, 22H, and she bear a son Thais. Fragment hash 86, Eustathius, whom? 1623 44, Maro 1756, whose father? It is said, Hesiod relates to have been Euanthus the son of Enopeon, the son of Dionysius. Fragment hash 87, Athena Ouse, x 428b, c, such gifts as Dionysius gave to men, a joy and a sorrow both. Whoever drinks to fullness, in him wine becomes violent and binds together his hands and feet, his tongue also and his wits with fetters unspeakable, and soft sleep embraces him. Fragment hash 88, Strabo, 9. P442, or like her, Coronis, who lived by the holy twin hills in the plain of Doshmova against Amuse rich in grapes, and washed her feet in the Bubon Lake, a maid unwed. Fragment hash 89, Scoli asked on Pinder, P.Y.T.H. 348, to him, then, there came a messenger from the sacred feast to goodly Pytho. A crow 1757, and he told unshorn Phus of secret deeds, that Ischis son of Elatus had wedded Coronis the daughter of Phlegias of birth divine. Fragment hash 90, Athena Grass 1758, Petition for the Christians, 29. Concerning Asclepius Hesiod says, And the father of men and gods was wroth, and from Olympus he smote the son of Leto with a lurid thunderbolt and killed him, arousing the anger of Phbus. Fragment hash 91, Philodemus, on piety, 34. But Hesiod, says that Apollo, would have been cast by Zeus into Tartarus 1759, but Leto interceded for him, and he became bondman to a mortal. Fragment hash 92, Scoli asked on Pinder, P.Y.T.H. 96, or like her, beautiful Siren who dwelt in Phthia by the water of Penus and had the beauty of the graces. Fragment hash 93, Servius on Virgil, Jorg. I-14, he invoked Aristoelus, that is, the son of Apollo and Siren, whom Hesiod calls the shepherd Apollo. 1760 Fragment Hash 94, Scoli asked on Virgil, Jorg. 4 361, but the water stood all round him, bowed into the semblance of a mountain. This verse he has taken over from Hesiod's Catalogue of Women. Fragment Hash 95 Scoli asked on Homer, Iliad 2. 469, or like her, Antiope, 
whom Gitiung Hyria nurtured as a maid. Fragment hash 96, Pali Fatus 1761, c. 42, of Zethus and Amphion. Hesiod and some others relate that they built the walls of the bees by playing on the lyre. Fragment hash 97, Scoli asked on Soth. Trick, 1167, LL1-11, There is a land Elopia with much glebe and rich meadows, and rich in flocks and shambling kine. There dwell men who have many sheep and many oxen, and they are in number past telling, tribes of mortal men. And there upon its border is built a city, Dodona 1762, and Zeus loved it and, appointed, it to be his oracle, reverenced by men, and they, the doves, lived in the hollow of an oak. From the men of earth carry away all kinds of prophecy, whosoever fares to that spot and questions the deathless god, and comes bringing gifts with good omens. Fragment hash 98, Berlin Papyri, number 9777, 1763, LL1-22, Strife of mortals who would have dared to fight him with the spear and charge against him, save only Heracles, the great-hearted offspring of Alsus. Such an one was, strong Meliga loved of us, the golden-haired, dear son of Enus and Altia. From his fierce eyes there shone forth portentous fire and once in High Caledon he slew the destroying beast, the fierce wild boar with gleaming tusks. In war and in dread strife no man of the heroes dared to face him and to approach and fight with him when he appeared in the forefront. But he was slain by the hands and arrows of Apollo 1764 while he was fighting with the curities for pleasant Caledon. And these others, Altia, bear to Enus, Portelan's son, horse-taming fears, and age laws surpassing all others, Tocus and Clemenus and godlike Periphas, and rich-haired Gorga and wise Dianaera who was subject in love to mighty Heracles and bare him Hylas and Glenus and Ctesippus and Odits. These she bare and in ignorance she did a fearful thing, when, she had received. The poisoned robe that held black doom, fragment hash 99 Scoli asked on Homer, Iliad. 23679, and yet Hesiod says that after he had died in Thebes, Argya the daughter of Adrastus together with others, CP Frag 99, came to the lamentation over Oedipus. Fragment hash 99, 1765 Papyri Grisii Latin Number 131, 2nd to 3rd century 1766, LL1 to 10, and, Erephil, bear in the palace Alkmaan 1767, shepherd of the people, to Amphiros. Him, Amphiros, did the Cadmean, Theban women with trailing robes admire when they saw face to face his eyes and well-grown frame, as he was busied about the burying of Oedipus, the man of many woes. Once the Danai, servants of Oz, followed him to Thebes, to win renown, for Polyuses. But, though well he knew from Zeus all things ordained, the earth yawned and swallowed him up with his horses and jointed chariot, 
far from deep heading Alpheus. LL 11 to 20, but Electiron married the all beauteous daughter of Pelops and, going up into one bed with her, the son of Perses begat, and Philonimus and Kalinus and Amphimachus and, and Eurybius and Famous. All these the Taphians, famous shipmen, slew in fight for oxen with shambling hoofs, in ships across the sea's wide back. So Alcmena alone was left to delight her parents, and the daughter of Electrian. Lacuna, L21, who was subject in love to the dark-clouded son of Cronos and Bear, famous Heracles, Dot. Fragment Hush 100, Argument to the Shield of Heracles, I. The beginning of the shield as far as the 56th verse is current in the 4th catalogue fragment Hush 101, Uncertain Position, Oxyine Chus Papyri 1359 FR1, Early 3rd Cent. A.D. Lacuna Slight remains of three lines, LL4 to 17, if indeed he, Teuthras, delayed, and if he feared to obey the word of the immortals who then appeared plainly to them. But her, Orge, he received and brought up well, and cherished in the palace, honoring her even as his own daughters. And Orge bare Telephus of the stock of Arias. King of the Mycenaeans, being joined in love with the mighty Heracles when he was journeying in quest of the horses of proud Laomedon, horses the fleetest of foot that the Asian land nourished, and destroyed in battle the tribe of the dauntless Amazons and drove them forth from all that land. But Telephus routed the spearmen of the bronze clad chains and made them embark upon their black ships. Yet when he had brought down many to the ground which nourishes men, his own might and deadliness were brought low. Fragment Hush 102 Uncertain Position Oxyine Chus Papyri 1359 FR2 Early 3rd Cent A.D. Lacuna, remains of four lines, LL5-16, to Electra. Was subject to the dark-clouded son of Cronos and Bear Dardanus. And Aetian. Who once greatly loved rich-haired Demeter. And cloud-gathering Zeus was wroth and smote him, Aetian, and laid him low with a flaming thunderbolt because he sought to lay hands upon rich-haired Demeter. But Dardanus came to the coast of the mainland, from him Erichthonius and thereafter Troes were sprung, and Ilus, and Aserachus, and godlike Ganymede, when he had left holy Samothrace in his many benched ship. Lacuna Oxyine Chus Papyri 1359 FR3, early 3rd cent. AD, LL 17 to 24, 1768, Cleopatra, the daughter of, but an eagle caught up Ganymede for Zeus because he vied with the immortals in beauty, rich tressed Diomed and she bare Hyacinthus, the blameless one and strong, whom, on a time Phbus himself slew unwittingly with a ruthless disc. The shield of Heracles, LL 1-27, or like her who left home and country and came to Thebes, following warlike Amphitryon, even Alcmena, the daughter of Electiron, gatherer of the people. She surpassed the tribe of womankind in beauty and in height, and in wisdom none vied with her of those whom mortal women bear of union with mortal men. Her face and her dark eyes wafted such charm as comes from golden Aphrodite. 
And she so honoured her husband in her heart as none of womankind did before her. Verily he had slain her noble father violently when he was angry about oxen, so he left his own country and came to Thebes and was suppliant to the shield-carrying men of Gdmas. There he dwelt with his modest wife without the joys of love, nor might he go in unto the neat-ankled daughter of Electiron until he had avenged the death of his wife's great-hearted brothers and utterly burned with blazing fire the villages of the heroes, the Taphians and Teleborns, for this thing was laid upon him, and the gods were witnesses to it. And he feared their anger and hastened to perform the great task to which Zeus had bound him. With him went the horse-driving Gitteons, breathing above their shields, and the Lacrians who fight hand to hand, and the gallant Phishans eager for war and battle. And the noble son of Alsus led them, rejoicing in his host. LL 27-55 but the father of men and gods was forming another scheme in his heart, to beget one to defend against destruction gods and men who eat bread. So he arose from Olympus by night pondering guile in the deep of his heart, and yearned for the love of the well-girded woman. Quickly he came to Typhaeanium and from there again wise Zeus went on and trod the highest peak of Physium 1801, there he sat and planned marvellous things in his heart. So in one night Zeus shared the bed and love of the neat-ankled daughter of Electiron and fulfilled his desire, and in the same night Amphitryon, gatherer of the people, the glorious hero, came to his house when he had ended his great task. He hastened not to go to his bondmen and shepherds afield, but first went in unto his wife, such desire took hold on the shepherd of the people. And as a man who has escaped joyfully from misery, whether of sore disease or cruel bondage, so then did Amphitryon, when he had wound up all his heavy task, come glad and welcome to his home. And all night long he lay with his modest wife, delighting in the gifts of golden Aphrodite. And she, being subject in love to a god and to a man exceeding goodly, brought forth twin sons in seven-gated Thib. Though they were brothers, these were not of one spirit, for one was weaker but the other a far better man, one terrible and strong, the mighty Heracles. Him she bare through the embrace of the son of Cronos lord of dark clouds and the other, Ipiclus, of Amphitryon the spear-wielder, offspring distinct, this one of union with a mortal man, but that other of union with Zeus leader of all the gods. LL 57-77, and he slew Cygnus, the gallant son of Oz. For he found him in the close of far-shooting Apollo, him and his father Oz, never sated with war. Their armor shone like a flame of blazing fire as they two stood in their car. Their swift horses struck the earth and poured it with their hoofs, and the dust rose like smoke about them, pounded by the chariot wheels and the horses' hoofs, while the well-made chariot and its rails rattled around them as the horses plunged. And blameless Cygnus was glad, for he looked to slay the warlike son of Zeus and his charioteer with the sword and to strip off their splendid armor. But Phus Apollo would not listen to his vaunts, for he himself had stirred up mighty Heracles against him. And all the grove and altar of Pagasian Apollo flamed because of the dread god and because of his arms, for his eyes flashed as with fire. 
What mortal men would have dared to meet him face to face save Heracles and glorious Iolaus? For great was their strength and unconquerable were the arms which grew from their shoulders on their strong limbs. Then Heracles spake to his charioteer strong Iolaus, LL 78-94, O hero Iolaus, best beloved of all men. Truly Amphitryon sinned deeply against the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus when he came to sweet-crowned Thub and left Tyrins, the well-built citadel, because he slew Electrion for the sake of his wide-browned oxen. Then he came to Creon and long-robed Eniocha, who received him kindly and gave him all fitting things, as is due to suppliants and honoured him in their hearts even more. And he lived joyfully with his wife the neat-ankled daughter of Electiron, and presently, while the years rolled on, we were born, unlike in body as in mind, even your father and I. From him Zeus took away sense, so that he left his home and his parents and went to do honour to the wicked Eurystheus, unhappy man. Deeply indeed did he grieve afterwards in bearing the burden of his own mad folly, but that cannot be taken back. But on me fate laid heavy tasks. LL 95-101 Yet, come, friend, quickly take the red-dyed reins of the swift horses and raise high courage in your heart and guide the swift chariot and strong fleet-footed horses straight on. Have no secret fear at the noise of manslaying ours who now rages shouting about the holy grove of Phpus Apollo, the lord who shoots form afar. Surely, strong though he be, he shall have enough of war. LL 102-114, and blameless Iolaus answered him again, Good friend, truly the father of men and gods greatly honours your head and the bull-like earth shaker also, who keeps the veil of walls and guards the city. So great and strong is this fellow they bring into your hands that you may win great glory. But come, put on your arms of war that with all speed we may bring the car of ours and our own together and fight, for he shall not frighten the dauntless son of Zeus, nor yet the son of Epiclus, rather. I think he will flee before the two sons of blameless Alcides who are near him and eager to raise the war cry for battle, for this they love better than a feast. LL 115-117, so he said. And mighty Heracles was glad in heart and smiled, for the other's words pleased him well. And he answered him with winged words, LL 118 to 121, O hero Iolaus, heaven sprung, now is rough battle hard at hand. But, as you have shown your skill at other times, so now also wheel the great black maned horse Orion about every way, and help me as you may be able. LL 122-138, so he said, and put upon his legs greaves of shining bronze, the splendid gift of Hephaestus. Next he fastened about his breast a fine golden breastplate, curiously wrought, which Pallas Athene the daughter of Zeus had given him when first he was about to set out upon his grievous labours. Over his shoulders the fierce warrior put the steel that saves men from doom, and across his breast he slung behind him a hollow quiver. Within it were many chilling arrows, dealers of death which makes speech forgotten, in front they had death and trickled with tears. Their shafts were smooth and very long, 
and their butts were covered with feathers of a brown eagle. And he took his strong spear, pointed with shining bronze, and on his valiant head set a well-made helm of adamant, cunningly wrought, which fitted closely on the temples, and that guarded the head of godlike Heracles. LL 139-153, in his hands he took his shield, all glittering, no one ever broke it with a blow or crushed it. And a wonder it was to see, for its whole orb was a shimmer with enamel and white ivory and electrum, and it glowed with shining gold, and there were zones of Cyanus 1802 drawn upon it. In the center was fear worked in adamant, unspeakable, staring backwards with eyes that glowed with fire. His mouth was full of teeth in a white row, fearful and daunting, and upon his grim brow hovered frightful strife who arrays the throng of men, pitiless she, for she took away the mind and senses of poor wretches who made war against the son of Zeus. Their souls passed beneath the earth and went down into the house of Hads, but their bones, when the skin is rotted about them, crumble away on the dark earth under parching Sirius. LL 154-160, upon the shield pursuit and flight were wrought, and tumult, and panic, and slaughter. Strife also and uproar were hurrying about, and deadly fate was there holding one man newly wounded, and another unwounded, and one, who was dead, she was dragging by the feet through the tumult. She had on her shoulders a garment red with the blood of men, and terribly she glared and gnashed her teeth. LL 160-167 and there were heads of snakes unspeakably frightful, twelve of them, and they used to frighten the tribes of men on earth whosoever made war against the son of Zeus, for they would clash their teeth when Amphitryon's son was fighting, and brightly shone these wonderful works. And it was as though there were spots upon the frightful snakes and their backs were dark blue and their jaws were black. LL 168-177 Also there were upon the shield droves of boars and lions who glared at each other, being furious and eager. The rows of them moved on together, and neither side trembled but both bristled up their manes. For already a great lion lay between them and two boars, one on either side, bereft of life, and their dark blood was dripping down upon the ground. They lay dead with necks outstretched beneath the grim lions. And both sides were roused still more to fight because they were angry, the fierce boars and the bright-eyed lions. LL 178 to 190, and there was the strife of the Lapith spearmen gathered round the prince Cenus and Dryas and Perithus, with Hoplus, Exadius, Phalus, and Prolochus, Mopsus the son of Ampice of Titasia, a scion of Oz, and Theseus, the son of Aegeus, like unto the deathless gods. These were of silver, and had armor of gold upon their bodies. And the centaurs were gathered against them on the other side with Petraeus and Asbolus the diviner, Artus, and Ureus, and black-haired Mamas, and the two sons of silver, and they had piner trees of gold in their hands, and they were rushing together as though they were alive and striking at one another hand to hand with spears and with pines. LL 191-196 And on the shield stood the fleet-footed horses of grim Mars made gold, 
and deadly as the spoil winner himself. He held a spear in his hands and was urging on the footman, he was red with blood as if he were slaying living men, and he stood in his chariot. Beside him stood fear and flight, eager to plunge amidst the fighting men. LL 197-200, there, too, was the daughter of Zeus, Tritogenera who drives the spoil 1803. She was like as if she would array a battle, with a spear in her hand, and a golden helmet, and the aegis about her shoulders. And she was going towards the awful strife. LL 201 to 206, and there was the holy company of the deathless gods, and in the midst the son of Zeus and Leto played sweetly on a golden lyre. There also was the abode of the gods, pure Olympus, and their assembly, and infinite riches were spread around in the gathering. The muses of Peria were beginning a song like clear voiced singers. LL 207 to 215, and on the shield was a harbor with a safe haven from the irresistible sea, made of refined tin wrought in a circle, and it seemed to heave with waves. In the middle of it were many dolphins rushing this way and that, fishing and they seemed to be swimming. Two dolphins of silver were spouting and devouring the mute fishes, and beneath them fishes of bronze were trembling. And on the shore sat a fisherman watching, in his hands he held a casting net for fish, and seemed as if about to cast it forth. LL 216 to 237, there, too, was the son of rich haired Danny, the horseman Perseus, his feet did not touch the shield and yet were not far from it, very marvellous to remark, since he was not supported anywhere, for so did the famous lame one fashion him of gold with his hands. On his feet he had winged sandals, and his black sheathed sword was slung across his shoulders by a cross belt of bronze. He was flying swift as thought. The head of a dreadful monster, the Gorgon, covered the broad of his back, and a bag of silver, a marvel to see, contained it, and from the bag bright tassels of gold hung down. Upon the head of the hero lay the dread cap 1804 of Hads which had the awful gloom of night. Perseus himself, the son of Danny, was at full stretch, like one who hurries and shudders with horror. And after him rushed the Gorgons, unapproachable and unspeakable, longing to seize him, as they trod upon the pale adamant. The shield rang sharp and clear with a loud clanging. Two serpents hung down at their girdles with heads curved forward, their tongues were flickering, and their teeth gnashing with fury, and their eyes glaring fiercely. And upon the awful heads of the gorgons great fear was quaking. LL 237-270 and beyond these there were men fighting in warlike harness, some defending their own town and parents from destruction, and others eager to sack it, many lay dead, but the greater number still strove and fought. The women on well-built towers of bronze were crying shrilly and tearing their cheeks like living beings, the work of famous Hephaestus. And the men who were elders and on whom age had laid hold were all together outside the gates, and were holding up their hands to the blessed gods, fearing for their own sons. But these again were engaged in battle, and behind them the dusky fates, gnashing their white fangs, lowering, grim, 
bloody, and unapproachable, struggled for those who were falling, for they all were longing to drink dark blood. So soon as they caught a man overthrown or falling newly wounded, one of them would clasp her great claws about him, and his soul would go down to Hads to Chile Tartarus. And when they had satisfied their souls with human blood, they would cast that one behind them, and rush back again into the tumult and the fray. Clotho and Lachesis were over them and Atropo less tall than they, a goddess of no great frame, yet superior to the others and the eldest of them. And they all made a fierce fight over one poor wretch, glaring evilly at one another with furious eyes and fighting equally with claws and hands. By them stood darkness of death, mournful and fearful, pale, shriveled, shrunk with hunger, swollen need. Long nails tipped her hands, and she dribbled at the nose, and from her cheeks blood dripped down to the ground. She stood leering hideously, and much dust sodden with tears lay upon her shoulders. LL 270-285 Next, there was a city of men with goodly towers, and seven gates of gold, fitted to the lintels, guarded it. The men were making merry with festivities and dances. Some were bringing home a bride to her husband on a well-wheeled car, while the bridal song swelled high, and the glow of blazing torches held by handmaidens rolled in waves afar. And these maidens went before, delighting in the festival, and after them came frolicsome choirs, the youth singing soft-mouthed to the sound of shrill pipes, while the echo was shivered around them and the girls led on the lovely dance to the sound of lyres. Then again on the other side was a rout of young men revelling, with flutes playing, some frolicking with dance and song, and others were going forward in time with a flute player and laughing. The whole town was filled with mirth and dance and festivity. LL 285 to 304, others again were mounted on horseback and galloping before the town. And there were ploughmen breaking up the good soil, clothed in tunics girt up. Also there was a wide cornland and some men were reaping with sharp hooks the stalks which bended with the weight of the cars, as if they were reaping Demeter's grain. Others were binding the sheaves with bands and were spreading the threshing floor. And some held reaping hooks and were gathering the vintage, while others were taking from the reapers into baskets white and black clusters from the long rows of vines which were heavy with leaves and tendrils of silver. Others again were gathering them into baskets. Beside them was a row of vines in gold, the splendid work of cunning Hephaestus, it had shivering leaves and stakes of silver and was laden with grapes which turned black 1805. And there were men treading out the grapes and others drawing off liquor. Also there were men boxing and wrestling and huntsmen chasing swift hares with a leash of sharp-toothed dogs before them, they eager to catch the hares, and the hares eager to escape. LL 305-313, next to them were horsemen hard set, and they contended and labored for a prize. The charioteers standing on their well-woven cars, Urged on their swift horses with loose rein, the jointed cars flew along clattering and the navs of the wheels shrieked loudly. So they were engaged in an unending toil, and the end with victory came never to them, and the contest was ever unwon. 
and there was set out for them within the course a great tripod of gold, the splendid work of cunning Hephaestus. LL 314-317, and round the rim ocean was flowing, with a full stream as it seemed, and enclosed all the cunning work of the shield. Over it swans were soaring and calling loudly, and many others were swimming upon the surface of the water, and near them were shoals of fish. LL 318-326, a wonderful thing the great strong shield was to see, even for Zeus the loud thunderer, by whose will Hephaestus made it and fitted it with his hands. This shield the valiant son of Zeus wielded masterly, and leaped upon his horse chariot like the lightning of his father Zeus who holds the Aegis, moving lithely. And his charioteer, strong Iolaus, standing upon the car, guided the curved chariot. LL 327-337 then the goddess grey-eyed Athene came near them and spoke winged words, encouraging them, Hail, offspring of far-famed Linsus! Even now Zeus who reigns over the blessed gods gives you power to slay Cycnus and to strip off his splendid armour. Yet I will tell you something besides, mightiest of the people. When you have robbed Cycnus of sweet life, then leave him there and his armor also, and you yourself watch man-slaying as narrowly as he attacks, and wherever you shall see him uncovered below his cunningly wrought shield, there wound him with your sharp spear. Then draw back, for it is not ordained that you should take his horses or his splendid armor. LL 338-349, so said the bright-eyed goddess and swiftly got up into the car with victory and renown in her hands. Then heaven nurtured Iolaus called terribly to the horses, and at his cry they swiftly whirled the fleet chariot along, raising dust from the plain. For the goddess bright-eyed Athene put metal into them by shaking her aegis. And the earth groaned all round them. And they, horse-taming Cycnus and Oz, insatiable in war, came on together like fire or whirlwind. Then their horses neighed shrilly, face to face, and the echo was shivered all round them. And mighty Heracles spoke first and said to that other, LL 350-367, Cygnus, good sir. Why, pray, do you set your swift horses at us, men who are tried in labor and pain? Nay, guide your fleet car aside and yield and go out of the path. It is to Trachis I am driving on, to Six the king, who is the first in Trachis for power and for honor, and that you yourself know well, for you have his daughter dark-eyed Themistino to wife. Fool! For us shall not deliver you from the end of death, if we two meet together in battle. Another time ere this I declare he has made trial of my spear, when he defended sandy pylos and stood against me, fiercely longing for fight. Thrice was he stricken by my spear and dashed to earth, and his shield was pierced, but the fourth time I struck his thigh, laying on with all my strength, and tear deep into his flesh and he fell headlong in the dust upon the ground through the force of my spear thrust, then truly he would have been disgraced among the deathless gods, if by my hands he had left behind his bloody spoils. LL 368-385, so said he. 
but Cygnus the stout spearman cared not to obey him and to pull up the horses that drew his chariot. Then it was that from their well-woven cars they both leaped straight to the ground, the son of Zeus and the son of the Lord of War. The charioteers drove near by their horses with beautiful manes, and the wide earth rang with the beat of their hoofs as they rushed along. As when rocks leap forth from the high peak of a great mountain, and fall on one another and many towering oaks and pines and long-rooted poplars are broken by them as they whirl swiftly down until they reach the plain, so did they fall on one another with a great shout, and all the town of the Myrmidons, and famous Iolcus, and On, and Hellas, and Gracian Thea echoed loudly at the voice of the two. With an awful cry they closed, and wise Zeus thundered loudly and rained down drops of blood, giving the signal for battle to his dauntless son. LL 386-401, as a tusked boar, that is fearful for a man to see before him in the glens of a mountain, resolves to fight with the huntsmen and white tusks, turning sideways while foam flows all round his mouth as he gnashes, and his eyes are like glowing fire, and he bristles the hair on his mane and around his neck, like him the son of Zeus leaped from his horse chariot. And when the dark-winged whirring grasshopper, perched on a green shoot, begins to sing of summer to men, his food and drink is the dainty dew and all day long from dawn pours forth his voice in the deadliest heat, when Sirius scorches the flesh, then the beard grows upon the millet which men sow in summer, when the crude grapes which Dionysius gave to men, a joy and a sorrow both, begin to colour, in that season they fought and loud rose the clamour. LL 402-412, as two lions 1806 on either side of a slain deer spring at one another in fury, and there is a fearful snarling and a clashing also of teeth, like vultures with crooked talons and hooked beak that fight and scream aloud on a high rock over a mountain goat or fat wild deer which some active man has shot with an arrow from the string, and himself has wandered away elsewhere, not knowing the place, but they quickly mark it and vehemently do keen battle about it, like these they too rushed upon one another with a shout. LL 413-423, then Cygnus, eager to kill the son of almighty Zeus, struck upon his shield with a brazen spear, but did not break the bronze, and the gift of the god saved his foe. But the son of Amphitryon, mighty Heracles, with his long spear struck Cygnus violently in the neck beneath the chin where it was unguarded between helm and shield. And the deadly spear cut through the two sinews, for the hero's full strength lighted on his foe. And Cygnus fell as an oak falls or a lofty pine that is stricken by the lurid thunderbolt of Zeus, even so he fell, and his armor adorned with bronze clashed about him. LL 424-442, then the stout-hearted son of Zeus let him be, and himself watched for the onset of man's laying us, fiercely he stared, like a lion who has come upon a body and full eagerly rips the hide with his strong claws and takes away the sweet life with all speed. His dark heart is filled with rage and his eyes glare fiercely, while he tears up the earth with his paws and lashes his flanks and shoulders with his tail so that no one dares to face him and go near to give battle. Even so, the son of Amphitryon, 
unsated of battle, stood eagerly face to face with Oz, nursing courage in his heart. And Oz drew near him with grief in his heart, and they both sprang at one another with a cry. As it is when a rock shoots out from a great cliff and whirls down with long bounds, careering eagerly with a roar, and a high crag clashes with it and keeps it there where they strike together, with no less clamor did deadly Oz, the chariot born, rush shouting at Heracles. And he quickly received the attack. LL 443-449 But Athene the daughter of Aegis bearing Zeus came to meet Oz, wearing the dark Aegis, and she looked at him with an angry frown and spoke winged words to him. Oz, check your fierce anger and matchless hands, for it is not ordained that you should kill Heracles, the bold-hearted son of Zeus, and strip off his rich armor. Come, then, cease fighting and do not withstand me. LL 450-466, so said she, but did not move the courageous spirit of Oz. But he uttered a great shout and waving his spears like fire, he rushed headlong at strong Heracles, longing to kill him, and hurled a brazen spear upon the great shield for he was furiously angry because of his dead son, but bright-eyed Athene reached out from the car and turned aside the force of the spear. Then bitter grief seized Oz and he drew his keen sword and leaped upon bold-hearted Heracles. But as he came on, the son of Amphitryon, unsated of fierce battle, shrewdly wounded his thigh where it was exposed under his richly wrought shield, and tear deep into his flesh with the spear thrust and cast him flat upon the ground. And panic and dread quickly drove his smooth-wheeled chariot and horses near him and lifted him from the wide-pathed earth into his richly wrought car, and then straight lashed the horses and came to high Olympus. LL 467-471 But the son of Alcmena and glorious Iolaus stripped the fine armor off Cycnus' shoulders and went, and their swift horses carried them straight to the city of Trachis. And bright-eyed Athene went thence to great Olympus and her father's house. LL 472-480, as for Cygnus, six buried him and the countless people who lived near the city of the glorious king, in Anth and the city of the Myrmidons, and famous Iolcus, and On, and Hellas, and much people were gathered doing honor to Six, the friend of the blessed gods. But Anaris, swelled by a rainstorm, blotted out the grave and memorial of Cycnus, for so Apollo, Leto's son, commanded him, because he used to watch for and violently despoil the rich hecatombs that any might bring to Pytho. The marriage of six fragment hash one, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. I-128, Hesiod in the marriage of six says that he, Heracles, landed, from the Argo, to look for water and was left behind in Magnesia near the place called Aphetai because of his desertion there. Fragment hash 2, Xenobius 1901, 2. 19, Hesiod used the proverb in the following way. Heracles is represented as having constantly visited the house of six of Trachis and spoken thus, of their own selves the good make for the feasts of good. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 14 119, 
and horse driving six beholding, fragment hash four, Athena ooze, two. P forty nine B, Hesiod in the marriage of six, for though grammar school boys alienate it from the poet, yet I consider the poem ancient, calls the tables tripods. Fragment hash five, Gregory of Corinth, on forms of speech, read. GR seven. 776 But when they had done with desire for the equal shared feast, even then they brought from the forest the mother of a mother, S.C. Wood, dry and parched, to be slain by her own children, S.C. to be burnt in the flames. The Great E.O.I.A.E. Fragment Hash 1. Pausanias, 2. 26.3. Epidaurus. According to the opinion of the Argives and the epic poem, the great Eoiae, Argus the son of Zeus was father of Epidaurus. Fragment hash 2, anonymous comment. On Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, 3. 7, and, they say, Hesiod is sufficient to prove that the word poneros, bad, has the same sense as laborious or ill-fated, for in the great Eoiae he represents Alcman as saying to Heracles, My son, truly Zeus your father bego you to be the most toilful as the most excellent, and again, the fates, made, you the most toilful and the most excellent, fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Pinder. Ism v. 53. The story has been taken from the great Eoiae, for there we find Heracles entertained by Telamon, standing dressed in his lion skin and praying, and there also we find the eagle sent by Zeus, from which Aras took his name 2001. Fragment hash 4. Pausanias, 4. 2-1. But I know that the so-called great Eoiae say that Polycon the son of Butes married Euachm, daughter of Hylas, Heracles' son. Fragment hash 5. Pausanias, 9. 46. And Phyllis wedded Lepiphile the daughter of famous Iolaus, and she was like the Olympians in beauty. She bare him a son Hippotids in the palace, and comely Thero who was like the beams of the moon. And Thero lay in the embrace of Apollo and bare horse taming Charon of hardy strength. Fragment hash 6, Scoli asked on Pinder, Pyth. 435, or like her in Hyria, careful minded machinist who was joined in the love of golden Aphrodite with the earth holder and earth shaker, and bear euphemous. Fragment hash 7, Pausanias, 9. 36 7, and Hiatus killed Molurus the dear son of Aristus in his house because he lay with his wife. Then he left his home and fled from horse-rearing Argus and came to Mignon or Comenus. And the hero received him and gave him a portion of his goods, as was fitting. Fragment hash 8, Pausanias, 2. 2 3, but in the great Eoiae Perine is represented to be the daughter of Ebalius. Fragment hash 9. Pausanias, 2. 16.4. The epic poem, which the Greek call the Great Eoiae, says that she, Mycen, was the daughter of Inachus and wife of Arista, from her, then, it is said, the city received its name. Fragment hash 10. Pausanias, 6. 21.10. According to the poem The Great Eoiae, these were killed by Enomors 2002, 
Alcathus the son of Portaon next after Marmax, and after Alcathus, Euryalus, Eurymachus and Critolus. The man killed next after them, Arias, we should judge to have been a Lacedaemonian and founder of Aria. And after Acrias, they say, Capetus was done to death by Enomors, and Lycagus, Lasius, Chalcodon and Tricolonus. And after Tricolonus fate overtook Aristomerchus and Prius on the course, as also Pelagon and Aeolius and Cronius. Fragment hash 11, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. 457, in the great EOIA it is said that Endymion was transported by Zeus into heaven, but when he fell in love with Hera, was befooled with a shape of cloud, and was cast out and went down into Hades. Fragment hash 12, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. I-118 in the great EOIA it is related that Melampus, who was very dear to Apollo, went abroad and stayed with Polyphants. But when the king had sacrificed an ox, a serpent crept up to the sacrifice and destroyed his servants. At this the king was angry and killed the serpent, but Melampus took and buried it. And its offspring brought up by him, used to lick his ears and inspire him with prophecy. And so, when he was caught while trying to steal the cows of Ipiclus and taken bound to the city of Aegina, and when the house, in which Ipiclus was, was about to fall, he told an old woman, one of the servants of Ipiclus, and in return was released. Fragment hash 13, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. 4828, in the great EOIA Scylla is the daughter of Phbus and Hecate. Fragment hash 14, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. 2181. Hesiod in the great EOIA says that Phineus was blinded because he told Fricus the way 2003. Fragment hash 15, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. 2122, Argus. This is one of the children of Fricus. These. Hesiod in the great EOIA says were born of Iophosa the daughter of Aetes. And he says there were four of them, Argus, Frontis, Melas, and Cytisrus. Fragment hash 16, Antoninus Liberalis, 23, Batus. Hesiod tells the story in the great EOIA, Magnus was the son of Argus the son of Fricus and Perimel, Admetus' daughter, and lived in the region of Thessaly, in the land which men called after him Magnesia. He had a son of remarkable beauty, Hymenus. And when Apollo saw the boy, he was seized with love for him, and would not leave the house of Magnus. Then Hermes made designs on Apollo's herd of cattle which were grazing in the same place as the cattle of Admetus. First he cast upon the dogs which were guarding the mastupa and strangles, so that the dogs forgot the cows and lost the power of barking. Then he drove away twelve heifers and a hundred cows never yoked, and the bull who mounted the cows fastening to the tail of each one brushwood to wipe out the footmarks of the cows. He drove them through the country of the Pelasgi, and Achaei in the land of Phthia, and through Lacris, and Pythia and Megaris, and thence into Peloponnesus by way of Corinth and Larissa, until he brought them to Tegea. 
From there he went on by the Lycian Mountains, and passed Manalus and what are called the watch posts of Batus. Now this Batus used to live on the top of the rock and when he heard the voice of the heifers as they were being driven past, he came out from his own place, and knew that the cattle were stolen. So he asked for a reward to tell no one about them. Hermes promised to give it him on these terms, and Batus swore to say nothing to anyone about the cattle. But when Hermes had hidden them in the cliff by Corophasium, and had driven them into a cave facing towards Italy and Sicily, he changed himself and came again to Batus and tried whether he would be true to him as he had vowed. So, offering him a robe as a reward, he asked of him whether he had noticed stolen cattle being driven past. And Batus took the robe and told him about the cattle. But Hermes was angry because he was double-tongued, and struck him with his staff and changed him into a rock. And either frost or heat never leaves him 2004. The Melampodia Fragment Hash 1, Strabo, 14. P 642. It is said that Calchis the seer returned from Troy with Amphilochus the son of Amphiroros and came on foot to this place 2101. But happening to find near Clarus a seer greater than himself, Mopsus, the son of Manto, Tyrzias' daughter, he died of vexation. Hesiod, indeed works up the story in some form as this, Calchas set Mopsus the following problem, I am filled with wonder at the quantity of figs this wild fig tree bears though it is so small. Can you tell their number? And Mopsus answered, 10,000 is their number, and their measure is a bushel, one fig is left over which you would not be able to put into the measure. So said he, and they found the reckoning of the measure true. Then did the end of death shroud Calchas. Fragment hash 2, Sitsis on Lycophron, 682, but now he is speaking of Tyrzias, since it is said that he lived seven generations, though others say nine. He lived from the times of Cadmus down to those of Etiocles and Polynices, as the author of Melampodia also says, for he introduces Tyrzias speaking thus, Father Zeus, would that you had given me a shorter span of life to be mine and wisdom of heart like that of mortal men. But now you have honoured me not even a little though you ordained me to have a long span of life, and to live through seven generations of mortal kind. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Homer, Odyssey, X 494, they say that Tyrzias saw two snakes mating on Sitharan and that, when he killed the female, he was changed into a woman, and again, when he killed the male, took again his own nature. This same Tyrzias was chosen by Zeus and Hera to decide the question whether the male or the female has most pleasure in intercourse. And he said, of ten parts a man enjoys only one, but a woman's sense enjoys all ten in full. For this Hera was angry and blinded him but Zeus gave him the seer's power. Fragment hash 4, 2102 Athena Uz, 2. P40, for pleasant it is at a feast and rich banquet to tell delightful tales, when men have had enough of feasting, Clement of Alexandria, Stromati 6. 226. 
and pleasant also it is to know a clear token of ill or good amid all the signs that the deathless ones have given to mortal men. Fragment hash 5, Athena Uz, 11. 498 and Mez, swift messenger, came to him through the house and brought a silver goblet which he had filled, and gave it to the Lord. Fragment hash 6, Athena Uz, 11. 498 b, and then Mantis took in his hands the ox's halter and Ipiclus lashed him upon the back. And behind him, with a cup in one hand and a raised scepter in the other, walked Philicus and spake amongst the bondmen. Fragment hash 7, Athena Uz, 13. P 690, Hesiod in the third book of the Melampodia called Chalcis in Euboea the land of fair women. Fragment hash 8, Strabo, 14. P 676, but Hesiod says that Amphilochus was killed by Apollo at Soli. Fragment hash 9, Clement of Alexandria, Stromatae, VP 259, and now there is no seer among mortal men such as would know the mind of Zeus who holds the Aegis. Aegemius fragment hash 1, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 3587, but the author of the Aegemius says that he, Fricus, was received without intermediary because of the fleece 2201. He says that after the sacrifice he purified the fleece and so, holding the fleece he walked into the halls of Aetis. Fragment hash 2, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. 4816. The author of the Aegemius says in the second book that Thetis used to throw the children she had by Pelus into a cauldron of water, because she wished to learn where they were mortal, and that after many had perished Pelus was annoyed, and prevented her from throwing Achilles into the cauldron. Fragment hash 3, Apollodorus, 2. 1.3.1 Hesiod and Akasilaus say that she, Io, was the daughter of Paeron. While she was holding the office of priestess of Hera, Zeus seduced her, and being discovered by Hera, touched the girl and changed her into a white cow, while he swore that he had no intercourse with her. And so Hesiod says that oaths touching the matter of love do not draw down anger from the gods, and thereafter he ordained that an oath concerning the secret deeds of the Cyprian should be without penalty for men. Fragment hash 4, Herodian in Stephanus of Byzantium, Zeus changed Io, in the fair island Abantis, which the gods, who are eternally, used to call Abantis aforetime, but Zeus then called it Eubia after the cow. 2202 Fragment Hash 5, Scoli asked on Euripides, Fien. 1116, and, Hera, set a watcher upon her, Io, great and strong Argus, who with four eyes looks every way. And the goddess stirred in him unwearying strength, sleep never fell upon his eyes, but he kept sure watch always. Fragment hash 6, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. Xiv 24, Slayer of Argus. According to Hesiod's tale he, Hermes, slew, Argus, the herdsman of Io. Fragment hash 7, Athena Uz, 11. P 503, and the author of the Aegemius, 
whether he is Hesiod or Circups of Miletus, says there, some day, shall be my place of refreshment, O leader of the people. Fragment hash 8, etim. General, Hesiod, says there were so called, because they settled in three groups, and they all were called the threefold people, because they divided in three the land far from their country. For, he says, that three Hellenic tribes settled in Crete, the Pelasgi, Achaeans and Dorians. And these have been called threefold people. Fragments of unknown position Fragment hash 1, Diogenes Laertius, 8. 126, 2301 So Urania Berlinus, a very lovely son, and him all men who are singers and harpers do bewail at feasts and dances, and as they begin and as they end they call on Linus. Clement of Alexandria, Strom. IP 121, who was skilled in all manner of wisdom. Fragment hash 2, Scoli asked on Homer, Odyssey, 4. 232, unless Phbus Apollo should save him from death, or Pian himself who knows the remedies for all things. Fragment hash 3, Clement of Alexandria, Protrept, C7. P21, for he alone is king and lord of all the undying gods, and no other vies with him in power. Fragment hash 4, Annect. Oxon, Crammer, IP 148, to cause, the gifts of the blessed gods to come near to earth. Fragment hash 5, Clement of Alexandria, Strom. IP 123, of the muses who make a man very wise, marvellous in utterance. Fragment hash 6, Strabo, XP 471, but of them, SC the daughters of Hecaterus, were born the divine mountain nymphs and the tribe of worthless, helpless satyrs, and the divine curities, sportive dancers. Fragment hash 7, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. I-824, beseeching the offspring of glorious Claudius. Fragment hash 8, Sudas, SV, for the Olympian gave might to the sons of Iacus, and wisdom to the sons of Amidon, and wealth to the sons of Atreus. Fragment hash 9, Scoli asked on Homer, Iliad, 13. 155, for through his lack of wood the timber of the ships rotted. Fragment hash 10, etymologicum magnum, no longer do they walk with delicate feet. Fragment hash 11, Scoli asked on Homer, Iliad, Xiv. 624, first of all they roasted, pieces of meat and drew them carefully off the spits. Fragment hash 12, Chrysippus, Frag. 2 254. 11, for his spirit increased in his dear breast. Fragment hash 13, Chrysippus, Frag. 2 254. 15, with such heart grieving anger in her breast. Fragment hash 14, Strabo, 7. P 327, he went to Dodona and the Oak Grove, the dwelling place of the Pelasgi. Fragment hash 15, Annect. Oxon, Crammer, 3. P 318. Not, with the pitiless smoke of black pitch and of cedar. 
Fragment hash 16, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. I-757, but he himself in the swelling tide of the rain-swollen river. Fragment hash 17, Stephanus of Byzantium, the river, Parthenius, flowing as softly as a dainty maiden goes. Fragment hash 18, Scoli asked on Theocritus, 11. 75, Foolish the man who leaves what he has, and follows after what he has not. Fragment hash 19, Harpocration, the deeds of the young, the counsels of the middle-aged, and the prayers of the aged. Fragment hash 20, Porpha, on abstinence, 2. 18 p. 134, Howsoever the city does sacrifice, the ancient custom is best. Fragment hash 21, Scoli asked on Nicander, mm. the Reica, 452, but you should be gentle towards your father. Fragment hash 22, Plato, Epist. 11 358, and if I said this, it would seem a poor thing and hard to understand. Fragment hash 23, Bacchylides, v 191-3, Thus spake the Puteum, even Hesiod 2302, Servant of the sweet muses, whomsoever the immortals honour, the good report of mortals also followeth him. Doubtful fragments fragment hash one, gallon, de plaque. Hip. It plat. I 266, and then it was Zeus took away sense from the heart of a Thamaz. Fragment hash two, Scoli asked on Homer, O.D. 7104, they grind the yellow grain at the mill. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Pinder, Nem. 2-1, then first in Delos did I and Homer, singers both, raise our strain, stitching song in new hymns, Phbus Apollo with the golden sword, whom Leto bear. Fragment hash 4, Julian, Mysopagon, p. 369, but starvation on a handful is a cruel thing. Fragment hash 5, Servius on Virgil, in 4 484, Hesiod says that these Hesperides, daughters of night, guarded the golden apples beyond ocean, eagle and erythia and oxide Hesprethusa. 2401 Fragment Hash 6, Plato, Republic, 3. 390 E, Gifts move the gods, gifts move worshipful princes. Fragment Hash 7, 2402 Clement of Alexandria, Strom. VP 256, on the seventh day again the bright light of the sun. Fragment hash 8, Apollonius, Lex. Whom, he brought pure water and mixed it with ocean streams. Fragment hash 9, Stephanus of Byzantium, Aspledon and Clemenus and godlike Amphidicus. Sons of Orchomenus. Fragment hash 10, Scoli asked on Pindar, Nem. 364, Telamon never sated with battle first brought light to our comrades by slaying blameless Melanip, destroyer of men, own sister of the golden girdled queen. The Homeric hymns I to Dionysius 2501 asterisk 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 LL129, for some say, at Drachenum, 
and some, on windy Icarus, and some, in Naxos, O heaven-born, in Zone 2502, and others by the deep eddying river Alpheus that pregnant seam will bear you to Zeus the thunder-lover. And others yet, Lord, say you were born in Thebes, but all these lie. The father of men and gods gave you birth remote from men and secretly from white-armed Hera. There is a certain Nysa, a mountain most high and richly grown with woods, far off in Finis, near the streams of Egyptus. Asterisk 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 asterisk, LL 10 to 12 and men will lay up for her two thousand five hundred and three many offerings in her shrines. And as these things are three two thousand five hundred and four, so shall mortals ever sacrifice perfect hecatombs to you at your feasts each three years. LL 13 to 16, the son of Kronos spoke and nodded with his dark brows. And the divine locks of the king flowed forward from his immortal head, and he made great Olympus real. So spake wise Zeus and ordained it with a nod. LL 17-21 Be favorable, O Insone, inspirer of frenzied women. We singers sing of you as we begin and as we end a strain and none forgetting you may call holy song to mind. And so, farewell, Dionysius, in Sown, with your mother Semel whom men call Thin. 2 to Demeter, LL 1 to 3, I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and her trim-ankled daughter who made unuse wrapped away given to him by all-seeing Zeus the loud thunderer. LL 4-18, apart from Demeter, lady of the golden sword and glorious fruits, she was playing with the deep-bosomed daughters of Oceanus and gathering flowers over a soft meadow, roses and crocuses and beautiful violets, irises also and hyacinths and the narcissus which earth made to grow at the will of Zeus and to please the host of many, to be a snare for the bloom-like girl, a marvellous, radiant flower. It was a thing of all weather for deathless gods or mortal men to see, from its root grew a hundred blooms, and it smelled most sweetly, so that all white heaven above and the whole earth and the sea's salt swell laughed for joy. And the girl was amazed and reached out with both hands to take the lovely toy, but the wide path earth yawned there in the plain of Nysa, and the Lord, host of many, with his immortal horses sprang out upon her, the son of Kronos, he who has many names 2505. LL 19-32 he caught her up reluctant on his golden car and bare her away lamenting. Then she cried out shrilly with her voice, calling upon her father, the son of Kronos, who is most high and excellent. But no one, either of the deathless gods or of mortal men, heard her voice, nor yet the olive trees bearing rich fruit. Only tender-hearted Hecate, bright-coiffed, the daughter of Perseus, heard the girl from her cave, and the Lord Helios, Hyperion's bright son, as she cried to her father, the son of Kronos. But he was sitting aloof, apart from the gods, in his temple where many pray, and receiving sweet offerings from mortal men. So he, that son of Kronos, of many names, who is ruler of many and host of many, was bearing her away by leave of Zeus on his immortal chariot, his own brother's child and all unwilling. LL 33-39, and so long as she, 
the goddess, yet beheld earth and starry heaven and the strong flowing sea where fishes shoal, and the rays of the sun, and still hoped to see her dear mother and the tribes of the eternal gods, so long hope calmed her great heart for all her trouble. Lacuna and the heights of the mountains and the depths of the sea rang with her immortal voice, and her queenly mother heard her. LL 40-53, bitter pain seized her heart, and she rent the covering upon her divine hair with her dear hands, her dark cloak she cast down from both her shoulders and sped, like a wild bird, over the firm land and yielding sea seeking her child. But no one would tell her the truth, neither God nor mortal men, and of the birds of omen none came with true news for her. Then for nine days queenly Deo wandered over the earth with flaming torches in her hands, so grieved that she never tasted ambrosia and the sweet draught of nectar, nor sprinkled her body with water. But when the tenth enlightening dawn had come, Hecate, with a torch in her hands, met her, and spoke to her and told her news. LL 54-58 Queenly Demeter, bringer of seasons and giver of good gifts, what god of heaven or what mortal man has wrapped away Persephone and pierced with sorrow your dear heart? For I heard her voice yet saw not with my eyes who it was. But I tell you truly and shortly all I know. LL 59-73 So, then, said Hecate. And the daughter of rich haired Rhea answered her not, but sped swiftly with her, holding flaming torches in her hands. So they came to Helios, who is watchman of both gods and men, and stood in front of his horses, and the bright goddess inquired of him, Helios, do you at least regard me, goddess as I am, if ever by word or deed of mine I have cheered your heart and spirit? Through the fruitless air I heard the thrilling cry of my daughter whom I bear, sweet scion of my body and lovely in form as of one seized violently, though with my eyes I saw nothing. But you, for with your beams you look down from the bright upper air over all the earth and sea, tell me truly of my dear child, if you have seen her anywhere, what god or mortal man has violently seized her against her will and mine, and so made off. LL 74-87 so said she. And the son of Hyperion answered her, Queen Demeter, daughter of rich-haired Rhea, I will tell you the truth, for I greatly reverence and pity you in your grief for your trim-ankled daughter. None other of the deathless gods is to blame, but only cloud-gathering Zeus who gave her to Hads, her father's brother to be called his buxom wife. And had seized her and took her loudly crying in his chariot down to his realm of mist and gloom. Yet, goddess, cease your loud lament and keep not vain anger unrelentingly, a Dunus, the ruler of many, is no unfitting husband among the deathless gods for your child being your own brother and born of the same stock, also, for honour, he has that third share which he received when division was made at the first, and is appointed lord of those among whom he dwells. LL 88-89 So he spake, and called to his horses, and at his chiding they quickly whirled the swift chariot along, like long-winged birds. LL 90-112, but grief yet more terrible and savage came into the heart of Demeter, 
and thereafter she was so angered with the dark clouded son of Kronos that she avoided the gathering of the gods and high Olympus, and went to the towns and rich fields of men, disfiguring her form a long while. And no one of men or deep-bosomed women knew her when they saw her, until she came to the house of wise Seleus who then was lord of fragrant Eleusi. Vexed in her dear heart, she sat near the wayside by the maiden well, from which the women of the place were used to draw water, in a shady place over which grew an olive shrub. And she was like an ancient woman who is cut off from childbearing and the gifts of garland-loving Aphrodite, like the nurses of king's children who deal justice or like the housekeepers in their echoing halls. There the daughters of Seleus, son of Eleusi, saw her, as they were coming for easy drawn water, to carry it in pitchers of bronze to their dear father's house, for were they and like goddesses in the flower of their girlhood, Chalidus and Clesidus and lovely Demo and Chalithu who was the eldest of them all. They knew her not, for the gods are not easily discerned by mortals, but standing near by her spoke winged words, LL 113-117, Old Mother, whence and who are you of folk born long ago? Why are you gone away from the city and do not draw near the houses? For there in the shady halls are women of just such age as you, and others younger, and they would welcome you both by word and by deed. LL 118-144, thus they said. And she, that queen among goddesses answered them saying, Hail, dear children, whosoever you are of womankind. I will tell you my story, for it is not unseemly that I should tell you truly what you ask. Doso is my name, for my stately mother gave it me. And now I am come from Crete over the seas wide back, not willingly, but pirates brought me thence by force of strength against my liking. Afterwards they put in with their swift craft to Thuricus, and there the women landed on the shore in full throng and the men likewise, and they began to make ready a meal by the stern cables of the ship. But my heart craved not pleasant food, and I fled secretly across the dark country and escaped my masters, that they should not take me unpurchased across the sea there to win a price for me. And so I wandered and am come here, and I know not at all what land this is or what people are in it. But may all those who dwell on Olympus give you husbands and birth of children as parents desire, so you take pity on me, maidens, and show me this clearly that I may learn, dear children to the house of what man and woman I may go, to work for them cheerfully at such tasks as belong to a woman of my age. Well could I nurse a newborn child, holding him in my arms, or keep house, or spread my master's bed in a recess of the well-built chamber, or teach the women their work. LL 145 to 146, so said the goddess. And straightway the unwed maiden Chalidus, goodliest in form of the daughters of Seleus, answered her and said, LL 147 to 168, Mother, what the gods send us, we mortals bear perforce, although we suffer for they are much stronger than we. But now I will teach you clearly, telling you the names of men who have great power and honor here and are chief among the people, guarding our city's COIF of towers by their wisdom and true judgments, 
there is wise Triptolemus and Diocles and Polyxenus and blameless Eumolpus and Delichus and our own brave father. All these have wives who manage in the house, and no one of them, so soon as she has seen you, would dishonor you and turn you from the house, but they will welcome you, for indeed you are godlike. But if you will, stay here, and we will go to our father's house and tell Mitaneira, our deep-bosomed mother, all this matter fully that she may bid you rather come to our home than search after the houses of others. She has an only son, late born, who is being nursed in our well-built house, a child of many prayers and welcome, if you could bring him up until he reached the full measure of youth, any one of womankind who should see you would straightway envy you. Such gifts would our mother give for his upbringing. LL 169-183 So she spake, and the goddess bowed her head in assent. And they filled their shining vessels with water and carried them off rejoicing. Quickly they came to their father's great house and straightway told their mother according as they had heard and seen. Then she bade them go with all speed and invite the stranger to come for a measureless hire. As hinds or heifers in springtime, when sated with pasture, bound about a meadow, so they, holding up the folds of their lovely garments, darted down the hollow path, and their hair like a crocus flower streamed about their shoulders. And they found the good goddess near the wayside where they had left her before, and led her to the house of their dear father. And she walked behind, distressed in her dear heart, with her head veiled and wearing a dark cloak which waved about the slender feet of the goddess. LL 184-211 Soon they came to the house of heaven-nurtured Seleus and went through the portico to where their queenly mother sat by a pillar of the close-fitted roof, holding her son, a tender scion, in her bosom. And the girls ran to her. But the goddess walked to the threshold and her head reached the roof and she filled the doorway with a heavenly radiance. Then awe and reverence and pale fear took hold of Mitaneira, and she rose up from her couch before Demeter, and bade her be seated. But Demeter, bringer of seasons and giver of perfect gifts, would not sit upon the bright couch but stayed silent with lovely eyes cast down until careful Iamb placed a jointed seat for her and threw over it a silvery fleece. Then she sat down and held her veil in her hands before her face. A long time she sat upon the stool 2506 without speaking because of her sorrow, and greeted no one by word or by sign but rested, never smiling, and tasting neither food nor drink, because she pined with longing for her deep-bosomed daughter, until careful I am, who pleased her moods in after time also, moved the holy lady with many a quip and jest to smile and laugh and cheer her heart. Then Mitaneira filled a cup with sweet wine and offered it to her, but she refused it, for she said it was not lawful for her to drink red wine, but bade them mix meal and water with soft mint and give her to drink. And Mitaneira mixed the draught and gave it to the goddess as she bade. So the great queen Deo received it to observe the sacrament. 2507 Lacuna LL 212-223, and of them all, well-girded Mitaneira first began to speak, Hail, Lady! 
for I think you are not meanly but nobly born. Truly dignity and grace are conspicuous upon your eyes as in the eyes of kings that deal justice. Yet we mortals bear perforce what the gods send us, though we be grieved, for a yoke is set upon our necks. But now, since you are come here, you shall have what I can bestow, and nurse me this child whom the gods gave me in my old age and beyond my hope a son much prayed for. If you should bring him up until he reach the full measure of youth, any one of womankind that sees you will straightway envy you, so great reward would I give for his upbringing. LL 224-230 Then rich-haired Demeter answered her, and to you, also, lady, all hail and may the gods give you good. Gladly will I take the boy to my breast, as you bid me, and will nurse him. Never, I ween, through any heedlessness of his nurse shall witchcraft hurt him nor yet the undercutter 2508, for I know a charm far stronger than the woodcutter and I know an excellent safeguard against woeful witchcraft. LL 231-247 When she had so spoken, she took the child in her fragrant bosom with her divine hands, and his mother was glad in her heart. So the goddess nursed in the palace Demophoon, wise Seleus goodly son whom well girded Metanera bear. And the child grew like some immortal being, not fed with food nor nourished at the breast, for by day rich crown Demeter would anoint him with ambrosia as if he were the offspring of a god and breathe sweetly upon him as she held him in her bosom. But at night she would hide him like a brand in the heart of the fire unknown to his dear parents. And it wrought great wonder in these that he grew beyond his age, for he was like the gods face to face. And she would have made him deathless and unaging, had not well-girded Metanera in her heedlessness kept watch by night from her sweet-smelling chamber and spied. But she wailed and smote her two hips because she feared for her son and was greatly distraught in her heart, so she lamented and uttered winged words, LL 248-249, Demophoon, my son, the strange woman buries you deep in fire and works grief and bitter sorrow for me. LL 250-255, Thus she spoke, mourning. And the bright goddess, lovely crowned Demeter, heard her, and was wroth with her. So with her divine hands she snatched from the fire the dear son whom Metanera had borne unhoped for in the palace, and cast him from her to the ground, for she was terribly angry in her heart. Forthwith she said to well-girded Metanera, LL 256-274, Witless are you mortals and dull to foresee your lot, whether of good or evil, that comes upon you. For now in your heedlessness you have wrought folly past healing, for, be witness the oath of the gods. The relentless water of Styx, I would have made your dear son deathless and unaging all his days and would have bestowed on him everlasting honor, but now he can in no way escape death and the fates. Yet shall unfailing honor always rest upon him, because he lay upon my knees and slept in my arms. But, as the years move round and when he is in his prime, the sons of the Eleusinians shall ever wage war and dread strife with one another continually. Lo! 
I am that Demeter who has share of honor and is the greatest help and cause of joy to the undying gods and mortal men. But now, let all the people build me a great temple and an altar below it and beneath the city and its sheer wall upon a rising hillock above Corlicherus. And I myself will teach my rites, that hereafter you may reverently perform them and so win the favor of my heart. LL 275-281 When she had so said, the goddess changed her stature and her looks, thrusting old age away from her. Beauty spread round about her and a lovely fragrance was wafted from her sweet-smelling robes, and from the divine body of the goddess a light shone afar, while golden tresses spread down over her shoulders, so that the strong house was filled with brightness as with lightning. And so she went out from the palace. LL 281-291, and straightway Metaneira's knees were loosed and she remained speechless for a long while and did not remember to take up her late-born son from the ground. But his sisters heard his pitiful wailing and sprang down from their well-spread beds, one of them took up the child in her arms and laid him in her bosom while another revived the fire, and a third rushed with soft feet to bring their mother from her fragrant chamber. And they gathered about the struggling child and washed him, embracing him lovingly, but he was not comforted, because nurses and handmaids much less skillful were holding him now. LL 292-300 all night long they sought to appease the glorious goddess, quaking with fear. But, as soon as dawn began to show, they told powerful Seleus all things without fail, as the lovely crowned goddess Demeter charged them. So Seleus called the countless people to an assembly and bade them make a goodly temple for rich-haired Demeter and an altar upon the rising hillock and they obeyed him right speedily and hearkened to his voice, doing as he commanded. As for the child, he grew like an immortal being. LL 301-320 Now when they had finished building and had drawn back from their toil, they went every man to his house. But golden-haired Demeter sat there apart from all the blessed gods and stayed, wasting with yearning for her deep-bosomed daughter. Then she caused a most dreadful and cruel year for mankind over the all-nourishing earth. The ground would not make the seed sprout, for rich crown Demeter kept it hid. In the fields the oxen drew many a curved plough in vain and much white barley was cast upon the land without avail. So she would have destroyed the whole race of man with cruel famine and have robbed them who dwell on Olympus of their glorious rite of gifts and sacrifices, had not Zeus perceived and marked this in his heart. First he sent golden-winged Iris to call rich-haired Demeter, lovely in form. So he commanded. And she obeyed the dark-clouded son of Kronos, and sped with swift feet across the space between. She came to the stronghold of fragrant Eleusi, and there finding dark-cloaked Demeter in her temple, spake to her and uttered winged words, LL 321-323. Father Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, calls you to come join the tribes of the eternal gods, come therefore, and let not the message I bring from Zeus pass unobeyed. LL 324-333, thus said Iris imploring her. 
but Demeter's heart was not moved. Then again the Father sent forth all the blessed and eternal gods besides, and they came, one after the other, and kept calling her and offering many very beautiful gifts and whatever right she might be pleased to choose among the deathless gods. Yet no one was able to persuade her mind and will, so wroth was she in her heart, but she stubbornly rejected all their words, for she vowed that she would never set foot on fragrant Olympus nor let fruit spring out of the ground, until she beheld with her eyes her own fair-faced daughter. LL 334-346 now when all-seeing Zeus the loud thunderer heard this, he sent the slayer of Argus whose wand is of gold to Erebus, so that having won over Hads with soft words, he might lead forth chaste Persephone to the light from the misty gloom to join the gods, and that her mother might see her with her eyes and cease from her anger. And Hermes obeyed, and leaving the house of Olympus, straightway sprang down with speed to the hidden places of the earth. And he found the Lord Hads in his house seated upon a couch, and his shy mate with him, much reluctant, because she yearned for her mother. But she was afar off, brooding on her fell design because of the deeds of the blessed gods. And the strong slayer of Argus drew near and said, LL 347 to 356, Dark Haired Hads, ruler over the departed, Father Zeus bids me bring noble Persephone forth from Erebus unto the gods, that her mother may see her with her eyes and cease from her dread anger with the immortals, for now she plans an awful deed to destroy the weakly tribes of earth-born men by keeping seed hidden beneath the earth, and so she makes an end of the honours of the undying gods. For she keeps fearful anger and does not consort with the gods, but sits aloof in her fragrant temple, dwelling in the rocky hold of El Uzi. LL 357-359, so he said. And Adonius, ruler over the dead, smiled grimly and obeyed the behest of Zeus the king. For he straightway urged wise Persephone, saying, LL 360-369, go now, Persephone. To your dark-robed mother, go, and feel kindly in your heart towards me, be not so exceedingly cast down, for I shall be no unfitting husband for you among the deathless gods, that a moan brother to Father Zeus. And while you are here, you shall rule all that lives and moves and shall have the greatest rights among the deathless gods those who defraud you and do not appease your power with offerings, reverently performing rites and paying fit gifts, shall be punished for evermore. LL 370-383 When he said this, wise Persephone was filled with joy and hastily sprang up for gladness. But he on his part secretly gave her sweet pomegranate seed to eat, taking care for himself that she might not remain continually with grave, dark-robed Demeter. Then Adonius the ruler of many openly got ready his deathless horses beneath the golden chariot. And she mounted on the chariot and the strong slayer of Argus took reins and whip in his dear hands and drove forth from the hall, the horses speeding readily. Swiftly they traversed their long course, and neither the sea nor river waters nor grassy glens nor mountain peaks checked the career of the immortal horses, but they clave the deep air above them as they went. 
and Hermes brought them to the place where rich crown Demeter was staying and checked them before her fragrant temple. LL 384-404 And when Demeter saw them, she rushed forth as does a maenad down some thick wooded mountain, while Persephone on the other side, when she saw her mother's sweet eyes, left the chariot and horses, and leaped down to run to her, and falling upon her neck, embraced her. But while Demeter was still holding her dear child in her arms, her heart suddenly misgave her for some snare, so that she feared greatly and ceased fondling her daughter and asked of her at once, My child, tell me, surely you have not tasted any food while you were below. Speak out and hide nothing, but let us both know. For if you have not, you shall come back from loathly hads and live with me and your father, the dark-clouded son of Kronos and be honoured by all the deathless gods, but if you have tasted food, you must go back again beneath the secret places of the earth, there to dwell a third part of the seasons every year, yet for the two parts you shall be with me and the other deathless gods. But when the earth shall bloom with the fragrant flowers of spring in every kind, then from the realm of darkness and gloom thou shalt come up once more to be a wonder for gods and mortal men. And now tell me how he wrapped you away to the realm of darkness and gloom, and by what trick did the strong host of many beguile you? LL 405-433 Then beautiful Persephone answered her thus, Mother, I will tell you all without error. When luck-bringing Hermes came, swift messenger from my father the son of Kronos and the other sons of heaven, bidding me come back from Erebus that you might see me with your eyes and so cease from your anger and fearful wrath against the gods, I sprang up at once for joy, but he secretly put in my mouth sweet food, a pomegranate seed, and forced me to taste against my will. Also I will tell how he wrapped me away by the deep plan of my father the son of Kronos and carried me off beneath the depths of the earth, and will relate the whole matter as you ask. All we were playing in a lovely meadow, Eleusop 2509 and Pheno and Electra and Eunth. Melita also and Eich with Rhodi and Kolahu and Melabosis and Tich and Ozea, fair as a flower, Chrysis, Ianera, Acast and Admet and Rhodope and Pluto and Charming Calypso, Styx2 was there and Urania and lovely Galaxora with Pallas who rouses battles and Artemis delighting in arrows. We were playing and gathering sweet flowers in our hands, soft crocuses mingled with irises and hyacinths, and rose blooms and lilies, marvellous to see, and the narcissus which the wide earth caused to grow yellow as a crocus. That I plucked in my joy, but the earth parted beneath, and there the strong lord, the host of many, sprang forth and in his golden chariot he bore me away, all unwilling, beneath the earth, then I cried with a shrill cry. All this is true, so though it grieves me to tell the tale. LL 434-437 So did they turn, with hearts at one greatly cheer each the other's soul and spirit with many an embrace, their heart had relief from their griefs while each took and gave back joyousness. LL 438-440 Then bright coiffed Hecate came near to them, and often did she embrace the daughter of holy Demeter, 
and from that time the Lady Hecate was minister and companion to Persephone. LL 441-459 And all-seeing Zeus sent a messenger to them, rich-haired Rhea, to bring dark-cloaked Demeter to join the families of the gods, and he promised to give her what right she should choose among the deathless gods and agreed that her daughter should go down for the third part of the circling year to darkness and gloom but for the two parts should live with her mother and the other deathless gods. Thus he commanded. And the goddess did not disobey the message of Zeus, swiftly she rushed down from the peaks of Olympus and came to the plain of Rimurus, rich, fertile corn land once, but then in no wise fruitful, for it lay idle and utterly leafless because the white grain was hidden by design of trim ankle Demeter. But afterwards, as springtime waxed, it was soon to be waving with long ears of corn, and its rich furrows to be loaded with grain upon the ground, while others would already be bound in sheaves. There first she landed from the fruitless upper air, and glad were the goddesses to see each other and cheered in heart. Then bright coiffed Rhea said to Demeter, LL 460-469, Come, my daughter, for far-seeing Zeus the loud thunderer calls you to join the families of the gods, and has promised to give you what rights you please among the deathless gods and has agreed that for a third part of the circling year your daughter shall go down to darkness and gloom, but for the two parts shall be with you and the other deathless gods, so has he declared it shall be and has bowed his head in token. But come, my child, obey, and be not too angry unrelentingly with the dark-clouded son of Kronos but rather increase forthwith for men the fruit that gives them life. LL 470-482, so spake Rhea. And rich-crowned Demeter did not refuse but straightway made fruit to spring up from the rich lands, so that the whole wide earth was laden with leaves and flowers. Then she went and to the kings who deal justice, Triptolemus and Diocles, the horse driver, and to doughty Eumolpus and Seleus, leader of the people, she showed the conduct of her rights and taught them all her mysteries, to Triptolemus and Polyxenus and Diocles also, awful mysteries which no one may in any way transgress or pry into or utter for deep or of the gods checks the voice. Happy is he among men upon earth who has seen these mysteries, but he who is uninitiate and who has no part in them, never has lot of like good things once he is dead, down in the darkness and gloom. LL 483-489 But when the bright goddess had taught them all, they went to Olympus to the gathering of the other gods. And there they dwell beside Zeus who delights in thunder, awful and reverend goddesses. Right blessed is he among men on earth whom they freely love, soon they do send Plutus as guest to his great house, Plutus who gives wealth to mortal men. LL 490-495 And now, queen of the land of sweet Eleusi and Seagirt Paris and rocky Antron, lady, giver of good gifts, bringer of seasons, queen Deo, be gracious, you and your daughter all beauteous Persephone, and for my song grant me heart-cheering substance. And now I will remember you and another song also. 3 to Delian Apollo, LL 1 to 18, 
I will remember and not be unmindful of Apollo who shoots afar. As he goes through the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him and all spring up from their seats when he draws near, as he bends his bright bow. But Leto alone stays by the side of Zeus who delights in thunder, and then she unstrings his bow, and closes his quiver, and takes his archery from his strong shoulders in her hands and hangs them on a golden peg against a pillar of his father's house. Then she leads him to a seat and makes him sit and the father gives him nectar in a golden cup welcoming his dear son, while the other gods make him sit down there, and queenly Leto rejoices because she bear a mighty son and an archer. Rejoice, blessed Leto, for you bear glorious children, the lord Apollo and Artemis who delights in arrows, her in Ortigia, and him in rocky Delos as you rested against the great mass of the Cynthian hill hard by a palm tree by the streams of Inopus. LL 19-29 How, then, shall I sing of you who in all ways are a worthy theme of song? For everywhere, Ophbus, the whole range of song is fallen to you, both over the mainland that rears heifers and over the isles. All mountain peaks and high headlands of lofty hills and rivers flowing out to the deep and beaches sloping seawards and havens of the sea are your delight. Shall I sing how at the first Leto bear you to be the joy of men, as she rested against Mount Synthus in that rocky isle, in sea-girt Delos? while on either hand a dark wave rolled on landwards driven by shrill winds? Whence arising you rule over all mortal men. LL 30-50 Among those who are in Crete, and in the township of Athens, and in the Isle of Aegina and Euboea, famous for ships, in Ege and Iazi and Peperethus near the sea, in Thracian Athos and Pelion's towering heights and Thracian Samos and the shady hills of Ida in Soos and Phocia and the high hill of Autocane and fair-lying Imbros and smouldering Lemos and rich Ilspos, home of Maca, the son of Aeolus, and Chios, brightest of all the isles that lie in the sea, and craggy Mamas, and the heights of Corycus and gleaming Claros and the sheer hill of Isagia and watered Samos and the steep heights of Mycale in Miletus and Kos, the city of Meropian men, and steep Knidos and windy Carpathos, in Naxos and Paris and rocky Renaia, so far roamed Leto in travail with the god who shoots afar, to see if any land would be willing to make a dwelling for her son. But they greatly trembled and feared, and none, not even the richest of them, dared receive Phbus, until queenly Leto set foot on Delos and uttered winged words and asked her, LL 51-61, Delos, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son Phbus Apollo and make him a rich temple, for no other will touch you, as you will find, and I think you will never be rich in oxen and sheep nor bear vintage nor yet produce plants abundantly. But if you have the temple of far-shooting Apollo, all men will bring you hecatombs and gather here, and incessant savour of rich sacrifice will always arise, and you will feed those who dwell in you from the hand of strangers, for truly your own soil is not rich. LL 62-82 so spake Leto. And Delos rejoiced and answered and said, Leto, most glorious daughter of great Coeus, joyfully would I receive your child the far-shooting lord, for it is all too true that I am ill-spoken of among men, whereas thus I should become very greatly honoured. 
But this saying I fear, and I will not hide it from you, Leto. They say that Apollo will be one that is very haughty and will greatly lord it among gods and men all over the fruitful earth. Therefore, I greatly fear in heart and spirit that as soon as he sets the light of the sun, he will scorn this island, for truly I have but a hard, rocky soil, and overturn me and thrust me down with his feet in the depths of the sea. Then will the great ocean wash deep above my head forever, and he will go to another land such as will please him, there to make his temple and wooded groves. So, many-footed creatures of the sea will make their lairs in me and black seals their dwellings undisturbed, because I lack people. Yet if you will but dare to swear a great oath, goddess, that here first he will build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men, then let him afterwards make temples and wooded groves amongst all men, for surely he will be greatly renowned. LL 83-88, so said Delos. And Leto swear the great oath of the gods, now hear this, earth and wide heaven above and dropping water of Styx. This is the strongest and most awful oath for the blessed gods. Shulifbus shall have here his fragrant altar and precinct, and you he shall honor above all. LL 89-101 Now when Leto had sworn and ended her oath, Delos was very glad at the birth of the far-shooting lord. But Leto was racked nine days and nine nights with pangs beyond wont. And there were with her all the chiefest of the goddesses, Dion and Rhea and Ignaea and Themis and loud-moaning Amphitrite and the other deathless goddesses save white-armed Hera, who sat in the halls of cloud-gathering Zeus. Only Aletheia, goddess of sore travail, had not heard of Leto's trouble, for she sat on the top of Olympus beneath golden clouds by white-armed Hera's contriving, who kept her close through envy, because Leto with the lovely tresses was soon to bear a son faultless and strong. LL 102-114 But the goddesses sent out Iris from the well-set isle to bring Aletheia promising her a great necklace strung with golden threads, nine cubits long. And they bade Iris call her aside from white-armed Hera, lest she might afterwards turn her from coming with her words. When swift Iris, fleet of foot as the wind, had heard all this, she set to run and quickly finishing all the distance she came to the home of the gods, sheer Olympus, and forthwith called Aletheia out from the hall to the door and spoke winged words to her, telling her all as the goddesses who dwell on Olympus had bidden her. So she moved the heart of Aletheia in her dear breast, and they went their way, like shy wild doves in their going. LL 115 to 122, and as soon as Aletheia the goddess of sore travail set foot on Delos, the pains of birth seized Leto, and she longed to bring forth, so she cast her arms about a palm tree and kneeled on the soft meadow while the earth laughed for joy beneath. Then the child leaped forth to the light and all the goddesses washed you purely and cleanly with sweet water, and swathed you in a white garment of fine texture, new woven, and fastened a golden band about you. LL 123-130 Now Leto did not give Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, her breast but Themis duly poured nectar and ambrosia with her divine hands, and Leto was glad because she had borne a strong son and an archer. 
but as soon as you had tasted that divine heavenly food, Ophbus, you could no longer then be held by golden cords nor confined with bands, but all their ends were undone. Forthwith Phbus Apollo spoke out among the deathless goddesses, LL 131-132, The lyre and the curved bow shall ever be dear to me, and I will declare to men the unfailing will of Zeus. LL 133-139, So said Phbus. The long-haired god who shoots afar and began to walk upon the wide path dearth, and all goddesses were amazed at him. Then with gold all Delos was laden, beholding the child of Zeus and Leto, for joy because the god chose her above the islands and sure to make his dwelling in her, and she loved him yet more in her heart and blossomed as does a mountain top with woodland flowers. LL 140-164 And you, O Lord Apollo, God of the silver bow, shooting afar, now walked on craggy synthus, and now kept wandering about the island and the people in them. Many are your temples and wooded groves and all peaks and towering bluffs of lofty mountains and rivers flowing to the sea are dear to you, Phbus, yet in Delos do you most delight your heart, for there the long-robed Ionians gather in your honour with their children and shy wives, mindful, they delight you with boxing and dancing and song, so often as they hold their gathering. A man would say that they were deathless and unaging if he should then come upon the Ionians so met together. For he would see the graces of them all, and would be pleased in heart gazing at the men and well-girded women with their swift ships and great wealth. And there is this great wonder besides, and its renown shall never perish, the girls of Delos handmaidens of the far shooter, for when they have praised Apollo first, and also Leto and Artemis who delights in arrows, they sing a strain telling of men and women of past days, and charm the tribes of men. Also they can imitate the tongues of all men and their clattering speech, each would say that he himself were singing, so close to truth is their sweet song. LL 165 to 178 And now may Apollo be favorable and Artemis and farewell all you maidens Remember me in after time whenever any one of men on earth a stranger who has seen and suffered much comes here and asks of you whom think ye girls is the sweetest singer that comes here and in whom do you most delight? Then answer, each and all, with one voice, he is a blind man, and dwells in rocky chios, his lays are evermore supreme. As for me, I will carry your renown as far as I roam over the earth to the well-placed this thing is true. And I will never cease to praise far-shooting Apollo, god of the silver bow whom rich-haired Leto bear. To Pythian Apollo, LL 179-181, O Lord, Lycia is yours and lovely Maeonia and Miletus, charming city by the sea, but over wave-girt Delos you greatly reign your own self. LL 182-206 Leto's all-glorious son goes to rocky Pytho, playing upon his hollow lyre, clad in divine, perfumed garments, and at the touch of the golden key his lyre sings sweet. Thence, swift as thought, he speeds from earth to Olympus, to the house of Zeus, to join the gathering of the other gods. Then straightway the undying gods think only of the lyre and song, 
and all the muses together, voice sweetly answering voice, him the unending gifts the gods enjoy and the sufferings of men, all that they endure at the hands of the deathless gods, and how they live witless and helpless and cannot find healing for death or defense against old age. Meanwhile the rich tressed graces and cheerful seasons dance with Harmonia and Hebe and Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, holding each other by the wrist. And among them sings one, not mean nor puny, but tall to look upon and enviable in mien, Artemis who delights in arrows, sister of Apollo. Among them sport Ars and the keen-eyed slayer of Argus, while Apollo plays his lyre stepping high and featly and a radiance shines around him, the gleaming of his feet and close-woven vest. And they, even gold-tressed Leto and wise Zeus, rejoice in their great hearts as they watch their dear son playing among the undying gods. LL 207-228 How then shall I sing of you, though in all ways you are a worthy theme for song? Shall I sing of you as wooer and in the fields of love, how you went wooing the daughter of Arzan along with godlike Ischis the son of well-horsed Elatius, or with Forbes sprung from Triopes, or with Reuthius? or with Lucippus and the wife of Lucippus. Lacuna, you on foot, he with his chariot, yet he fell not short of triopes. Or shall I sing how at the first you went about the earth seeking a place of oracle for men, O far shooting Apollo? To Peria first you went down from Olympus and passed by Sandy Lectus and Aeneani and through the land of the Peribi. Soon you came to Iolcus and set foot on Sanum in Euboea, famed for ships, you stood in the Lelantine plain, but it pleased not your heart to make a temple there and wooded groves. From there you crossed the Euripus, far shooting Apollo and went up the green, holy hills, going on to Mycalesus and grass-abedded Teumissus, and so came to the wood-clad abode of Thub, for as yet no man lived in holy Thub, nor were there tracks or ways about Thub's wheat-bearing plain as yet. LL 229-238 And further still you went, O far-shooting Apollo, and came to Onchistus, Poseidon's bright grove, there the new-broken colt distressed withdrawing the trim chariot gets spirit again, and the skilled driver springs from his car and goes on his way. Then the horses for a while rattle the empty car, being rid of guidance, and if they break the chariot in the woody grove, Men look after the horses, but tilt the chariot and leave it there, for this was the right from the very first. And the drivers pray to the lord of the shrine, but the chariot falls to the lot of the god. LL 239-243 Further yet you went, O far-shooting Apollo and reached next Cephissus' sweet stream which pours forth its sweet flowing water from Lilia, and crossing over it, O worker from afar, you passed many towered Ocalia and reached grassy Haliotus. LL 244-253 Then you went towards Telfusa and there the pleasant place seemed fit for making a temple and wooded grove. You came very near and spoke to her, Tell Fusa, here I am minded to make a glorious temple, an oracle for men, and hither they will always bring perfect hecatombs, both those who live in rich Peloponnesus and those of Europe and all the wave-washed isles, coming to seek oracles. 
and I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail, giving answer in my rich temple. LL 254-276 So said Phbus Apollo, and laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long. But when Telfusa saw this, she was angry in heart and spoke, saying, Lord Phbus, worker from afar, I will speak a word of counsel to your heart, since you are minded to make here a glorious temple to be an oracle for men who will always bring hither perfect hecatombs for you, yet I will speak out, and do you lay up my words in your heart. The trampling of swift horses and the sound of mules watering at my sacred springs will always irk you, and men will like better to gaze at the well-made chariots and stamping, swift-footed horses than at your great temple and the many treasures that are within. But if you will be moved by me, for you, Lord, are stronger and mightier than I and your strength is very great, build at Chrysa below the glades of Parnassus, there no bright chariot will clash, and there will be no noise of swift-footed horses near your well-built altar. But so the glorious tribes of men will bring gifts to you as a peon, hail healer, and you will receive with delight rich sacrifices from the people dwelling round about. So said Telfusa, that she alone, and not the far shooter, should have renown there, and she persuaded the far shooter. LL 277 to 286. Further yet you went, far shooting Apollo, until you came to the town of the presumptuous Phlegioi who dwell on this earth in a lovely glade near the Cephisian lake caring not for Zeus. And thence you went speeding swiftly to the mountain ridge, and came to Chrysa beneath snowy Parnassus, a foothill turned towards the west, a cliff hangs over it from above, and a hollow, rugged glade runs under. There the Lord Phbus Apollo resolved to make his lovely temple, and thus he said, LL 287 to 293 In this place I am minded to build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men and here they will always bring perfect hecatombs both they who dwell in rich Peloponnesus and the men of Europe and from all the wave-washed isles coming to question me and I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail, answering them in my rich temple. LL 294-299 When he had said this, Phbus Apollo laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long, and upon these the sons of Virginus, Trophonius and Agamedes, dear to the deathless gods laid a footing of stone. And the countless tribes of men built the whole temple of wrought stones, to be sung of forever. LL 300-310 But nearby was a sweet flowing spring, and there with his strong bow the Lord, the son of Zeus, killed the bloated, great she-dragon, a fierce monster wont to do great mischief to men upon earth, to men themselves and to their thin-shanked sheep, for she was a very bloody plague. She it was who once received from gold-throned Hera and brought up fell, cruel Typhon to be a plague to men. Once on a time Hera bare him because she was angry with Father Zeus when the son of Kronos bare all-glorious Athena in his head. Thereupon queenly Hera was angry and spoke thus among the assembled gods, LL 311-330, Hear from me, all gods and goddesses, 
how cloud gathering Zeus begins to dishonor me wantonly, when he has made me his true hearted wife. See now, apart from me, he has given birth to bright eyed Athena, who is foremost among all the blessed gods. But my son Hephaestus, whom I bear, was weakly among all the blessed gods and shriveled of foot, a shame and disgrace to me in heaven whom I myself took in my hands and cast out so that he fell in the great sea. But silver-shod Thetis the daughter of Nereus took and cared for him with her sisters, would that she had done other service to the blessed gods. O wicked one and crafty! What else will you now devise? How dared you by yourself give birth to bright-eyed Athena? Would not I have borne you a child, I, who was at least called your wife among the undying gods who hold wide heaven? Beware now lest I devise some evil thing for you hereafter, yes, now I will contrive that a son be born me to be foremost among the undying gods, and that without casting shame on the holy bond of wedlock between you and me. And I will not come to your bed, but will consort with the blessed gods far off from you. LL 331-333 When she had so spoken, she went apart from the gods, being very angry. Then straightway large-eyed queenly Hera prayed, striking the ground flatwise with her hand and speaking thus, LL 334-362, Hear now, I pray, earth and white heaven above, and you titan gods who dwell beneath the earth about great Tartarus, and from whom are sprung both gods and men. Hearken you now to me, one and all, and grant that I may bear a child apart from Zeus no whit lesser than him in strength, nay, let him be as much stronger than Zeus as all-seeing Zeus than Kronos. Thus she cried and lashed the earth with her strong hand. Then the life-giving earth was moved, and when Hera saw it she was glad in heart, for she thought her prayer would be fulfilled. And thereafter she never came to the bed of wise Zeus for a full year, not to sit in her carved chair as aforetime to plan wise counsel for him, but stayed in her temples where many pray, and delighted in her offerings, large-eyed queenly Hera. But when the months and days were fulfilled and the seasons duly came on as the earth moved round, she bare one neither like the gods nor mortal men, fell, cruel Typhon, to be a plague to men. Straightway large-eyed queenly Hera took him and bringing one evil thing to another such, gave him to the dragoness, and she received him. And this Typhon used to work great mischief among the famous tribes of men. Whosoever met the dragoness, the day of doom would sweep him away, until the Lord Apollo, who deals death from afar, shot a strong arrow at her. Then she, rent with bitter pangs, lay drawing great gasps for breath and rolling about that place. An awful noise swelled up unspeakable as she writhed continually this way and that amid the wood and so she left her life, breathing it forth in blood. Then Phbus Apollo boasted over her, LL 363-369, now rot here upon the soil that feeds man. You at least shall live no more to be a fell bane to men who eat the fruit of the all-nourishing earth, and who will bring hither perfect hecatombs. Against cruel death neither typhus shall avail you nor ill-famed chimera, 
but here shall the earth and shining Hyperion make you rot. LL 370-374 Thus said Phbus, exulting over her, and darkness covered her eyes. And the holy strength of Helios made her rot away there, wherefore the place is now called Pytho, and men call the Lord Apollo by another name, Pythian, because on that spot the power of piercing Helios made the monster rot away. LL 375-378 Then Phbus Apollo saw that the sweet flowing spring had beguiled him, and he started out in anger against Telfusa, and soon coming to her, he stood close by and spoke to her. LL 379 to 381. Tell Fusa, you were not, after all, to keep to yourself this lovely place by deceiving my mind, and pour forth your clear flowing water. Here my renown shall also be and not yours alone. LL 382 to 387. Thus spoke the Lord, far-working Apollo, and pushed over upon her a crag with a shower of rocks, hiding her streams, and he made himself an altar in a wooded grove very near the clear flowing stream. In that place all men pray to the Great One by the name Telfusian, because he humbled the stream of holy Telfusa. LL 388-439 Then Phbus Apollo pondered in his heart what men he should bring in to be his ministers in sacrifice and to serve him in rocky pytho. And while he considered this, he became aware of a swift ship upon the wine-like sea in which were many men and goodly. Cretans from Knossos 2510, the city of Minos, they who do sacrifice to the prince and announce his decrees, whatsoever Phbus Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, speaks in answer from his laurel tree below the dells of Parnassus. These men were sailing in their black ship for traffic and for profit to Sandy Pylos and to the men of Pylos. But Phbus Apollo met them, in the open sea he sprang upon their swift ship, like a dolphin in shape, and lay there, a great and awesome monster, and none of them gave heed so as to understand 2511 but they sought to cast the dolphin overboard. But he kept shaking the black ship every way and make the timbers quiver. So they sat silent in their craft for fear, and did not lose the sheets throughout the black, hollow ship, nor lowered the sail of their dark proud vessel, but as they had set it first of all with ox-hide ropes, so they kept sailing on for a rushing south wind hurried on the swift ship from behind. First they passed by Malia, and then along the Laconian coast they came to Tainarum, sea-garlanded town and country of Helios who gladdens men, where the thick-fleeced sheep of the Lord Helios feed continually and occupy a gladsome country. There they wished to put their ship to shore and land and comprehend the great marvel and see with their eyes whether the monster would remain upon the deck of the hollow ship, or spring back into the briny deep where fishes shoal. But the well-built ship would not obey the helm, but went on its way all along Peloponnesus, and the Lord, far-working Apollo, guided it easily with the breath of the breeze. So the ship ran on its course and came to Arena and lovely Argypha and Threon, the ford of Alpheus, and well-placed Epi and Sandy Pylos and the men of Pylos. Past Cruni it went and Chalcis and past Dim and Fair Elis, where the Epe rule. 
and at the time when she was making forth a re, exulting in the breeze from Zeus, there appeared to them below the clouds the steep mountain of Ithaca, and Dulichium and same and wooded Zacynthus. But when they were passed by all the coast of Peloponnesus, then, towards Chrysa, that vast gulf began to heave in sight which through all its length cuts off the rich isle of Pelops. There came on them a strong, clear west wind by ordinance of Zeus and blew from heaven vehemently, that with all speed the ship might finish coursing over the briny water of the sea. So they began again to voyage back towards the dawn and the sun, and the Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, led them on until they reached Farsene Chrysa, land of vines, and into Haven, there the sea-coursing ship grounded on the sands. LL 440-451 Then, like a star at noonday, the Lord far-working Apollo, leaped from the ship, flashes of fire flew from him thick and their brightness reached to heaven. He entered into his shrine between priceless tripods, and there made a flame to flare up bright, showing forth the splendor of his shafts, so that their radiance filled all Chrysa and the wives and well-girded daughters of the Chryseans raised a cry at that outburst of Phbus, for he cast great fear upon them all. From his shrine he sprang forth again, swift as a thought, to speed again to the ship, bearing the form of a man, brisk and sturdy, in the prime of his youth, while his broad shoulders were covered with his hair. And he spoke to the Cretans, uttering winged words, LL 452-461, Strangers, who are you? Whence come you sailing along the paths of the sea? Are you for traffic, or do you wander at random over the sea as pirates do who put their own lives to hazard and bring mischief to men of foreign parts as they roam? Why rest you so and are afraid, and do not go ashore nor stow the gear of your black ship? For that is the custom of men who live by bread, whenever they come to land in their dark ships from the main, spent with toil, at once desire for sweet food catches them about the heart. LL 462-473 So speaking, he put courage in their hearts, and the master of the Cretans answered him and said, Stranger, though you are nothing like mortal men in shape or stature, but are as the deathless gods, hail and all happiness to you, and may the gods give you good. Now tell me truly that I may surely know it, what country is this, and what land? and what men live herein. As for us, with thoughts set otherwards, we were sailing over the great sea to Pylos from Crete, for from there we declare that we are sprung, but now are come on shipboard to this place by no means willingly, another way and other paths, and gladly would we return. But one of the deathless gods brought us here against our will. LL 474-501 Then far-working Apollo answered then and said, Strangers who once dwelt about wooded Knossos but now shall return no more each to his loved city and fair house and dear wife, here shall you keep my rich temple that is honored by many men. I am the son of Zeus, Apollo is my name. But you I brought here over the wide gulf of the sea, meaning you no hurt, nay, here you shall keep my rich temple that is greatly honored among men, and you shall know the plans of the deathless gods, and by their will you shall be honored continually for all time. And now come, 
make haste and do as I say. First loose the sheets and lower the sail, and then draw the swift ship up upon the land. Take out your goods and the gear of the straight ship, and make an altar upon the beach of the sea, light fire upon it and make an offering of white meal. Next, stand side by side around the altar and pray, and inasmuch as at the first on the hazy sea I sprang upon the swift ship in the form of a dolphin, pray to me as Apollo Delphinius. Also the altar itself shall be called Delphinius and overlooking 2,512 forever. Afterwards, sup beside your dark ship and pour an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. But when you have put away craving for sweet food, come with me singing the hymn Iepian, Hail, Healer until you come to the place where you shall keep my rich temple. LL 502-523, so said Apollo. And they readily hearkened to him and obeyed him. First they unfastened the sheets and let down the sail and lowered the mast by the four stays upon the mast rest. Then, landing upon the beach of the sea, they hauled up the ship from the water to dry land and fixed long stays under it. Also they made an altar upon the beach of the sea, and when they had lit a fire, made an offering of white meal, and prayed standing around the altar as Apollo had bidden them. Then they took their meal by the swift, black ship, and poured an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. And when they had put away craving for drink and food, they started out with the Lord Apollo, the son of Zeus, to lead them, holding a lyre in his hands, and playing sweetly as he stepped high and featly. So the Cretans followed him to Pytho, marching in time as they chanted the Iepian after the manner of the Cretan Pian singers and of those in whose hearts the heavenly muse has put sweet-voiced song. With tireless feet they approached the ridge and straightway came to Parnassus and the lovely place where they were to dwell honoured by many men. There Apollo brought them and showed them his most holy sanctuary and rich temple. LL 524-525 But their spirit was stirred in their dear breasts, and the master of the Cretans asked him, saying, LL 526-530, Lord, since you have brought us here far from our dear ones and our fatherland, for so it seemed good to your heart, tell us now how we shall live. That we would know of you. This land is not to be desired either for vineyards or for pastures so that we can live well thereon and also minister to men. LL 531-544 Then Apollo, the son of Zeus, smiled upon them and said, Foolish mortals and poor drudges are you, that you seek cares and hard toils and straits. Easily will I tell you a word and set it in your hearts. Though each one of you with knife in hand should slaughter sheep continually, yet would you always have abundant store, even all that the glorious tribes of men bring here for me. But guard you my temple and receive the tribes of men that gather to this place, and especially show mortal men my will, and do you keep righteousness in your heart. But if any shall be disobedient and pay no heed to my warning, or if there shall be any idle word or deed and outrage as is common among mortal men, then other men shall be your masters and with a strong hand shall make you subject forever. All has been told you, 
Do you keep it in your heart? LL 545 to 546, and so, farewell, son of Zeus and Leto, but I will remember you and another him also. 4 to Hermes, LL 1 to 29, Muse, sing of Hermes, the son of Zeus and Maia, lord of Kaline and Arcadia rich in flocks the luck-bringing messenger of the immortals whom Maya bear, the rich-tressed nymph, when she was joined in love with Zeus, a shy goddess, for she avoided the company of the blessed gods, and lived within a deep, shady cave. There the son of Kronos used to lie with the rich-tressed nymph, unseen by deathless gods and mortal men at dead of night while sweet sleep should hold white-armed Hera fast. And when the purpose of great Zeus was fixed in heaven, she was delivered and a notable thing was come to pass. For then she bare a son, of many shifts, blandly cunning, a robber, a cattle driver, a bringer of dreams, a watcher by night, a thief at the gates one who was soon to show forth wonderful deeds among the deathless gods. Born with the dawning, at midday he played on the lyre, and in the evening he stole the cattle of far-shooting Apollo on the fourth day of the month, for on that day queenly Maya bare him. So soon as he had leaped from his mother's heavenly womb, he lay not long waiting in his holy cradle but he sprang up and sought the oxen of Apollo. But as he stepped over the threshold of the high-roofed cave, he found a tortoise there and gained endless delight. For it was Hermes who first made the tortoise a singer. The creature fell in his way at the courtyard gate, where it was feeding on the rich grass before the dwelling, waddling along. When he saw it, the luck-bringing son of Zeus laughed and said, LL 30-38, an omen of great luck for me so soon. I do not slight it. Hail, come rid of the feast, lovely in shape, sounding at the dance. With joy I meet you. Where got you that rich gourd for covering? that spangled shell, a tortoise living in the mountains. But I will take and carry you within, you shall help me and I will do you no disgrace, though first of all you must profit me. It is better to be at home, harm may come out of doors. Living, you shall be a spell against mischievous witchcraft 2513. But if you die, then you shall make sweetest song. LL 39-61 Thus speaking, he took up the tortoise in both hands and went back into the house carrying his charming toy. Then he cut off its limbs and scooped out the marrow of the mountain tortoise with a scoop of grey iron. As a swift thought darts through the heart of a man when thronging cares haunt him, or as bright glances flash from the eye, so glorious Hermes planned both thought and deed at once. He cut stalks of reed to measure and fixed them, fastening their ends across the back and through the shell of the tortoise, and then stretched ox hide all over it by his skill. Also he put in the horns and fitted a cross piece upon the two of them, and stretched seven strings of sheep gut. But when he had made it he proved each string in turn with the key, as he held the lovely thing. At the touch of his hand it sounded marvelously, and, as he tried it, the god sang sweet random snatches even as youth's bandy taunts at festivals. He sang of Zeus the son of Kronos and neat shod Maya, 
the converse which they had before in the comradeship of love, telling all the glorious tale of his own begetting. He celebrated, too, the handmaids of the nymph, and her bright home, and the tripods all about the house, and the abundant cauldrons. LL 62-67, but while he was singing of all these, his heart was bent on other matters. And he took the hollow lyre and laid it in his sacred cradle, and sprang from the sweet-smelling hall to a watch-place, pondering sheer trickery in his heart, deeds such as navish folk pursue in the dark night time, for he longed to taste flesh. LL 68-86 The sun was going down beneath the earth towards ocean with his horses and chariot when Hermes came hurrying to the shadowy mountains of Peria, where the divine cattle of the blessed gods had their steads and grazed the pleasant, unmown meadows. Of these the son of Maya the sharp-eyed slayer of Argus then cut off from the herd fifty loud lowing kine, and drove them straggling wise across a sandy place, turning their hoof prints aside. Also, he bethed out him of a crafty ruse and reversed the marks of their hoofs, making the front behind and the hind before while he himself walked the other way 2514. Then he wove sandals with wicker work by the sand of the sea, wonderful things, untout of, unimagined, for he mixed together tamarisk and myrtle twigs, fastening together an armful of their fresh, young wood, and tied them leaves and all securely under his feet as light sandals. The brushwood the glorious slayer of Argus plucked in Peria as he was preparing for his journey, making shift 2515 as one making haste for a long journey. LL 87-89 but an old man tilling his flowering vineyard saw him as he was hurrying down the plain through grassy Onchistus. So the son of Maya began and said to him, LL 90-93, Old man, digging about your vines with bowed shoulders, surely you shall have much wine when all these bear fruit. If you obey me and strictly remember not to have seen what you have seen, and not to have heard what you have heard, and to keep silent when nothing of your own is harmed. LL 94-114 When he had said this much, he hurried the strong cattle on together, through many shadowy mountains and echoing gorges and flowery plains glorious Hermes drove them. And now the divine knight, his dark ally, was mostly past, and dawn that sets folk to work was quickly coming on, while bright Selene, daughter of the Lord Polus, Megamedes' son, had just climbed her watch post when the strong son of Zeus drove the wide-browed cattle of Phus Apollo to the river Alpheus. And they came unwearied to the high-roofed byres and the drinking troughs that were before the noble meadow. Then, after he had well fed the loud bellowing cattle with fodder and driven them into the byre, close-packed and chewing lotus and began to seek the art of fire. He chose a stout laurel branch and trimmed it with the knife. Lacuna, 2516, held firmly in his hand, and the hot smoke rose up. For it was Hermes who first invented fire sticks and fire. Next he took many dried sticks and piled them thick and plenty in a sunken trench and flame began to glow, spreading afar the blast of fierce burning fire. LL 115-137, to 
and while the strength of glorious Hephaestus was beginning to kindle the fire, he dragged out two lowing, horned cows close to the fire, for great strength was with him. He threw them both panting upon their backs on the ground, and rolled them on their sides, bending their necks over 2,517, and pierced their vital cord. Then he went on from task to task, first he cut up the rich, fat meat, and pierced it with wooden spits, and roasted flesh and the honorable chine and the paunch full of dark blood all together. He laid them there upon the ground, and spread out the hides on a rugged rock, and so they are still there many ages afterwards, a long, long time after all this, and are continually 2,518. Next glad-hearted Hermes dragged the rich meats he had prepared and put them on a smooth, flat stone, and divided them into twelve portions distributed by lot, making each portion wholly honorable. Then glorious Hermes longed for the sacrificial meat, for the sweet savor wearied him, God though he was, nevertheless his proud heart was not prevailed upon to devour the flesh, although he greatly desired 2,519. But he put away the fat and all the flesh in the high-roofed byre, placing them high up to be a token of his youthful theft. And after that he gathered dry sticks and utterly destroyed with fire all the hoofs and all the heads. LL 138 to 154, and when the god had duly finished all, he threw his sandals into deep eddying Alpheus, and quenched the embers, covering the black ashes with sand and so spent the night while Selene's soft light shone down. Then the god went straight back again at dawn to the bright crests of Kaleen, and no one met him on the long journey either of the blessed gods or mortal men, nor did any dog bark. And luck bringing Hermes, the son of Zeus, passed edgeways through the keyhole of the hole like the autumn breeze, even as mist, straight through the cave he went and came to the rich inner chamber, walking softly, and making no noise as one might upon the floor. Then glorious Hermes went hurriedly to his cradle, wrapping his swaddling clothes about his shoulders as though he were a feeble babe, and lay playing with the covering about his knees but at his left hand he kept close his sweet lyre. LL 155-161 But the god did not pass unseen by the goddess his mother, but she said to him, How now, you rogue? Whence come you back so at night time, you that wear shamelessness as a garment? And now I surely believe the son of Leto will soon have you forth out of doors with unbreakable cords about your ribs, or you will live a rope's life in the glens robbing by wiles. Go to, then, your father got you to be a great worry to mortal men and deathless gods. LL 162-181 then Hermes answered her with crafty words, Mother, why do you seek to frighten me like a feeble child whose heart knows few words of blame, a fearful babe that fears its mother's scolding? Nay, but I will try whatever plan is best, and so feed myself and you continually. We will not be content to remain here, as you bid alone of all the gods unfeedy with offerings and prayers. Better to live in fellowship with the deathless gods continually, rich, wealthy, and enjoying stories of grain, than to sit always in a gloomy cave, and, 
as regards honor, I too will enter upon the right that Apollo has. If my father will not give it to me, I will seek, and I am able, to be a prince of robbers. And if Leto's most glorious son shall seek me out, I think another and a greater loss will befall him. For I will go to Pytho to break into his great house, and will plunder there from splendid tripods, and cauldrons, and gold, and plenty of bright iron, and much apparel, and you shall see it if you will. LL 182-189 With such words they spoke together, the son of Zeus who holds the Aegis, and the Lady Maya. Now Eros the early born was rising from deep flowing ocean, bringing light to men, when Apollo, as he went, came to Onchistus, the lovely grove and sacred place of the loud roaring holder of the earth. There he found an old man grazing his beast along the pathway from his courtyard fence, and the all-glorious son of Leto began and said to him, LL 190-200, Old Man, Weeder 2520 of Grassi on Chistus, I am come here from Peria seeking cattle, cows all of them, all with curving horns, from my herd. The black bull was grazing alone away from the rest, but fierce-eyed hounds followed the cows, four of them, all of one mind, like men. These were left behind, the dogs and the bull, which is great marvel, but the cows strayed out of the soft meadow, away from the pasture when the sun was just going down. Now tell me this, old man born long ago, have you seen one passing along behind those cows? LL 201-211 Then the old man answered him and said, My son, it is hard to tell all that one's eyes see, for many wayfarers pass to and fro this way, some bent on much evil, and some on good, it is difficult to know each one. However, I was digging about my plot of vineyard all day long until the sun went down, and I thought, good sir, but I do not know for certain, that I marked a child, whoever the child was, that followed long-horned cattle, an infant who had a staff and kept walking from side to side, he was driving them backwards way, with their heads toward him. LL 212 to 218, so said the old man. And when Apollo heard this report, he went yet more quickly on his way, and presently, seeing a long-winged bird, he knew at once by that omen that thief was the child of Zeus the son of Cronos. So the Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, hurried on to goodly Pilo seeking his shambling oxen, and he had his broad shoulders covered with a dark cloud. But when the far shooter perceived the tracks, he cried, LL 219-226, oh, oh! Truly this is a great marvel that my eyes behold. These are indeed the tracks of straight horned oxen, but they are turned backwards towards the flowery meadow. But these others are not the footprints of man or woman or grey wolves or bears or lions, nor do I think they are the tracks of a rough-maned centaur, whoever it be that with swift feet makes such monstrous footprints, wonderful are the tracks on this side of the way but yet more wonderfully are those on that. LL 227-234 When he had so said, the Lord Apollo, 
the son of Zeus hastened on and came to the forest-clad mountain of Kaleen and the deep-shadowed cave in the rock where the divine nymph brought forth the child of Zeus who is the son of Kronos. A sweet odor spread over the lovely hill, and many thin-shanked sheep were grazing on the grass. Then far-shooting Apollo himself stepped down in haste over the stone threshold into the dusky cave. LL 235-253 Now when the son of Zeus and Maia saw Apollo in a rage about his cattle, he snuggled down in his fragrant swaddling clothes, and as wood ash covers over the deep embers of tree stumps, so Hermes cuddled himself up when he saw the far shooter. He squeezed head and hands and feet together in a small space, like a newborn child seeking sweet sleep, though in truth he was wide awake, and he kept his lyre under his armpit. But the son of Leto was aware and failed not to perceive the beautiful mountain nymph and her dear son albeit a little child and swathed so craftily. He peered in every corner of the great dwelling and, taking a bright key, he opened three closets full of nectar and lovely ambrosia. And much gold and silver was stored in them, and many garments of the nymph, some purple and some silvery white such as are kept in the sacred houses of the blessed gods. Then, after the son of Leto had searched out the recesses of the great house, he spake to glorious Hermes, LL 254-259, Child, lying in the cradle, make haste and tell me of my cattle, or we two will soon fall out angrily. For I will take and cast you into dusty Tartarus and awful hopeless darkness, and neither your mother nor your father shall free you or bring you up again to the light, but you will wander under the earth and be the leader amongst little folk. 2521, LL 260 to 277. Then Hermes answered him with crafty words, Son of Leto, what harsh words are these you have spoken? And is it cattle of the field you are come here to seek? I have not seen them, I have not heard of them, no one has told me of them. I cannot give news of them, nor win the reward for news. Am I like a cattle lifter? a stalwart person. This is no task for me, rather I care for other things, I care for sleep, and milk of my mother's breast, and wrappings round my shoulders, and warm baths. Let no one hear the cause of this dispute, for this would be a great marvel indeed among the deathless gods that a child newly born should pass in through the forepart of the house with cattle of the field, herein you speak extravagantly. I was born yesterday, and my feet are soft and the ground beneath is rough, nevertheless, if you will have it so, I will swear a great oath by my father's head and vow that neither am I guilty myself. Neither have I seen any other who stole your cows, whatever cows may be, for I know them only by hearsay. LL 278-280 So, then, said Hermes, shooting quick glances from his eyes, and he kept raising his brows and looking this way and that whistling long and listening to Apollo's story as to an idle tale. LL 281-292 But far-working Apollo laughed softly and said to him, O rogue, deceiver, crafty in heart, 
You talk so innocently that I most surely believe that you have broken into many a well-built house and stripped more than one poor wretch bare this night 2522, gathering his goods together all over the house without noise. You will plague many a lonely herdsman in mountain glades, when you come on herds and thick-fleeced sheep and have a hankering after flesh. But come now, if you would not sleep your last and latest sleep, get out of your cradle, you come rid of dark night. Surely hereafter this shall be your title amongst the deathless gods, to be called the Prince of Robbers continually. LL 293-300 so said Phus Apollo, and took the child and began to carry him. But at that moment the strong slayer of Argus had his plan, and, while Apollo held him in his hands, sent forth an omen, a hard-worked Belisurf, a rude messenger, and sneezed directly after. And when Apollo heard it, he dropped glorious Hermes out of his hands on the ground, then sitting down before him, though he was eager to go on his way, he spoke mockingly to Hermes, LL 301-303, Fear not, little swaddling baby, son of Zeus and Maya. I shall find the strong cattle presently by these omens, and you shall lead the way. LL 304 to 306. When Apollo had so said, Kalenian Hermes sprang up quickly, starting in haste. With both hands he pushed up to his ears the covering that he had wrapped about his shoulders, and said, LL 307 to 312. Where are you carrying me, far worker? hastiest of all the gods. Is it because of your cattle that you are so angry and harass me? Oh dear, would that all the sort of oxen might perish, for it is not I who stole your cows, nor did I see another steal them, whatever cows may be, and of that I have only heard report. Nay, give right and take it before Zeus, the son of Kronos. LL 313-326 So Hermes the shepherd and Leto's glorious son kept stubbornly disputing each article of their quarrel, Apollo, speaking truly. Lacuna, not fairly sought to seize glorious Hermes because of the cows, but he, the Kalenian, tried to deceive the god of the silver bow with tricks and cunning words. But when, though he had many whiles, he found the other had as many shifts, he began to walk across the sand, himself in front, while the son of Zeus and Leto came behind. Soon they came, these lovely children of Zeus, to the top of fragrant Olympus, to their father, the son of Kronos, for there were the scales of judgment set for them both. There was an assembly on snowy Olympus, and the immortals who perish not were gathering after the hour of gold throned dawn. LL 327 to 329. Then Hermes and Apollo of the silver bow stood at the knees of Zeus and Zeus who thunders on high spoke to his glorious son and asked him, LL 330-332, Phbus, whence come you driving this great spoil, a child newborn that has the look of a herald? This is a weighty matter that is come before the council of the gods. LL 333-364 Then the Lord, far-working Apollo, answered him, O my father, 
you shall soon hear no trifling tale though you reproach me that I alone am fond of spoil. Here is a child, a burgling robber, whom I found after a long journey in the hills of Kaleen. For my part I have never seen one so pert either among the gods or all men that catch folk unawares throughout the world. He stole away my cows from their meadow and drove them off in the evening along the shore of the loud roaring sea, making straight for pylos. There were double tracks, and wonderful they were, such as one might marvel at. The doing of a clever sprite, for as for the cows, the dark dust kept and showed their footprints leading towards the flowery meadow, but he himself, bewildering creature, crossed the sandy ground outside the path, not on his feet nor yet on his hands, but, furnished with some other means he trudged his way, wonder of wonders as though one walked on slender oak trees. Now while he followed the cattle across sandy ground, all the tracks showed quite clearly in the dust, but when he had finished the long way across the sand, presently the cow's track and his own could not be traced over the hard ground. But a mortal man noticed him as he drove the wide-browed kine straight towards Pylos. And as soon as he had shut them up quietly, and had gone home by crafty turns and twists, he lay down in his cradle in the gloom of a dim cave, as still as dark night, so that not even an eagle keenly gazing would have spied him. Much he rubbed his eyes with his hands as he prepared falsehood, and himself straightway said roundly, I have not seen them, I have not heard of them, no man has told me of them. I could not tell you of them, nor win the reward of telling. LL 365-367 When he had so spoken, Phus Apollo sat down. But Hermes on his part answered and said, pointing at the son of Kronos, the lord of all the gods, LL 368-386, Zeus, my father, indeed I will speak truth to you, for I am truthful and I cannot tell a lie. He came to our house today looking for his shambling cows, as the sun was newly rising. He brought no witnesses with him nor any of the blessed gods who had seen the theft, but with great violence ordered me to confess, threatening much to throw me into wide Tartarus. For he has the rich bloom of glorious youth, while I was born but yesterday. As he too knows, nor am I like a cattle lifter, a sturdy fellow. Believe my tale, for you claim to be my own father, that I did not drive his cows to my house, so may I prosper, nor cross the threshold, this I say truly. I reverence Helios greatly and the other gods, and you I love and him I dread. You yourself know that I am not guilty, and I will swear a great oath upon it, no. By these rich decked porticos of the gods. And some day I will punish him, strong as he is, for this pitiless inquisition, but now do you help the younger. LL 387-396 so spake the Kalenian, the slayer of Argus, while he kept shooting sidelong glances and kept his swaddling clothes upon his arm, and did not cast them away. But Zeus laughed out loud to see his evil plotting child well and cunningly denying guilt about the cattle. And he bade them both to be of one mind and search for the cattle and guiding Hermes to lead the way and, without mischievousness of heart, 
to show the place where now he had hidden the strong cattle. Then the son of Kronos bowed his head, and goodly Hermes obeyed him, for the will of Zeus who holds the Aegis easily prevailed with him. LL 397-404 Then the two all-glorious children of Zeus hastened both to Sandy Pylos, and reached the ford of Alpheus, and came to the fields and the high-roofed byre where the beasts were cherished at night time. Now while Hermes went to the cave in the rock and began to drive out the strong cattle, the son of Leto, looking aside, saw the cow hides on the sheer rock. And he asked glorious Hermes at once, LL 405-408, How were you able, you crafty rogue, to flay two cows, newborn and babyish as you are? For my part, I dread the strength that will be yours. There is no need you should keep growing long, Kalenian, son of Maya. LL 409-414, so saying, Apollo twisted strong wives with his hands meaning to bind Hermes with firm bands, but the bands would not hold him, and the wives of Ozia fell far from him and began to grow at once from the ground beneath their feet in that very place and intertwining with one another, they quickly grew and covered all the wild roving cattle by the will of thievish Hermes, so that Apollo was astonished as he gazed. LL 414-435 Then the strong slayer of Argus looked furtively upon the ground with eyes flashing fire. Desiring to hide Lacuna, very easily he softened the son of all-glorious Leto as he would, stern though the far shooter was. He took the lyre upon his left arm and tried each string in turn with the key, so that it sounded awesomely at his touch. And Phus Apollo laughed for joy, for the sweet throb of the marvellous music went to his heart and a soft longing took hold on his soul as he listened. Then the son of Maya, harping sweetly upon his lyre, took courage and stood at the left hand of Phus Apollo, and soon, while he played shrilly on his lyre, he lifted up his voice and sang, and lovely was the sound of his voice that followed. He sang the story of the deathless gods and of the dark earth, how at the first they came to be, and how each one received his portion. First among the gods he honoured Mnemosyne, mother of the muses, in his song, for the son of Maya was of her following. And next the goodly son of Zeus hymned the rest of the immortals according to their order in age and told how each was born, mentioning all in order as he struck the lyre upon his arm. But Apollo was seized with a longing not to be allayed, and he opened his mouth and spoke winged words to Hermes, LL 436-462, Slayer of Oxen, Trickster, Busy One, Come rid of the Feast. This song of yours is worth fifty cows, and I believe that presently we shall settle our quarrel peacefully. But come now, tell me this, resourceful son of Maya, has this marvellous thing been with you from your birth, or did some god or mortal man give it you, a noble gift, and teach you heavenly song? For wonderful is this new uttered sound I hear, the like of which I vow that no man nor god dwelling on Olympus ever yet has known but you, O thievish son of Maya. What skill is this? What song for desperate cares? What way of song? For verily here are three things to hand all at once from which to choose, mirth 
and love, and sweet sleep. And though I am a follower of the Olympian muses who love dances and the bright path of song, the full-toned chant and ravishing thrill of flutes, yet I never cared for any of those feats of skill at young men's revels, as I do now for this, I am filled with wonder, O son of Zeus, at your sweet playing. But now, since you, though little, have such glorious skill, sit down, dear boy, and respect the words of your elders. For now you shall have renown among the deathless gods, you and your mother also. This I will declare to you exactly, by this shaft of cornel wood I will surely make you a leader renowned among the deathless gods, and fortunate and will give you glorious gifts and will not deceive you from first to last. LL 463-495 Then Hermes answered him with artful words, You question me carefully, O far worker, yet I am not jealous that you should enter upon my art, this day you shall know it. For I seek to be friendly with you both in thought and word. Now you well know all things in your heart, since you sit foremost among the deathless gods, O son of Zeus, and are goodly and strong. And wise Zeus loves you as all right is, and has given you splendid gifts. And they say that from the utterance of Zeus you have learned both the honours due to the gods, O far worker, and oracles from Zeus, even all his ordinances. Of all these I myself have already learned that you have great wealth. Now, you are free to learn whatever you please, but since, as it seems, your heart is so strongly set on playing the lyre, chant, and play upon it, and give yourself to merriment, taking this as a gift from me, and do you, my friend, bestow glory on me. Sing well with this clear-voiced companion in your hands, for you are skilled in good, well-ordered utterance. From now on bring it confidently to the rich feast and lovely dance and glorious revel a joy by night and by day. Hoso with wit and wisdom enquires of it cunningly, him it teaches through its sound all manner of things that delight the mind, being easily played with gentle familiarities, for it abhors toilsome drudgery, but Hoso in ignorance enquires of it violently, to him it chatters mere vanity and foolishness but you are able to learn whatever you please. So then, I will give you this lyre, glorious son of Zeus, while I for my part will graze down with wild roving cattle the pastures on hill and horse feeding plain, so shall the cows covered by the bulls calve abundantly both males and females. And now there is no need for you, bargainer though you are, to be furiously angry. LL 496-502 When Hermes had said this, he held out the lyre, and Phus Apollo took it, and readily put his shining whip in Hermes' hand, and ordained him keeper of herds. The son of Maya received it joyfully, while the glorious son of Leto, the Lord far-working Apollo, took the lyre upon his left arm and tried each string with the key. Awesomely it sounded at the touch of the god, while he sang sweetly to its note. LL 503-512 Afterwards they too, the all-glorious sons of Zeus turned the cows back towards the sacred meadow but themselves hastened back to snowy Olympus, delighting in the lyre. Then wise Zeus was glad and made them both friends. And Hermes loved the son of Leto continually, 
even as he does now, when he had given the lyre as token to the far shooter, who played it skillfully, holding it upon his arm. But for himself Hermes found out another cunning art and made himself the pipes whose sound is heard afar. LL 513-520 Then the son of Leto said to Hermes, son of Maya, guide and cunning one, I fear you may steal for me the lyre and my curved bow together, for you have an office from Zeus to establish deeds of barter amongst men throughout the fruitful earth. Now if you would only swear me the great oath of the gods, either by nodding your head, or by the potent water of Styx, you would do all that can please and ease my heart. LL 521-549 then Maya's son nodded his head and promised that he would never steal anything of all the far shooter possessed, and would never go near his strong house. But Apollo, son of Leto, swore to be fellow and friend to Hermes, vowing that he would love no other among the immortals, neither god nor man sprung from Zeus, better than Hermes and the father sent forth an eagle in confirmation. And Apollo swear also, Verily I will make you only to be an omen for the immortals and all alike, trusted and honoured by my heart. Moreover, I will give you a splendid staff of riches and wealth, it is of gold, with three branches, and will keep you scathelis, accomplishing every task whether of words or deeds that are good, which I claim to know through the utterance of Zeus. But as forsooth saying, noble, heaven-born child, of which you ask, it is not lawful for you to learn it, nor for any other of the deathless gods, only the mind of Zeus knows that. I am pledged and have vowed and sworn a strong oath that no other of the eternal gods save I should know the wise-hearted counsel of Zeus. And do not you, my brother, bearer of the golden wand, bid me tell those decrees which all-seeing Zeus intends. As for men, I will harm one and profit another, sorely perplexing the tribes of unenviable men. Whosoever shall come guided by the call and flight of birds of sure omen, that man shall have advantage through my voice, and I will not deceive him. But whoso shall trust to idle chattering birds and shall seek to invoke my prophetic art contrary to my will, and to understand more than the eternal gods, I declare that he shall come on an idle journey yet his gifts I would take. LL 550-568 But I will tell you another thing, son of all glorious Maya and Zeus who holds the Aegis, luck-bringing genius of the gods. There are certain holy ones, sisters born, Three virgins 2,523 gifted with wings, their heads are besprinkled with white meal, and they dwell under a ridge of Parnassus. These are teachers of divination apart from me, the art which I practiced while yet a boy following herds, though my father paid no heed to it. From their home they fly now here, now there feeding on honeycomb and bringing all things to pass. And when they are inspired through eating yellow honey, they are willing to speak truth, but if they be deprived of the gods' sweet food, then they speak falsely, as they swarm in and out together. These, then, I give you, inquire of them strictly and delight your heart. And if you should teach any mortal so to do, often will he hear your response, if he have good fortune. Take these, son of Maya, 
and tend the wild roving, horned oxen and horses and patient mules. LL 568A573, so he spake. And from heaven Father Zeus himself gave confirmation to his words, and commanded that glorious Hermes should be lord over all birds of omen and grim-eyed lions, and boars with gleaming tusks, and over dogs and all flocks that the wide earth nourishes, and over all sheep, also that he only should be the appointed messenger to Hads, who, though he takes no gift, shall give him no mean prize. LL 574-578 Thus the Lord Apollo showed his kindness for the son of Maia by all manner of friendship, and the son of Kronos gave him grace besides. He consorts with all mortals and immortals, a little he profits, but continually throughout the dark night he cousins the tribes of mortal men. LL 579-580 And so, farewell, son of Zeus and Maya, but I will remember you and another song also. V to Aphrodite LL 1 to 6, Muse, tell me the deeds of golden Aphrodite the Cyprian, who stirs up sweet passion in the gods and subdues the tribes of mortal men and birds that fly in air and all the many creatures that the dry land rears, and all the sea, all these love the deeds of rich crowned Scythera. LL 7 to 32 Yet there are three hearts that she cannot bend nor yet ensnare. First is the daughter of Zeus who holds the Aegis, bright-eyed Athene, for she has no pleasure in the deeds of golden Aphrodite, but delights in wars and in the work of us, in strifes and battles and in preparing famous crafts. She first taught earthly craftsmen to make chariots of war and cars variously wrought with bronze, and she, too, teaches tender maidens in the house and puts knowledge of goodly arts in each one's mind. Nor does laughter-loving Aphrodite ever tame in love Artemis, the huntress with shafts of gold for she loves archery and the slaying of wild beasts in the mountains, the lyre also and dancing and thrilling cries and shady woods and the cities of upright men. Nor yet does the pure maiden Hestia love Aphrodite's works. She was the firstborn child of wily Kronos and youngest to 2524, by will of Zeus who holds the Aegis, a queenly maid whom both Poseidon and Apollo sought to wed. But she was wholly unwilling, nay, stubbornly refused, and touching the head of Father Zeus who holds the Aegis, she, that fair goddess, swear a great oath which has in truth been fulfilled, that she would be a maiden all her days. So Zeus the father gave her in high honor instead of marriage, and she has her place in the midst of the house and has the richest portion. In all the temples of the gods she has a share of honor, and among all mortal men she is chief of the goddesses. LL 33-44 Of these three Aphrodite cannot bend or ensnare the hearts. But of all others there is nothing among the blessed gods or among mortal men that has escaped Aphrodite. Even the heart of Zeus, who delights in thunder, is led astray by her, though he is greatest of all and has the lot of highest majesty, she beguiles even his wise heart whensoever she pleases, and mates him with mortal women, unknown to Hera his sister and his wife, the grandest far in beauty among the deathless goddesses, most glorious is she whom wily Kronos with her mother Rhea did beget, and Zeus, 
whose wisdom is everlasting, made her his chaste and careful wife. LL 45-52 But upon Aphrodite herself Zeus cast sweet desire to be joined in love with a mortal man, to the end that, very soon, not even she should be innocent of a mortal's love, lest laughter-loving Aphrodite should one day softly smile and say mockingly among all the gods that she had joined the gods in love with mortal women who bear sons of death to the deathless gods, and had mated the goddesses with mortal men. LL 53-74 and so he put in her heart sweet desire for Anchises who was tending cattle at that time among the steep hills of many fountain Dida, and in shape was like the immortal gods. Therefore, when laughter-loving Aphrodite saw him, she loved him, and terribly desire seized her in her heart. She went to Cyprus, to Paphos, where her precinct is and fragrant altar, and passed into her sweet-smelling temple. There she went in and put to the glittering doors, and there the graces bathed her with heavenly oil such as blooms upon the bodies of the eternal gods, oil divinely sweet, which she had by her, filled with fragrance. And laughter-loving Aphrodite put on all her rich clothes, and when she had decked herself with gold, she left sweet-smelling Cyprus and went in haste towards Troy, swiftly travelling high up among the clouds. So she came to many fountain Dida, the mother of wild creatures and went straight to the homestead across the mountains. After her came grey wolves, fawning on her, and grim-eyed lions and bears, and fleet leopards, ravenous for deer, and she was glad in heart to see them, and put desire in their breasts, so that they all mated, two together, about the shadowy coombs. LL 75-88, 2525 But she herself came to the neat build shelters and him she found left quite alone in the homestead, the hero Anchises who was comely as the gods. All the others were following the herds over the grassy pastures, and he, left quite alone in the homestead, was roaming hither and thither and playing thrillingly upon the lyre. And Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus stood before him, being like a pure maiden in height and mean, that he should not be frightened when he took heed of her with his eyes. Now when Anchises saw her, he marked her well and wondered at her mean and height and shining garments. For she was clad in a robe outshining the brightness of fire, a splendid robe of gold, enriched with all manner of needlework which shimmered like the moon over her tender breasts, a marvel to see. Also she wore twisted brooches and shining earrings in the form of flowers, and round her soft throat were lovely necklaces. LL 91-105, and Anchises was seized with love, and said to her, Hail, lady! Whoever of the blessed ones you are that are come to this house, whether Artemis, or Leto, or golden Aphrodite, or high-born Themis, or bright-eyed Athene. Or, maybe, you are one of the graces come hither, who bear the gods' company and are called immortal, or else one of those who inhabit this lovely mountain and the springs of rivers and grassy meads. I will make you an altar upon a high peak in a far-seen place, and will sacrifice rich offerings to you at all seasons. And do you feel kindly towards me and grant that I may become a man very eminent among the Trojans, and give me strong offspring for the time to come. As for my own self, 
Let me live long and happily, seeing the light of the sun, and come to the threshold of old age, a man prosperous among the people. LL 106-142 Thereupon Aphrodite the daughter of Zeus answered him, Anchises, most glorious of all men born on earth, know that I am no goddess. Why do you liken me to the deathless ones? Nay, I am but a mortal, and a woman was the mother that bare me. Otreus of famous name is my father, if so be you have heard of him, and he reigns over all Phrygia rich in fortresses. But I know your speech well beside my own, for a Trojan nurse brought me up at home. She took me from my dear mother and reared me thenceforth when I was a little child. So comes it, then, that I well know your tongue also. And now the slayer of Argus with the golden wand has caught me up from the dance of Huntress Artemis, her with the golden arrows. For there were many of us. Nymphs and marriageable 2,526 maidens, playing together, and an innumerable company encircled us, from these the slayer of Argus with the golden wand wrapped me away. He carried me over many fields of mortal men and over much land untilled and unpossessed, where savage wild beasts roam through shady combs until I thought never again to touch the life-giving earth with my feet. And he said that I should be called the wedded wife of Anchises, and should bear you goodly children. But when he had told and advised me, he, the strong slayer of Argus, went back to the families of the deathless gods, while I am now come to you, for unbending necessity is upon me. But I beseech you by Zeus and by your noble parents, for no base folk could get such a son as you, take me now, stainless and unproved in love, and show me to your father and careful mother and to your brothers sprung from the same stock. I shall be no ill-liking daughter for them, but a likely. Moreover, Send a messenger quickly to the swift-horsed Phrygians, to tell my father and my sorrowing mother, and they will send you gold in plenty and woven stuffs, many splendid gifts, take these as bride peace. So do, and then prepare the sweet marriage that is honorable in the eyes of men and deathless gods. LL 143-144 When she had so spoken, the goddess put sweet desire in his heart. And Anchises was seized with love, so that he opened his mouth and said, LL 145-154 If you are immortal and a woman was the mother who bare you and Otreus of famous name is your father as you say, and if you are come here by the will of Hermes the immortal guide, and are to be called my wife always, then neither god nor mortal man shall here restrain me till I have lain with you in love right now, no, not even if far-shooting Apollo himself should launch grievous shafts from his silver. Bo. Willingly would I go down into the house of Hads, O lady, beautiful as the goddesses, once I had gone up to your bed. LL 155-167 So speaking, he caught her by the hand. And laughed a loving Aphrodite, with face turned away and lovely eyes downcast crept to the well-spread couch which was already laid with soft coverings for the hero, and upon it lay skins of bears and deep-roaring lions which he himself had slain in the high mountains. And when they had gone up upon the well-fitted bed, 
first anchises took off her bright jewelry of pins and twisted brooches and earrings and necklaces and loosed her girdle and stripped off her bright garments and laid them down upon a silver-studded seat. Then by the will of the gods and destiny he lay with her, a mortal man with an immortal goddess, not clearly knowing what he did. LL 168-176 but at the time when the herdsmen drive their oxen and hardy sheep back to the fold from the flowery pastures, even then Aphrodite poured soft sleep upon Anchises, but herself put on her rich aiment. And when the bright goddess had fully clothed herself, she stood by the couch, and her head reached to the well-hewn roof tree. From her cheeks shone unearthly beauty such as belongs to rich-crowned Scythera. Then she aroused him from sleep and opened her mouth and said, LL 177-179, Up, son of Dardanus, why sleep you so heavily, and consider whether I look as I did when first you saw me with your eyes. LL 180-184, so she spake. And he awoke in a moment and obeyed her. But when he saw the neck and lovely eyes of Aphrodite, he was afraid and turned his eyes aside another way, hiding his comely face with his cloak. Then he uttered winged words and entreated her. LL 185 to 190, so soon as ever I saw you with my eyes, goddess, I knew that you were divine, but you did not tell me truly. Yet by Zeus who holds the aegis I beseech you, leave me not to lead a palsied life among men, but have pity on me. For he who lies with a deathless goddess is no hail man afterwards. LL 191 to 201. Then Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus, answered him, Anchises, most glorious of mortal men, take courage and be not too fearful in your heart. You need fear no harm from me nor from the other blessed ones for you are dear to the gods, and you shall have a dear son who shall reign among the Trojans, and children's children after him, springing up continually. His name shall be Aeneas 2527, because I felt awful grief in that I laid me in the bed of mortal man, Yet are those of your race always the most like to gods of all mortal men in beauty and in stature 2528. LL 202-217 Verily wise Zeus carried off golden-haired Ganymedes because of his beauty, to be amongst the deathless ones and pour drink for the gods in the house of Zeus a wonder to see, honoured by all the immortals as he draws the red nectar from the golden bowl. But grief that could not be soothed filled the heart of Tros, for he knew not whither the heaven-sent whirlwind had caught up his dear son, so that he mourned him always, unceasingly until Zeus pitied him and gave him high-stepping horses such as carry the immortals as recompense for his son. These he gave him as a gift. And at the command of Zeus, the guide, the slayer of Argus, told him all, and how his son would be deathless and unaging, even as the gods. So when Tros heard these tidings from Zeus, He no longer kept mourning but rejoiced in his heart and rode joyfully with his storm-footed horses. LL 218-238 So also golden-throned Eos wrapped away Tythonus who was of your race and like the deathless gods. 
and she went to ask the dark clouded son of Kronos that he should be deathless and live eternally, and Zeus bowed his head to her prayer and fulfilled her desire. Too simply was Queen Leo's. She thought not in her heart to ask youth for him and to strip him of the slough of deadly age. So while he enjoyed the sweet flower of life he lived rapturously with golden throne Dios, the early born, by the streams of ocean, at the ends of the earth. But when the first grey hairs began to ripple from his comely head and noble chin, Queen Leos kept away from his bed, though she cherished him in her house and nourished him with food and ambrosia and gave him rich clothing. But when loathsome old age pressed full upon him, and he could not move nor lift his limbs, this seemed to her in her heart the best counsel, she laid him in a room and put to the shining doors. There he babbles endlessly, and no more has strength at all, such as once he had in his supple limbs. LL 239-246 I would not have you be deathless among the deathless gods and live continually after such sort. Yet if you could live on such as now you are in look and in form, and be called my husband, Sorrow would not then enfold my careful heart. But, as it is, harsh 2529 old age will soon enshroud you, ruthless age which stands some day at the side of every man, deadly, wearying, dreaded even by the gods. LL 247-290 and now because of you I shall have great shame among the deathless gods henceforth, continually. For until now they feared my jibes and the whiles by which, or soon or late, I mated all the immortals with mortal women, making them all subject to my will. But now my mouth shall no more have this power among the gods. For very great has been my madness, my miserable and dreadful madness, and I went astray out of my mind who have gotten a child beneath my girdle, mating with a mortal man. As for the child, as soon as he sees the light of the sun, the deep-breasted mountain nymphs who inhabit this great and holy mountain shall bring him up. They rank neither with mortals nor with immortals, long indeed do they live, eating heavenly food and treading the lovely dance among the immortals, and with them the Silene and the sharp-eyed slayer of Argus mate in the depths of pleasant caves, but at their birth pines or high-topped oaks spring up with them upon the fruitful earth, beautiful, flourishing trees towering high upon the lofty mountains, and men call them holy places of the immortals, and never mortal lops them with the axe. But when the fate of death is near at hand, first those lovely trees wither where they stand, and the bark shrivels away about them, and the twigs fall down, and at last the life of the nymph and of the tree leave the light of the sun together. These nymphs shall keep my son with them and rear him, and as soon as he is come to lovely boyhood, the goddesses will bring him here to you and show you your child. But, that I may tell you all that I have in mind, I will come here again towards the fifth year and bring you my son. So soon as ever you have seen him, a scion to delight the eyes. You will rejoice in beholding him, for he shall be most godlike, then bring him at once to Windy Ilion. And if any mortal man ask you who got your dear son beneath her girdle, remember to tell him as I bid you, say he is the offspring of one of the flower-like nymphs who inhabit this forest-clad hill. 
but if you tell all and foolishly boast that you lay with rich crowned Aphrodite, Zeus will smite you in his anger with a smoking thunderbolt. Now I have told you all. Take heed, refrain and name me not, but have regard to the anger of the gods. L291 When the goddess had so spoken, she soared up to windy heaven. LL 292-293 Hail, Goddess, Queen of well-builded Cyprus. With you have I begun, now I will turn me to another hymn. 6 to Aphrodite, LL 1-18 I will sing of stately Aphrodite, gold-crowned and beautiful whose dominion is the walled cities of all sea-set Cyprus. There the moist breath of the western wind wafted her over the waves of the loud moaning sea in soft foam, and there the gold-filleted hours welcomed her joyously. They clothed her with heavenly garments, on her head they put a fine, well-wrought crown of gold, and in her pierced ears they hung ornaments of orich oak and precious gold, and adorned her with golden necklaces over her soft neck and snow-white breasts, jewels which the gold-filleted hours wear themselves whenever they go to their father's house to join the lovely dances of the gods. And when they had fully decked her, they brought her to the gods, who welcomed her when they saw her giving her their hands. Each one of them prayed that he might lead her home to be his wedded wife, so greatly were they amazed at the beauty of violet-crowned Cythera. LL 19-21 Hail, sweetly winning, coy-eyed goddess! Grant that I may gain the victory in this contest, and order you my song. And now I will remember you and another song also. 7 to Dionysius, LL 1 to 16, I will tell of Dionysius, the son of glorious Seamel, how he appeared on a jutting headland by the shore of the fruitless sea, seeming like a stripling in the first flush of manhood, his rich, dark hair was waving about him and on his strong shoulders he wore a purple robe. Presently there came swiftly over the sparkling sea Tersenian 2530 pirates on a well-decked ship, a miserable doom led them on. When they saw him they made signs to one another and sprang out quickly, and seizing him straightway, put him on board their ship exultingly for they thought him the son of heaven-nurtured kings. They sought to bind him with rude bonds, but the bonds would not hold him, and the wives fell far away from his hands and feet, and he sat with a smile in his dark eyes. Then the helmsman understood all and cried out at once to his fellows and said, LL 17-24, Madman. What god is this whom you have taken and bind, strong that he is? Not even the well-built ship can carry him. Surely this is either Zeus or Apollo who has the silver bow, or Poseidon, for he looks not like mortal men but like the gods who dwell on Olympus. Come, then, let us set him free upon the dark shore at once. Do not lay hands on him, lest he grow angry and stir up dangerous winds and heavy squalls. LL 25-31 So said he, but the master chid him with taunting words, Madman, mark the wind and help hoist sail on the ship, catch all the sheets. As for this fellow we men will see to him. I reckon he is bound for Egypt or for Cyprus or to the Hyperboreans or further still. 
but in the end he will speak out and tell us his friends and all his wealth and his brothers, now that providence has thrown him in our way. LL 32-54 When he had said this, he had mast and sail hoisted on the ship, and the wind filled the sail and the crew hauled taut the sheets on either side. But soon strange things were seen among them. First of all sweet, fragrant wine ran streaming throughout all the black ship and a heavenly smell arose, so that all the seamen were seized with amazement when they saw it. And all at once a vine spread out both ways along the top of the sail with many clusters hanging down from it and a dark ivy plant twined about the mast, blossoming with flowers, and with rich berries growing on it, and all the tholpins were covered with garlands. When the pirates saw all this, then at last they bade the helmsman to put the ship to land. But the god changed into a dreadful lion there on the ship, in the bows, and roared loudly. Amidships also he showed his wonders and created a shaggy bear which stood up ravening, while on the forepeak was the lion glaring fiercely with scowling brows. And so the sailors fled into the stern and crowded bemused about the right-minded helmsman, until suddenly the lion sprang upon the master and seized him and when the sailors saw it they leapt out overboard one and all into the bright sea, escaping from a miserable fate, and were changed into dolphins. But on the helmsman Dionysius had mercy and held him back and made him altogether happy, saying to him, LL 55-57, Take courage, good, you have found favour with my heart. I am loud crying Dionysius whom Ptmus daughter Semel bear of union with Zeus. LL 58-59 Hail, child of fair-faced Semel. He who forgets you can in no wise order sweet song. 8 to Oz, LL 1-17 Oz, exceeding in strength, chariot rider, golden helmed. Doughty in heart, shield-bearer, saviour of cities, harnessed in bronze, strong of arm, unwearying, mighty with the spear, O defence of Olympus, father of warlike victory, ally of Themis, stern governor of the rebellious, leader of righteous men, sceptred king of manliness, who whirl your fiery sphere among the planets in their sevenfold courses through the ether wherein your blazing steeds ever bear you above. The third firmament of heaven, hear me, helper of men, giver of dauntless youth. Shed down a kindly ray from above upon my life, and strength of war that I may be able to drive away bitter cowardice from my head and crush down the deceitful impulses of my soul. Restrain also the keen fury of my heart which provokes me to tread the ways of blood-curdling strife. Rather, O blessed one, give you me boldness to abide within the harmless laws of peace avoiding strife and hatred and the violent fiends of death. 9 to Artemis, LL 1 to 6, Muse, sing of Artemis, sister of the far shooter, the virgin who delights in arrows, who was fostered with Apollo. She waters her horses from mells deep in reeds and swiftly drives her all-golden chariot through Smyrna to vine-clad Claros where Apollo, god of the silver bow, sits waiting for the far-shooting goddess who delights in arrows. LL 7-9, and so hail to you, Artemis, in my song and to all goddesses as well. Of you first I sing and with you I begin, now that I have begun with you. I will turn to another song.
X to Aphrodite, LL123, of Cythera, born in Cyprus, I will sing. She gives kindly gifts to men, smiles are ever on her lovely face, and lovely is the brightness that plays over it. LL426, Hail, Goddess, Queen of well-built Salamis and sea-girt Cyprus. Grant me a cheerful song. And now I will remember you and another song also. 11 to Athena, LL 1 to 4, of Pallas Athene, guardian of the city, I begin to sing. Dread is she, and with us she loves deeds of war, the sack of cities and the shouting and the battle. It is she who saves the people as they go out to war and come back. L5, Hail, Goddess, and give us good fortune with happiness. 12 to Hera, LL1 to 5, I sing of golden-throned Hera whom Rhea bear. Queen of the Immortals is she, surpassing all in beauty. She is the sister and the wife of loud thundering Zeus, the glorious one whom all the blessed throughout high Olympus reverence and honor even as Zeus who delights in thunder. 13 to Demeter, LL 1 to 2, I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and of her daughter lovely Persephone. L 3, Hail, Goddess. Keep this city safe, and govern my song. 14 To the Mother of the Gods, LL 1 to 5, I prithee, clear voiced muse, daughter of mighty Zeus, sing of the mother of all gods and men. She is well pleased with the sound of rattles and of timbrels, with the voice of flutes and the outcry of wolves and bright eyed lions with echoing hills and wooded coombs. L6, and so hail to you in my song and to all goddesses as well. 15 to Heracles the Lion-Hearted, LL1-8, to I will sing of Heracles, the son of Zeus and much the mightiest of men on earth. Alcmena bear him in Thebes, the city of lovely dances when the dark-clouded son of Kronos had lain with her. Once he used to wander over unmeasured tracts of land and sea at the bidding of King Eurystheus, and himself did many deeds of violence and endured many, but now he lives happily in the glorious home of snowy Olympus, and has neat ankled head for his wife. L9, Hail, Lord son of Zeus. Give me success and prosperity. 16 to Asclepius, LL1-4, I begin to sing of Asclepius, son of Apollo and healer of sicknesses. In the Docian plain fair Coronis, daughter of King Phlegias, bear him, a great joy to men, a soother of cruel pangs. L5 and so hail to you, Lord, in my song I make my prayer to thee. 17 to the Dioscuri, LL 1 to 4, sing, clear-voiced muse, of Castor and Polydeuces, the Tindridae, who sprang from Olympian Zeus. Beneath the heights of Tagetus stately led a bear them, when the dark-clouded son of Kronos had privily bent her to his will. L5, Hail, children of Tyndareus, riders upon swift horses. 18 to Hermes, LL1-9, I sing of Kalenian Hermes, the slayer of Argus, lord of Kalene and Arcadia rich in flocks, luck-bringing messenger of the deathless gods. He was born of Maia, the daughter of Atlas, when she had made with Zeus, a shy goddess she. Ever she avoided the throng of the blessed gods and lived in a shadowy cave, 
and there the son of Kronos used to lie with the rich tressed nymph at dead of night, while white armed Hera lay bound in sweet sleep, and neither deathless god nor mortal man knew it. LL 10 to 11, and so hail to you, son of Zeus and Maya, with you I have begun, now I will turn to another song. L12, Hail, Hermes, giver of grace, guide, and giver of good things. 2531. 19 to Pan, LL1 to 26, Muse, tell me about Pan, the dear son of Hermes, with his goat's feet and two horns, a lover of merry noise. Through wooded glades he wanders with dancing nymphs who foot it on some sheer cliff's edge, calling upon Pan, the shepherd god, long-haired, unkempt. He has every snowy crest and the mountain peaks and rocky crests for his domain, hither and thither he goes through the close thickets, now allured by soft streams and now he presses on amongst towering crags and climbs up to the highest peak that overlooks the flocks. Often he courses through the glistening high mountains, and often on the shouldered hills he speeds along slaying wild beasts, this keen-eyed god. Only at evening, as he returns from the chase, he sounds his note playing sweet and low on his pipes of reed, not even she could excel him in melody, that bird who in flower-laden spring pouring forth her lament utters honey-voiced song amid the leaves. At that hour the clear-voiced nymphs are with him and move with nimble feet, singing by some spring of dark water, while echo wails about the mountain top and the god on this side or on that of the choirs, or at times sidling into the midst, plies it nimbly with his feet. On his back he wears a spotted lynx pelt, and he delights in high-pitched songs in a soft meadow where crocuses and sweet-smelling hyacinths bloom at random in the grass. LL 27-47 they sing of the blessed gods and high Olympus and choose to tell of such an one as luck bringing Hermes above the rest, how he is the swift messenger of all the gods, and how he came to Arcadia, the land of many springs and mother of flocks, there where his sacred place is as god of Kaleen. For there, though a god, he used to tend curler-fleeced sheep in the service of a mortal man, because there fell on him and waxed strong melting desire to wed the rich-tressed daughter of Dreops, and there he brought about the merry marriage. And in the house she bare Hermes a dear son who from his birth was marvellous to look upon, with goat's feet and two horns, a noisy, merry laughing child. But when the nurse saw his uncouth face and full beard, she was afraid and sprang up and fled and left the child. Then luck bringing Hermes received him and took him in his arms, very glad in his heart was the god. And he went quickly to the abodes of the deathless gods, carrying the sun wrapped in warm skins of mountain hairs and set him down beside Zeus and showed him to the rest of the gods. Then all the immortals were glad in heart and Bacchae Dionysius in especial, and they called the boy Pan 2532 because he delighted all their hearts. LL 48-49, and so hail to you, Lord. I seek your favour with a song. And now I will remember you and another song also. XX to Hephaestus, LL1 to 7, sing, clear voiced muses, of Hephaestus famed for inventions. 
With bright-eyed Athene he taught men glorious gifts throughout the world, men who before used to dwell in caves in the mountains like wild beasts. But now that they have learned crafts through Hephaestus the famed worker, easily they live a peaceful life in their own houses the whole year round. L8. Be gracious, Hephaestus, and grant me success and prosperity. XXI to Apollo, LL1 to 4, Phbus, of you even the swan sings with clear voice to the beating of his wings as he alights upon the bank by the eddying river Penus, and of you the sweet-tongued minstrel, holding his high-pitched lyre, always sings both first and last. L5, and so hail to you, Lord. I seek your favor with my song. XXII to Poseidon, LL1 to 5, I begin to sing about Poseidon the great God, mover of the earth and fruitless sea, God of the deep who is also Lord of Helicon and Wydege. A twofold office the gods allotted you, O shaker of the earth, to be a tamer of horses and a saviour of ships. LL 6-7, Hail, Poseidon, holder of the earth, dark-haired Lord. O blessed one, be kindly in heart and help those who voyage in ships. 23 To the son of Kronos, Most High, LL 1 to 3, I will sing of Zeus, chiefest among the gods and greatest, all seeing, the Lord of all, the fulfiller who whispers words of wisdom to Themis as she sits leaning towards him. L 4, Be gracious. All-seeing son of Kronos, most excellent and great. Xiv to Hestia, LL1 to 5, Hestia, you who tend the holy house of the Lord Apollo, the far shooter at goodly Pytho, with soft oil dripping ever from your locks, come now into this house, come, having one mind with Zeus the All-Wise, draw near and withal bestow grace upon my song. XXV to the Muses and Apollo, LL1 to 5, I will begin with the Muses and Apollo and Zeus. For it is through the Muses and Apollo that there are singers upon the earth and players upon the lyre, but kings are from Zeus. Happy is he whom the Muses love, sweet flows speech from his lips. LL 6 to 7, Hail, children of Zeus. Give honor to my song. And now I will remember you and another song also. XXVI to Dionysius, LL 1 to 9, I begin to sing of Ivy crowned Dionysius, the loud crying God, splendid son of Zeus and glorious Senal. The rich-haired nymphs received him in their bosoms from the Lord his father and fostered and nurtured him carefully in the dells of Nysa, where by the will of his father he grew up in a sweet-smelling cave, being reckoned among the immortals. But when the goddesses had brought him up, a god oft hymned, then began he to wander continually through the woody combs thickly wreathed with ivy and laurel. And the nymphs followed in his train with him for their leader, and the boundless forest was filled with their outcry. LL 10-13, And so hail to you, Dionysius, god of abundant clusters. Grant that we may come again rejoicing to this season, and from that season onwards for many a year. Xxai to Artemis, LL1 to 20, I sing of Artemis, whose shafts are of gold, who cheers on the hounds, the pure maiden, shooter of stags, who delights in archery, own sister to Apollo with the golden sword.
Over the shadowy hills and windy peaks she draws her golden bow, rejoicing in the chase, and sends out grievous shafts. The tops of the high mountains tremble and the tangled wood echoes awesomely with the outcry of beasts, earthquakes and the sea also where fishes shoal. But the goddess with a bold heart turns every way destroying the race of wild beasts, and when she is satisfied and has cheered her heart, this huntress who delights in arrows slackens her supple bow and goes to the great house of her dear brother Phus Apollo, to the rich land of Delphi, there to order the lovely dance of the muses and graces. There she hangs up her curved bow and her arrows, and heads and leads the dances, gracefully arrayed, while all they utter their heavenly voice, singing how neat ankled Leto bear children supreme among the immortals both in thought and in deed. LL 21-22, Hail to you, children of Zeus and rich-haired Leto. And now I will remember you and another song also. Ksxate to Athena, LL 1-16, I begin to sing of Pallas Athene, the glorious goddess, bright-eyed, inventive, unbending of heart, pure virgin, saviour of cities, courageous, tritogenera. From his awful head wise Zeus himself bear her arrayed in warlike arms of flashing gold, and or seized all the gods as they gazed. But Athena sprang quickly from the immortal head and stood before Zeus who holds the aegis, shaking a sharp spear, great Olympus began to reel horribly at the might of the bright-eyed goddess, and earth round about cried fearfully and the sea was moved and tossed with dark waves, while foam burst forth suddenly, the bright son of Hyperion stopped his swift-footed horses a long while, until the maiden Pallas Athene had stripped the heavenly armor from her immortal shoulders. And wise Zeus was glad. LL 17-18, and so hail to you daughter of Zeus who holds the Aegis. Now I will remember you and another song as well. Xix to Hestia, LL 1 to 6, Hestia, in the high dwellings of all, both deathless gods and men who walk on earth, you have gained an everlasting abode and highest honor, glorious is your portion and your right. For without you mortals hold no banquet, where one does not duly pour sweet wine in offering to Hestia both first and last. LL 7-10, 2533 and you, Slayer of Argus, son of Zeus and Maia, messenger of the blessed gods, bearer of the golden rod, giver of good. Be favorable and help us, you and Hestia, the worshipful and dear. Come and dwell in this glorious house in friendship together, for you too, well knowing the noble actions of men, aid on their wisdom and their strength. LL 12-13, Hail, daughter of Kronos, and you also, Hermes, bearer of the golden rod. Now I will remember you and another song also. XXX to Earth the Mother of All, LL 1 to 16, I will sing of well-founded Earth, Mother of All, Eldest of All Beings. She feeds all creatures that are in the world, all that go upon the goodly land, and all that are in the paths of the seas, and all that fly, all these are fed of her store. Through you, O Queen, men are blessed in their children and blessed in their harvests, and to you it belongs to give means of life to mortal men and to take it away. Happy is the man whom you delight to honor. He has all things abundantly, 
His fruitful land is laden with corn, his pastures are covered with cattle, and his house is filled with good things. Such men rule orderly in their cities of fair women, great riches and wealth follow them, their sons exult with ever fresh delight, and their daughters in flower-laden bands play and skip merrily over the soft flowers of the field. Thus is it with those whom you honor O Holy Goddess, Bountiful Spirit. LL 17-19 Hail, Mother of the Gods, Wife of Starry Heaven, freely bestow upon me for this my song substance that cheers the heart. And now I will remember you and another song also. XXXI to Helios LL 1 to 16, 2534 and now, O Muse Calliope, daughter of Zeus, begin to sing of glowing Helios whom mild-eyed Euryphesa, the far-shining one, bear to the sun of earth and starry heaven. For Hyperion wedded glorious Euryphesa, his own sister, who bear him lovely children rosy Armdios and rich-tressed Selene and tireless Helios who is like the deathless gods. As he rides in his chariot, he shines upon men and deathless gods, and piercingly he gazes with his eyes from his golden helmet. Bright rays beam dazzlingly from him, and his bright locks streaming from the temples of his head gracefully enclose his far-seen face, a rich, fine-spun garment glows upon his body and flutters in the wind, and stallions carry him. Then, when he has stayed his golden-yoked chariot and horses, he rests there upon the highest point of heaven until he marvelously drives them down again through heaven to ocean. LL 17-19 Hail to you, Lord! Freely bestow on me substance that cheers the heart. And now that I have begun with you, I will celebrate the race of mortal men half-divine whose deeds the muses have showed to mankind. Xxxi to Selene, LL 1 to 13, and next, sweet-voiced muses, daughters of Zeus, well-skilled in song, tell of the long-winged 2535 moon. From her immortal head a radiance is shown from heaven and embraces earth, and great is the beauty that ariseth from her shining light. The air unlit before, glows with the light of her golden crown, and her rays beam clear, whensoever bright Selene having bathed her lovely body in the waters of ocean, and donned her far-gleaming, shining team, drives on her long-maned horses at full speed, at event time in the mid-month, then her great orbit is full and then her beams shine brightest as she increases. So she is a sure token and a sign to mortal men. LL 14-16 Once the son of Kronos was joined with her in love, and she conceived and bare a daughter Pandia, exceeding lovely amongst the deathless gods. LL 17-20 Hail, white-armed goddess, bright Selene, mild, bright-tressed queen. And now I will leave you and sing the glories of men half divine, whose deeds minstrels, the servants of the muses, celebrate with lovely lips. XXXII to the Dioscuri, LL 1 to 17, bright eyed muses, tell of the Tindridae, the sons of Zeus, glorious children of neat ankled leather. Castor the tamer of horses, and blameless Polyduces. When Leda had lain with the dark-clouded son of Cronos, she bare them beneath the peak of the great hill Tagetus, 
children who are delivers of men on earth and of swift going ships when stormy gales rage over the ruthless sea. Then the shipmen call upon the sons of great Zeus with vows of white lambs, going to the fore part of the prow, but the strong wind and the waves of the sea lay the ship under water, until suddenly these two are seen darting through the air on tawny wings. Forthwith they allay the blasts of the cruel winds and still the waves upon the surface of the white sea, fair signs are they and deliverance from toil. And when the shipmen see them they are glad and have rest from their pain and labor. LL 18-19, Hail, Tindride, Riders upon Swift Horses. Now I will remember you and another song also. Homer's Epigrams 2601 I, 5 lines, LL 1 to 5, have reverence for him who needs a home and strangers dole, all ye who dwell in the high city of Cum, the lovely maiden, hard by the foothills of lofty Sardin, ye who drink the heavenly water of the divine stream, eddying Hermus, whom deathless Zeus bego. 2, 2 lines, LL 1 to 2, speedily may my feet bear me to some town of righteous men, for their hearts are generous and their wit is best. 3, 6 lines, LL 1 to 6, I am a maiden of bronze and am set upon the tomb of Midas. While the waters flow and tall trees flourish, and the sun rises and shines and the bright moon also, while rivers run and the sea breaks on the shore, ever remaining on this mournful tomb, I tell the passerby that Midas here lies buried. 4. 17 lines, LL 1 to 17. To what a fate did Zeus the father give me a prey even while he made me to grow, a babe at my mother's knee? By the will of Zeus who holds the Aegis the people of Fricken, riders on wanton horses, more active than raging fire in the test of war, once built the towers of Aeolian Smyrna, wave-shaken neighbor to the sea, through which glides the pleasant stream of sacred Mels, thence 2602 arose the daughters of Zeus, glorious children and would fain have made famous that fair country and the city of its people. But in their folly those men scorned the divine voice and renown of song, and in trouble shall one of them remember this hereafter, he who with scornful words to them 2603 contrived my fate. Yet I will endure the lot which heaven gave me even at my birth bearing my disappointment with a patient heart. My dear limbs yearn not to stay in the sacred streets of Cum, but rather my great heart urges me to go unto another country, small though I am. V. 2 lines, LL 1 to 2, Thestrides, full many things there are that mortals cannot sound but there is nothing more unfathomable than the heart of man. 6, 8 lines, LL 1 to 8, Hear me, Poseidon, strong shaker of the earth, ruler of widespread, tawny helicon. Give a fair wind and sight of safe return to the shipmen who speed and govern this ship and grant that when I come to the nether slopes of towering mamas I may find honorable, God-fearing men. Also may I avenge me on the wretch who deceived me and grieved Zeus the lord of guests and his own guest table. 7. 3 lines, LL 1 to 3, Queen Earth, all bounteous giver of honey-hearted wealth, how kindly! It seems, you are to some, and how intractable and rough for those with whom you are angry. 8, 4 lines, 
LL124, sailors, who rove the seas and whom a hateful fate has made as the shy sea fowl, living an unenviable life, observe the reverence due to Zeus who rules on high, the god of strangers. For terrible is the vengeance of this god afterwards for whosoever has sinned. 9. Two lines, LL1 to 2, strangers, a contrary wind has caught you, but even now take me aboard and you shall make your voyage. X. Four lines, LL1 to 4, Another sort of pine shall bear a better fruit 2604 than you upon the heights of Pharaud, Windy Ida. For there shall mortal men get the iron that ours loved so soon as the Sebrenians shall hold the land. 11. Four lines, LL1 to 4, Glaucus, watchman of flocks, a word will I put in your heart. First give the dogs their dinner at the courtyard gate, for this is well. The dog first hears a man approaching and the wild beast coming to the fence. 12. Four lines, LL1-4, Goddess Nurse of the Young 2605, give ear to my prayer and grant that this woman may reject the love embraces of youth and dote on grey-haired old men whose powers are dulled, but whose hearts still desire. 13. Six lines, LL1-6, to six, children are a man's crown, towers of a city, horses are the glory of a plain, and so are ships of the sea, wealth will make a house great and reverend princes seated in assembly are a goodly sight for the folk to see. But a blazing fire makes a house look more comely upon a winter's day, when the son of Kronos sends down snow. 14. 23 lines, LL1-23, to 23, Potters, if you will give me a reward, I will sing for you. Come, then. Athena, with hand upraised 2,606 over the kill. Let the pots and all the dishes turn out well and be well fired, let them fetch good prices and be sold in plenty in the market, and plenty in the streets. Grant that the potters may get great gain and grant me so to sing to them. But if you turn shameless and make false promises, then I call together the destroyers of kilns, shatter and smash and cha and crash and crudebug who can work this craft much mischief. Come all of you and sack the kill yard and the buildings, let the whole kill be shaken up to the potter's loud lament. As a horse's jaw grinds, so let the kill grind to powder all the pots inside. And you, too, daughter of the sun, Circe the witch, come and cast cruel spells, hurt both these men and their handiwork. Let Chiron also come and bring many centaurs, all that escaped the hands of Heracles and all that were destroyed. Let them make sad havoc of the pots and overthrow the kill, and let the potters see the mischief and be grieved, but I will gloat as I behold their luckless craft. And if any one of them stoops to peer in, let all his face be burned up, that all men may learn to deal honestly. 15. 13 lines. 2607. LL1-7, let us betake us to the house of some man of great power, one who bears great power and is greatly prosperous always. Open of yourselves, you doors, for mighty wealth will enter in, and with wealth comes jolly mirth and gentle peace. May all the corn bins be full and the mass of dough always overflow the kneading trough. Now, set before us, 
cheerful barley pottage, full of sesame. Lacuna, LL8-10, your son's wife, driving to this house with strong hoofed mules, shall dismount from her carriage to greet you. May she be shod with golden shoes as she stands weaving at the loom. LL 11 to 13, I come, and I come yearly, like the swallow that perches light-footed in the forepart of your house. But quickly bring. 16, two lines, LL 1 to 2, if you will give us anything, well. But if not, we will not wait, for we are not come here to dwell with you. 17 Homer, hunters of deep sea prey, have we caught anything? Fishermen, all that we caught we left behind, and all that we did not catch we carry home. 2608 Homer, a. Eh? For of such fathers you are sprung as neither hold rich lands nor tend countless sheep. Fragments of the epic cycle The War of the Titans Fragment Hash 1, Photius, Epitome of the Crestomathy of Proclus. The epic cycle begins with the fabled union of heaven and earth, by which they make three hundred-handed sons and three cyclopes to be born to him. Fragment hash 2, Anecdota Oxon. Crammer, I-75, according to the writer of the War of the Titans Heaven was the son of Ether. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. I-1165, Eumless says that Egeon was the son of Earth and Sea and having his dwelling in the sea, was an ally of the titans. Fragment hash 4, Athena Ouse, 7. 277 d. The poet of the War of the Titans, whether Eumless of Corinth or Arctanus, writes thus in his second book, Upon the shield were dumb fish afloat, with golden faces swimming and sporting through the heavenly water. Fragment hash 5, Athena Ouse, I-22 C, Eumless somewhere introduces Zeus dancing, he says, in the midst of them danced the father of men and gods. Fragment hash 6, Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, Arg. I-554, the author of The War of the Giants says that Kronos took the shape of a horse and lay with Philera, the daughter of Ocean. Through this cause Chiron was born a centaur, his wife was Chariclo. Fragment hash 7, Athena Ouse, 11. 470 b, Theolitus says that he, Heracles sailed across the sea in a cauldron 2701, but the first to give this story is the author of The War of the Titans. Fragment hash 8, Philodemus, on piety, the author of The War of the Titans says that the apples, of the Hesperides, were guarded. The story of Oedipus fragment hash 1 c.i.g it all. It's sick. 1292-2. 11. The Story of Oedipus by Senat Hun in 6600 verses. Fragment hash 2. Pausanias, 9. 5.10. Judging by Homer I do not believe that Oedipus had children by Iacasta, his sons were born of Eurigania as the writer of the epic called The Story of Oedipus clearly shows. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Euripid's Fien, 1750, the authors of The Story of Oedipus, say, of the Sphinx, but furthermore, 
she killed, noble Heman, the dear son of blameless Creon, the comeliest and loveliest of boys. The Thebaid Fragment Hash 1 Contest of Homer and Hesiod Homer travelled about reciting his epics, first the Thebaid, in 7,000 verses, which begins, Sing, Goddess, of parched Argus, whence lords, fragment hash 2, Athena Us, 11. 465 e, then the heaven-born hero, golden-haired Polynices, first set beside Oedipus a rich table of silver which once belonged to Cadmus the divinely wise, next he filled a fine golden cup with sweet wine. But when Oedipus perceived these treasures of his father, great misery fell on his heart, and he straightway called down bitter curses there in the presence of both his sons and the avenging fury of the gods failed not to hear him as he prayed that they might never divide their father's goods in loving brotherhood, but that war and fighting might be ever the portion of them both. Fragment Hash 3, Laurentian Scoli asked on Sophocles, OC 1375 and when Oedipus noticed the haunch 2801 he threw it on the ground and said, Oh! Oh! My sons have sent this mocking me, so he prayed to Zeus the king and the other deathless gods that each might fall by his brother's hand and go down into the house of Hads. Fragment Hash 4, Pausanias, 8 25.8 Adrastus fled from Thebes wearing miserable garments, and took black maned iron 2802 with him. Fragment Hash 5 Pinder, Ol. 615 2803 But when the seven dead had received their last rites in Thebes, the son of Talors lamented and spoke thus among them, Woe is me, for I miss the bright eye of my host, a good seer and a stout spearman alike. Fragment Hash 6, Apollodorus, I-74, Enus married Perabia the daughter of Hipponus. The author of the Thebae says that when Olenus had been stormed, Enus received her as a prize. Fragment Hash 7, Pausanias, 9. 18.6, Near the spring is the tomb of Asphodicus. This Asphodicus killed Parthenopeus the son of Talors in the battle against the Argives, as the Thebans say, though that part of the Thebae which tells of the death of Parthenopeus says that it was Periclymenus who killed him. The Epigony Fragment Hash 1, Contest of Homer and Hesiod, next, Homer composed, the Epigony in 7,000 verses, beginning, and now, Muses, let us begin to sing of younger men. Fragment Hash 2, Photius, Lexicon, Teumesia. Those who have written on Theban affairs have given a full account of the Teumesian fox. 2901 They relate that the creature was sent by the gods to punish the descendants of Cadmus, and that the Thebans therefore excluded those of the house of Cadmus from kingship. But, they say, a certain Cephalus, the son of Dion, an Athenian, who owned a hound which no beast ever escaped, had accidentally killed his wife Procris, and being purified of the homicide by the Cadmines, hunted the fox with his hound, and when they had overtaken it both hound and fox were turned into stones near Teumissus. These writers have taken the story from the epic cycle. Fragment Hash 3 
Scoli asked on Apollonius Rhodius, arg. I 308, the authors of the Thebae say that Manto the daughter of Tiresias was sent to Delphi by the Epigone as a first fruit of their spoil, and that in accordance with an oracle of Apollo she went out and met Rasius, the son of Lebs, a Mycenaean by race. This man she married, for the oracle also contained the command that she should marry whomsoever she might meet, and coming to Colophon, was there much cast down and wept over the destruction of her country. The Cypria fragment hash 1, Proclus, Crestomathia, I. This 3001 is continued by the epic called Cypria which is current is 11 books. Its contents are as follows. Zeus plans with Themis to bring about the Trojan War. Strife arrives while the gods are feasting at the marriage of Peleus and starts a dispute between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite as to which of them is fairest. The three are led by Hermes at the command of Zeus to Alexandrus on Mount Ida for his decision, and Alexandrus, allured by his promised marriage with Helen, decides in favor of Aphrodite. Then Alexandrus builds his ships at Aphrodite's suggestion, and Helenus foretells the future to him, and Aphrodite order Aeneas to sail with him while Cassandra prophesies as to what will happen afterwards. Alexandrus next lands in Lacedaemon and is entertained by the sons of Tyndareus, and afterwards by men laws in Sparta, where in the course of a feast he gives gifts to Helen. After this, men laws sets sail for Crete ordering Helen to furnish the guests with all they require until they depart. Meanwhile, Aphrodite brings Helen and Alexandrus together, and they, after their union, put very great treasures on board and sail away by night. Hera stirs up a storm against them and they are carried to Sidon, where Alexandrus takes the city. From there he sailed to Troy and celebrated his marriage with Helen. In the meantime Castor and Polydeuces, while stealing the cattle of Idas and Linsus, were caught in the act, and Castor was killed by Idas, and Linsus and Idas by Polydeuces. Zeus gave them immortality every other day. Iris next informs Menlaws of what has happened at his home. Menlaws returns and plans an expedition against Ilium with his brother, and then goes on to Nestor. Nestor in a digression tells him how Epopus was utterly destroyed after seducing the daughter of Lycus, and the story of Oedipus, the madness of Heracles and the story of Theseus and Ariadne. Then they travel over Hellas and gather the leaders, detecting Odysseus when he pretends to be mad, not wishing to join the expedition, by seizing his son Telemachus for punishment at the suggestion of Palamedes. All the leaders then meet together at Orlis and sacrifice. The incident of the serpent and the sparrows 3002 takes place before them, and Calchas foretells what is going to befall. After this, they put out to sea, and reach Teuthrania and sack it, taking it for Ilium. Telephus comes out to the rescue and kills Thersander and son of Polynices, and is himself wounded by Achilles. As they put out from Messia a storm comes on them and scatters them, and Achilles first puts in at Serhos and married Didamia, the daughter of Lycomedes, and then heals Telephus, who had been led by an oracle to go to Argus, 
so that he might be their guide on the voyage to Ilium. When the expedition had mustered a second time at Orlis, Agamemnon, while at the chase, shot a stag and boasted that he surpassed even Artemis. At this the goddess was so angry that she sent stormy winds and prevented them from sailing. Calchas then told them of the anger of the goddess and bade them sacrifice Iphigenia to Artemis. This they attempt to do, sending to fetch Iphigenia as though for marriage with Achilles. Artemis, however, snatched her away and transported her to the Tauri, making her immortal, and putting a stag in place of the girl upon the altar. Next they sail as far as Tenedos, and while they are feasting, Philoctetes is bitten by a snake and is left behind in Lemos because of the stench of his saw. Here, too, Achilles quarrels with Agamemnon because he is invited late. Then the Greeks try to land at Ilium, but the Trojans prevent them, and Protesilaus is killed by Hector. Achilles then kills Cycnus, the son of Poseidon, and drives the Trojans back. The Greeks take up their dead and send envoys to the Trojans demanding the surrender of Helen and the treasure with her. The Trojans refusing, they first assault the city, and then go out and lay waste the country and cities round about. After this, Achilles desires to see Helen, and Aphrodite and Thetis contrive a meeting between them. The Achaeans next desire to return home, but are restrained by Achilles, who afterwards drives off the cattle of Aeneas, and sacks Lionysus and Pedasus and many of the neighbouring cities, and kills Troilus. Patroclus carries away Lycon to Lemos and sells him as a slave, and out of the spoils Achilles receives Bryse eyes as a prize, and Agamemnon Chrysis. Then follows the death of Palamedes, the plan of Zeus to relieve the Trojans by detaching Achilles from the Hellenic Confederacy, and a catalogue of the Trojan allies. Fragment Hash 2 Sitzes, Chill. 13638, Stasinus composed the Cypria which the more part say was Homer's work and by him given to Stasinus as a dowry with money besides. Fragment hash 3, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. I-5, there was a time when the countless tribes of men, though wide dispersed, oppressed the surface of the deep-bosomed earth, and Zeus saw it and had pity and in his wise heart resolved to relieve the all-nurturing earth of men by causing the great struggle of the Ilian War, that the load of death might empty the world. And so the heroes were slain in Troy, and the plan of Zeus came to pass. Fragment Hash 4, Volumina Herculan, 2 8 105. The author of the Cypria says that Thetis, to please Hera, avoided union with Zeus, at which he was enraged and swore that she should be the wife of a mortal. Fragment Hash 5. Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 17 140. For at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, the gods gathered together on Pelion to feast and brought Pelus gifts. Chiron gave him a stout ashen shaft which he had cut for a spear, and Athena, it is said, polished it, and Hephaestus fitted it with a head. The story is given by the author of the Cypria. Fragment hash 6, Athena Us, 15. 682 d. f. The author of the Cypria, whether Hexias or Stasinus, 
mentions flowers used for garlands. The poet, whoever he was, writes as follows in his first book, LL 1-7, she clothed herself with garments which the graces and hours had made for her and dyed in flowers of spring, such flowers as the seasons wear, in crocus and hyacinth and flourishing violet and the roses lovely bloom, so sweet and delicious, and heavenly buds, the flowers of the narcissus and lily. In such perfumed garments is Aphrodite clothed at all seasons. Lacuna, LL 8-12, then laughter loving Aphrodite and her handmaidens wove sweet smelling crowns of flowers of the earth and put them upon their heads, the bright coiffed goddesses, the nymphs and graces, and golden Aphrodite too while they sang sweetly on the mount of many fountain Dida. Fragment hash 7, Clement of Alexandria, Protrept 2. 35, Castor was mortal, and the fate of death was destined for him, but Polydeuces, scion of Oz, was immortal. Fragment hash 8, Athena Ouse, 8. 334 b, and after them she bare a third child, Helen, a marvel to men. Rich tressed nemesis once gave her birth when she had been joined in love with Zeus the king of the gods by harsh violence. For nemesis tried to escape him and liked not to lie in love with her father Zeus the son of Kronos for shame and indignation vexed her heart, therefore she fled him over the land and fruitless dark water. But Zeus ever pursued and longed in his heart to catch her. Now she took the form of a fish and sped over the waves of the loud roaring sea, and now over ocean's stream and the furthest bounds of earth, and now she sped over the furrowed land always turning into such dread creatures as the dry land nurtures, that she might escape him. Fragment hash 9, Scoli asked on Euripides, and 898, the writer 3003 of the Cyprian histories says that, Helen's third child was, Pleisthens and that she took him with her to Cyprus and that the child she bore Alexandrus was Agonus. Fragment hash 10, Herodotus, 2. 117, for it is said in the Cypria that Alexandrus came with Helen to Ilium from Sparta in three days, enjoying a favorable wind and calm sea. Fragment hash 11, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. 3242, for Helen had been previously carried off by Theseus, and it was in consequence of this earlier rape that Aphidna, a town in Attica, was sacked and Castor was wounded in the right thigh by Aphidnus who was king at that time. Then the Dioscuri, failing to find Theseus, sacked Athens. The story is in the cyclic writers. Plutarch, thus. 32, Herias relates that Alicus was killed by Theseus himself near Aphidna, and quotes the following verses in evidence, In spacious Aphidna Theseus slew him in battle long ago for rich-haired Helen Sarke. 3004 Fragment Hash 12 Scoli asked on Pinder, Nem. X 114, LL 1 to 6, straightway Linsus, trusting in his swift feet, made for Tagetus. He climbed its highest peak and looked throughout the whole isle of Pelops, son of Tantalus, and soon the glorious hero with his dread eyes saw horse-taming Castor and athlete Polydeuces both hidden within a hollow oak. 
Philodemus, on piety, Stasinus, writes that Castor was killed with a spear shot by Idas the son of Aphareus. Fragment hash 13, Athena Ouse, 35 c, Men Laws, know that the gods made wine the best thing for mortal man to scatter cares. Fragment hash 14, Laurentian Scoli asked on Sophocles, elect. 157, either he follows Homer who spoke of the three daughters of Agamemnon, or, like the writer of the Cypria, he makes them four, distinguishing, Iphigenia and Iphianasa. Fragment hash 15, 3005 Contest of Homer and Hesiod, so they feasted all day long, taking nothing from their own houses, for Agamemnon, king of men, provided for them. Fragment hash 16, Luva Papyrus, I never thought to enrage so terribly the stout heart of Achilles, for very well I loved him. Fragment hash 17, Pausanias, 4. 27. The poet of the Cypria says that the wife of Protesilaus, who, when the Hellenes reached the Trojan shore, first dared to land, was called Polydora, and was the daughter of Meliga, the son of Enus. Fragment hash 18, Eustathius, 119. 4. Some relate that Chrysis was taken from Hypoplation 3006 the bees, and that she had not taken refuge there nor gone there to sacrifice to Artemis, as the author of the Cypria states, but was simply a fellow town soman of Andromesh. Fragment hash 19. Pausanias, x 31. 2. I know, because I have read it in the epic Cypria, that Palamedes was drowned when he had gone out fishing, and that it was Diomedes and Odysseus who caused his death. Fragment hash 20, Plato, Euthyphron, 12 a.m., that it is Zeus who has done this, and brought all these things to pass, you do not like to say, for where fear is, there too is shame. Fragment hash 21, Herodian, on peculiar diction, by him she conceived and bare the Gorgons, fearful monsters who lived in Sarpedon, a rocky island in deep eddying Oceanus. Fragment hash 22, Clement of Alexandria, Stromatai 7. 219, again. Stasinus says, he is a simple man who kills the father and lets the children live. The Ethiopis fragment hash 1, Proclus, Crestomathia, 2, the Cypria, described in the preceding book, has its sequel in the Iliad of Homer, which is followed in turn by the five books of the Ethiopis, the work of Arctinus of Miletus. Their contents are as follows. The Amazon Penthesilea, the daughter of Ars and of Thracian race, comes to aid the Trojans, and after showing great prowess, is killed by Achilles and buried by the Trojans. Achilles then slays the Sits for abusing and reviling him for his supposed love for Penthesilea. As a result a dispute arises amongst the Achaeans over the killing of the Sits, and Achilles sails to Osbos and after sacrificing to Apollo, Artemis, and Leto, is purified by Odysseus from bloodshed. Then Memon, the son of Eos, wearing armor made by Hephaestus, comes to help the Trojans, and Thetis tells her son about Memon. A battle takes place in which Antilochus is slain by Memon and Memon by Achilles. 
Eos then obtains of Zeus and bestows upon her son immortality, but Achilles routs the Trojans, and, rushing into the city with them, is killed by Paris and Apollo. A great struggle for the body then follows, Aras taking up the body and carrying it to the ships, while Odysseus drives off the Trojans behind. The Achaeans then bury Antilochus and lay out the body of Achilles, while Thetis, arriving with the Muses and her sisters, bewails her son, whom she afterwards catches away from the pyre and transports to the White Island. After this, the Achaeans pile him a cairn and hold games in his honour. Lastly a dispute arises between Odysseus and Aras over the arms of Achilles. Fragment hash 2, Scoli asked on Homer, ill. Xiv 804, some read, thus they performed the burial of Hector. Then came the Amazon, the daughter of great souled Ars the slayer of men. Fragment hash 3. Scoli asked on Pindar, Isth. 353, the author of the Ethiopis says that Aras killed himself about dawn. The Little Iliad Fragment Hash 1, Proclus, Crestomathia, 2, next comes the Little Iliad in four books by Leestches of Matilne, its contents are as follows. The adjudging of the arms of Achilles takes place, and Odysseus, by the contriving of Athena, gains them. Aras then becomes mad and destroys the herd of the Achaeans and kills himself. Next Odysseus lies in wait and catches Helnus, who prophesies as to the taking of Troy, and Diomed accordingly brings Philoctetes from Lemos. Philoctetes is healed by Machon, fights in single combat with Alexandrus and kills him. The dead body is outraged by Menlaws, but the Trojans recover and bury it. After this Diphobus marries Helen, Odysseus brings Neoptolemus from Sirhos and gives him his father's arms, and the ghost of Achilles appears to him. Eurypolis the son of Telephus arrives to aid the Trojans, shows his prowess and is killed by Neoptolemus. The Trojans are now closely besieged, and Eptus, by Athena's instruction, builds the wooden horse. Odysseus disfigures himself and goes into Ilium as a spy, and there being recognized by Helen, plots with her for the taking of the city, after killing certain of the Trojans, he returns to the ships. Next he carries the Palladium out of Troy with help of Diomedes. Then after putting their best men in the wooden horse and burning their huts, the main body of the Hellenes sail to Tenedos. The Trojans, supposing their troubles over, destroy a part of their city wall and take the wooden horse into their city and feast as though they had conquered the Hellenes. Fragment hash 2. Pseudo Herodotus, Life of Homer, I sing of Ilium and Dardania, the land of fine horses, wherein the Danai, followers of Oz, suffered many things. Fragment hash 3. Scoli asked on Aristophanes, Knights 1056 and Aristophanes Ib. The story runs as follows, Aras and Odysseus were quarrelling as to their achievements, says the poet of the Little Iliad, and Nestor advised the Hellenes to send some of their number to go to the foot of the walls and overhear what was said about the valour of the heroes named above. The eavesdroppers heard certain girls disputing, one of them saying that Aras was by far a better man than Odysseus and continuing as follows, for Aras took up and carried out of the strife the hero, 
Pilu's son, this great Odysseus cared not to do. To this another replied by Athena's contrivance, Why, what is this you say? A thing against reason and untrue. Even a woman could carry a load once a man had put it on her shoulder, but she could not fight. For she would fail with fear if she should fight. Fragment hash for, Eustathius, 285. 34. The writer of the Little Iliad says that Aras was not buried in the usual way 3101, but was simply buried in a coffin, because of the king's anger. Fragment hash 5. Eustathius on Homer, ill. 326. The author of the Little Iliad says that Achilles after putting out to sea from the country of Telephus came to land there. The storm carried Achilles the son of Peleus to Sirhos, and he came into an uneasy harbour there in that same night. Fragment hash 6. Scoli asked on Pindar, Nem. 685. About the spear shaft was a hoop of flashing gold, and a point was fitted to it at either end. Fragment hash 7, Scoli asked on Euripid's Troths, 822, the vine which the son of Cronos gave him as a recompense for his son. It bloomed richly with soft leaves of gold and grape clusters. Hephaestus wrought it and gave it to his father Zeus, and he bestowed it on Laomedon as a price for Ganymedes. Fragment hash 8, Pausanias, 3. 26 9. The writer of the epic Little Iliad says that Machon was killed by Eurypolis, the son of Telephus. Fragment hash 9, Homer, Odyssey 4. 247 and Scoli asked, he disguised himself, and made himself like another person, a beggar, the like of whom was not by the ships of the Achaeans. The cyclic poet uses beggar as a substantive, and so means to say that when Odysseus had changed his clothes and put on rags, there was no one so good for nothing at the ships as Odysseus. Fragment hash 10, 3102 Plutarch, Moralia, p. 153 f, and Homer put forward the following verses as Leeches gives them, Muse, tell me of those things which neither happened before nor shall be hereafter. And Hesiod answered, but when horses with rattling hoofs wreck chariots, striving for victory about the tomb of Zeus. And it is said that, because this reply was specially admired, Hesiod won the tripod, at the funeral games of Amphidamas. Fragment hash 11, Scoli asked on Lycophor, 344, Sinon as it had been arranged with him, secretly showed a signal light to the Hellenes. Thus Leischis writes, it was midnight, and the clear moon was rising. Fragment hash 12, Pausanias, x 25. 5. Megs is represented 3,103 wounded in the arm just as Leischias the son of Ischylinus of Pyrrha describes in his sack of Ilium where it is said that he was wounded in the battle which the Trojans fought in the night by Admetus, son of Orgyes. Lycomedes too is in the picture with a wound in the wrist, and Leischias says he was so wounded by Agenor. Pausanias, x 26. 4. Leischias also mentions Astinus, and here he is, fallen on one knee, while Neoptolemus strikes him with his sword. Pausanias, 
x26. 8. The same writer says that Helicon was wounded in the night battle, but was recognized by Odysseus and by him conducted alive out of the fight. Pausanias, x27. 1. Of them 3104, Lysias says that Ion was killed by Neoptolemus, and Admetus by Philoctetes. He also says that Priam was not killed at the heart of Zeus Herceus, but was dragged away from the altar and destroyed offhand by Neoptolemus at the doors of the house. Lysias says that Axion was the son of Priam and was slain by Eurypolis, the son of Euamon. Agenor, according to the same poet, was butchered by Neoptolemus. Fragment hash 13, Aristophanes, Lysistrata 155 and Scoli asked, men laws at least when he caught a glimpse somehow of the breasts of Helen unclad, cast away his sword, methinks. Lysias the Pyrrhean also has the same account in his little Iliad. Pausanias, x25. 8. Concerning Aethra Lysias relates that when Ilium was taken she stole out of the city and came to the Hellenic camp where she was recognized by the sons of Theseus, and that Demophon asked her of Agamemnon. Agamemnon wished to grant him this favor, but he would not do so until Helen consented. And when he sent a herald, Helen granted his request. Fragment hash 14, Scoli asked on Lycophor. Alex. 1268. Then the bright son of bold Achilles led the wife of Hector to the hollow ships, but her son he snatched from the bosom of his rich haired nurse and seized him by the foot and cast him from a tower. So when he had fallen, bloody death and hard fate seized on Astyanax. And Neoptolemus chose out Andromesh. Hector's well-girded wife, and the chiefs of all the Achaeans gave her to him to hold requiting him with a welcome prize. And he put in ease 3,105, the famous son of horse-taming Anchises, on board his seafaring ships, a prize surpassing those of all the Danans. The Sack of Ilium Fragment Hash 1 Proclus, Crestomathia, 2. Next come two books of the Sack of Ilium, by Arctinus of Miletus with the following contents. The Trojans were suspicious of the wooden horse and standing round it debated what they ought to do. Some thought they ought to hurl it down from the rocks, others to burn it up, while others said they ought to dedicate it to Athena. At last this third opinion prevailed. Then they turned to mirth and feasting believing the war was at an end. But at this very time two serpents appeared and destroyed Laocoon and one of his two sons, a portent which so alarmed the followers of Aeneas that they withdrew to Ida. Sinon then raised the fire signal to the Achaeans having previously got into the city by pretense. The Greeks then sailed in from Tenedos, and those in the wooden horse came out and fell upon their enemies, killing many and storming the city. Neoptolemus kills Priam who had fled to the altar of Zeus Herceus, 1. Menlaus finds Helen and takes her to the ships, after killing Diphobus and are as the son of Ilus, while trying to drag Cassandra away by force, tears away with her the image of Athena. At this the Greeks are so enraged that they determine to stone Aras, who only escapes from the danger threatening him by taking refuge at the altar of Athena. 
the Greeks, after burning the city, sacrifice Polyxena at the tomb of Achilles, Odysseus murders Astyanax, Neoptolemus takes Andromache as his prize, and the remaining spoils are divided. Demophon and Achamas find Aethra and take her with them. Lastly the Greeks sail away and Athena plans to destroy them on the high seas. Fragment Hash 2, Dionysius Halicon, Rom. Antic. I-68, according to Arctinus, one palladium was given to Dardanus by Zeus, and this was in Ilium until the city was taken. It was hidden in a secret place and a copy was made resembling the original in all points and set up for all to see, in order to deceive those who might have designs against it. This copy the Achaeans took as a result of their plots. Fragment Hash 3, Scoli asked on Euripides, Andromache 10. The cyclic poet who composed the sack says that Astyanax was also hurled from the city wall. Fragment Hash 4, Scoli asked on Euripides, Troads 31, for the followers of Acamas and Demophon took no share, it is said, of the spoils, but only Aethra, for whose sake, indeed, they came to Ilium with Menest Hughes to lead them. Lysimachus, however, says that the author of the sack writes as follows, The Lord Agamemnon gave gifts to the sons of Theseus and to bold Menestheus, shepherd of hosts. Fragment Hash 5, Eustathius on Iliad, 13. 515 some say that such praise as this 3201 does not apply to physicians generally, but only to Machon, and some say that he only practiced surgery, while Podalaius treated sicknesses. Arctinus in the sack of Ilium seems to be of this opinion when he says, LL 1-8. For their father the famous earth shaker gave both of them gifts, making each more glorious than the other. To the one he gave hands more light to draw or cut out missiles from the flesh and to heal all kinds of wounds, but in the heart of the other he put full and perfect knowledge to tell hidden diseases and cure desperate sicknesses. It was he who first noticed Ara's flashing eyes and clouded mind when he was enraged. Fragment Hash 6, Diomedes in Gram, Lat. I-477, Iambus stood a little while astride with foot advanced, that so his strained limbs might get power and have a show of ready strength. The Returns Fragment Hash 1, Proclus, Crestomathia, 2, after the sack of Ilium follow the returns in five books by Agias of Trozen. Their contents are as follows. Athena causes a quarrel between Agamemnon and men laws about the voyage from Troy. Agamemnon then stays on to appease the anger of Athena. Diomedes and Nestor put out to sea and get safely home. After them Menlaus sets out and reaches Egypt with five ships, the rest having been destroyed on the high seas. Those with Calchas, Leonce, and Polypoetes go by land to Colophon and bury Tyasias who died there. When Agamemnon and his followers were sailing away, the ghost of Achilles appeared and tried to prevent them by foretelling what should befall them. The storm at the rocks called Caphorides is then described, with the end of Lacrian Aras. Neoptolemus, warned by Thetis, journeys overland and, coming into Thrace, meets Odysseus at Marinia, 
and then finishes the rest of his journey after burying Phoenix who dies on the way. He himself is recognized by Pelus on reaching the Molossi. Then comes the murder of Agamemnon by Aegisthus and Clytemnistra, followed by the vengeance of Orists and Pylades. Finally, Menlaws returns home. Fragment hash 2, argument to Euripid's Medi, forth with Medi made Eason a sweet young boy and stripped his old age from him by her cunning skill, when she had made a brew of many herbs in her golden cauldrons. Fragment hash 3, pause Aeneas, I too. The story goes that Heracles was besieging Themyssa on the Thermodon and could not take it, but Antiope, being in love with Theseus who was with Heracles on this expedition, betrayed the place. Hegias gives this account in his poem. Fragment hash 4, Eustathius, 1796 45. The Colophonian author of the Returns says that Telemachus afterwards married Circe, while Telegonus the son of Circe correspondingly married Penelope. Fragment hash 5. Clement of Alex. Strom, 6. 212. 8. For gifts beguile men's minds and their deeds as well. 3301 Fragment Hash 6, Pausanias, X28. 7. The Poetry of Homer and the Returns, for here too there is an account of Hads and the terrors there, know of no spirit named Eurynomus. Athena Ouz, 281b. The writer of The Return of the Atridae 3302 says that Tantalus came and lived with the gods, and was permitted to ask for whatever he desired. But the man was so immoderately given to pleasures that he asked for these and for a life like that of the gods. At this Zeus was annoyed, but fulfilled his prayer because of his own promise but to prevent him from enjoying any of the pleasures provided, and to keep him continually harassed, he hung a stone over his head which prevents him from ever reaching any of the pleasant things nearby. The Telegoni Fragment Hash 1, Proclus, Crestomathia, 2, after the returns comes the Odyssey of Homer and then the Telegoni in two books by Eugamon of Siren, which contain the following matters. The suitors of Penelope are buried by their kinsmen, and Odysseus, after sacrificing to the nymphs, sails to Elias to inspect his herds. He is entertained there by Polyxenus and receives a mixing bowl as a gift. The story of Trophonius and Agamedes and Orgias then follows. He next sails back to Ithaca and performs the sacrifices ordered by Tiresias, and then goes to Thesprotis where he marries Chalidus, queen of the Thesprotians. A war then breaks out between the Thesprotians, led by Odysseus, and the Brigi. Us routs the army of Odysseus and Athena engages with us, until Apollo separates them. After the death of Chalidus Polypoetes, the son of Odysseus, succeeds to the kingdom, while Odysseus himself returns to Ithaca. In the meantime Telegonus, while travelling in search of his father, lands on Ithaca and ravages the island. Odysseus comes out to defend his country, but is killed by his son unwittingly. Telegonus, on learning his mistake, transports his father's body with Penelope and Telemachus to his mother's island, where Circe makes them immortal, and Telegonus marries Penelope, 
and Telemachus Circe. Fragment hash 2, Eustathias, 1796. 35. The author of the Telegoni, a Cyrenaean, relates that Odysseus had by Calypso a son Telegonus or Telodamus, and by Penelope Telemachus and Achasylos. Homerica The Expedition of Amphiaros Fragment Hash 1. Pseudo Herodotus, Life of Homer, sitting there in the tanner's yard, Homer recited his poetry to them. The expedition of Amphirus to Thebes and the hymns to the gods composed by him. The taking of Eshalia fragment hash 1, Eustathius, 330. 41. An account has there been given of Eurytus and his daughter Iole, for whose sake Heracles sacked Eshalia. Homer also seems to have written on this subject, as that historian shows who relates that Creophilus of Samos once had Homer for his guest and for a reward received the attribution of the poem which they call the Taking of Eshalia. Some, however, assert the opposite, that Creophilus wrote the poem, and that Homer lent his name in return for his entertainment. And so Colomachus writes, I am the work of that Samian who once received divine Homer in his house. I sing of Eurytus and all his woes and of golden-haired Iolea, and am reputed one of Homer's works. Dear heaven! How great an honor this for Creophilus! Fragment hash 2, Crammer, Ankh. Oxon. I 327, ragged garments, even those which now you see. This verse, Odyssey 14 343, we shall also find in the taking of Eshalia. Fragment hash 3, Scholest on Sophocles trick, 266. There is a disagreement as to the number of the sons of Eurytus. For Hesiod says Eurytus and Antioch had as many as four sons, but Creophilus says two. Fragment hash 4, Scoli asked on Euripides Medi, 273. Didymus contrasts the following account given by Creophilus, which is as follows. While Medi was living in Corinth, she poisoned Creon, who was ruler of the city at that time, and because she feared his friends and kinsfolk, fled to Athens. However, since her sons were too young to go along with her, she left them at the altar of Hera Acraea, thinking that their father would see to their safety. But the relatives of Creon killed them and spread the story that Medi had killed her own children as well as Creon. The Focase Fragment Hash 1. Pseudo Herodotus, Life of Homer, while living with Thestrides, Homer composed the Lesser Iliad and the Focase, though the Phocians say that he composed the latter among them. The Margites Fragment Hash 1, Sudas, S.V., Pigres. A Carian of Halicarnassus and brother of Artemisia, wife of Morsulus, who distinguished herself in war. 3401 He also wrote the Margites attributed to Homer and the Battle of the Frogs and Mice. Fragment Hash 2 Atilius Fortunationus, p. 286, Kiel. There came to Colophon an old man and divine singer, a servant of the Muses and of far shooting Apollo. In his dear hands he held a sweet toned lyre. Fragment hash 3, Plato, Alsp. 2p 147 he knew many things but knew all badly, 
Aristotle, NIC. Eth. 67, 1141. The gods had taught him neither to dig nor to plough, nor any other skill, he failed in every craft. Fragment hash for, Scoli astonishins inctus, sec 160, he refers to Margites, a man who, though well grown up, did not know whether it was his father or his mother who gave him birth, and would not lie with his wife saying that he was afraid she might give a bad account of him to her mother. Fragment hash 5, Zenobius, v. 68, The fox knows many a while, but the hedgehog's one trick 3402 can beat them all. 3403 The Circopes fragment hash 1, Sudas S.V. Sir Copes. These were two brothers living upon the earth who practiced every kind of knavery. They were called Sir Copes 3501 because of their cunning doings, one of them was named Parcelus and the other Achman. Their mother, a daughter of Memon, seeing their tricks, told them to keep clear of Black Bottom that is, of Heracles. These Circopes were sons of Thea and Ocean, and are said to have been turned to stone for trying to deceive Zeus. Liars and cheats, skilled in deeds irremediable, accomplished knaves. Far over the world they roamed deceiving men as they wandered continually. The Battle of Frogs and Mice LL 1 to 8, here I begin, and first I pray the choir of the muses to come down from Helicon into my heart to aid the lay which I have newly written in tablets upon my knee. Fain would I sound in all men's ears that awful strife, that clamorous deed of war, and tell how the mice proved their valour on the frogs and rivalled the exploits of the giants. Those earth born men, as the tale was told among mortals. Thus did the war begin. LL 9 to 12. One day, a thirsty mouse who had escaped the ferret, dangerous foe, set his soft muzzle to the lake's brink and reveled in the sweet water. There, a loud voiced pond lark espied him, and uttered such words as these. LL 13 to 23, Stranger, who are you? Whence come you to this shore, and who is he who bego you? Tell me all this truly and let me not find you lying. For if I find you worthy to be my friend, I will take you to my house and give you many noble gifts such as men give to their guests. I am the King Puffjaw and am honoured in all the pond, being ruler of the frogs continually. The father that brought me up was Mudman who mated with Water Lady by the banks of Eridanus. I see, indeed, that you are well looking and stouter than the ordinary, accepted king and a warrior in fight, but, come, make haste and tell me your descent. LL 24 to 55. Then Crumb Snatcher answered him and said, Why do you ask my race, which is well known amongst all, both men and gods and the birds of heaven? Crumb Snatcher am I called, and I am the son of Bread Nibbler, he was my stout hearted father, and my mother was Quern Licker, the daughter of Hamnor the king. She bare me in the mouse hole and nourished me with food, figs and nuts and dainties of all kinds. But how are you to make me your friend, who am altogether different in nature? For you get your living in the water, but I am used to eat such foods as men have, 
I never miss the thrice kneaded loaf in its neat, round basket, or the thin wrapped cake full of sesame and cheese, or the slice of ham, or liver vested in white fat, or cheese just curdled from sweet milk, or delicious honey cake which even the blessed gods long for or any of all those cates which cooks make for the feasts of mortal men, larding their pots and pans with spices of all kinds. In battle I have never flinched from the cruel onset, but plunged straight into the fray and fought among the foremost. I fear not man though he has a big body but run along his bed and bite the tip of his toe and nibble at his heel, and the man feels no hurt and his sweet sleep is not broken by my biting. But there are two things I fear above all else the whole world over, the hawk and the ferret, for these bring great grief on me, and the piteous trap wherein is treacherous death. Most of all I fear the ferret of the keener sort which follows you still even when you dive down your hole. 3601 I gnaw no radishes and cabbages and pumpkins, nor feed on green leeks and parsley, for these are food for you who live in the lake. LL 56-64 Then Puffjaw answered him with a smile. Stranger you boast too much of Bella matters, we too have many marvels to be seen both in the lake and on the shore. For the son of Kronos has given us frogs the power to lead a double life, dwelling at will in two separate elements, and so we both leap on land and plunge beneath the water. If you would learn of all these things, tease easy done. Just mount upon my back and hold me tight lest you be lost, and so you shall come rejoicing to my house. LL 65-81, so said he, and offered his back. And the mouse mounted at once, putting his paws upon the other's sleek neck and vaulting nimbly. Now at first, while he still saw the land nearby, he was pleased, and was delighted with Puff Jaws swimming, but when dark waves began to wash over him, he wept loudly and blamed his unlucky change of mind, he tore his fur and tucked his paws in against his belly, while within him his heart quaked by reason of the strangeness, and he longed to get to land, groaning terribly through the stress of chilling fear. He put out his tail upon the water and worked it like a steering oar, and prayed to heaven that he might get to land. But when the dark waves washed over him he cried aloud and said, Not in such wise did the bull bear on his back the beloved load, when he brought Europa across the sea to Crete, as this frog carries me over the water to his house raising his yellow back in the pale water. LL 82-92 Then suddenly a water snake appeared, a horrid sight for both alike, and held his neck upright above the water. And when he saw it, Puffjaw dived at once, and never thought how helpless a friend he would leave perishing, but down to the bottom of the lake he went and escaped black death. But the mouse, so deserted, at once fell on his back, in the water. He wrung his paws and squeaked in agony of death, many times he sank beneath the water and many times he rose up again kicking. But he could not escape his doom, for his wet fur weighed him down heavily. Then at the last, as he was dying, he uttered these words. LL 93-98 Ah, Puffjaw, you shall not go unpunished for this treachery. You threw me, a castaway, off your body as from a rock. Vile coward. 
On land you would not have been the better man, boxing, or wrestling, or running, but now you have tricked me and cast me in the water. Heaven has an avenging eye, and surely the host of mice will punish you and not let you escape. LL 99-109, with these words he breathed out his soul upon the water. But Lick Platter as he sat upon the soft bank saw him die and, raising a dreadful cry, ran and told the mice. And when they heard of his fate, all the mice were seized with fierce anger and bade their heralds summon the people to assemble towards dawn at the house of Bread Nibbler, the father of hapless crumb snatcher who lay outstretched on the water face up, a lifeless corpse, and no longer near the bank, poor wretch, but floating in the midst of the deep. And when the mice came in haste at dawn, Bread Nibbler stood up first, Enraged at his son's death, and thus he spoke. LL 110 to 121, friends, even if I alone had suffered great wrong from the frogs, assuredly this is a first essay at mischief for you all. And now I am pitiable, for I have lost three sons. First the abhorred ferret seized and killed one of them, catching him outside the hole, then ruthless men dragged another to his doom when by unheard of arts they had contrived a wooden snare, a destroyer of mice, which they call a trap. There was a third whom I and his dear mother loved well, and him Puff Jaw has carried out into the deep and drowned. Come then, and let us arm ourselves and go out against them when we have arrayed ourselves in rich wrought arms. LL 122-131, with such words he persuaded them all to gird themselves. And ours who has charge of war equipped them. First they fastened on greaves and covered their shins with green bean pods broken into two parts which they had gnawed out, standing over them all night. Their breastplates were of skin stretched on reeds, skillfully made from a ferret they had flayed. Four shields each had the centerpiece of a lamp, and their spears were long needles all of bronze, the work of ours and the helmets upon their temples were peanut shells. LL 132-138, so the mice armed themselves. But when the frogs were aware of it, they rose up out of the water and coming together to one place gathered a council of grievous war. And while they were asking whence the quarrel arose, and what the cause of this anger, a herald drew near bearing a wand in his paws, pot visitor the son of great-hearted cheese carver. He brought the grim message of war, speaking thus, LL 139-143, Frogs, the mice have sent me with their threats against you, and bid you arm yourselves for war and battle for they have seen Crumb Snatcher in the water whom your King Puff Jaw slew. Fight, then, as many of you as are warriors among the frogs. LL 144-146 With these words he explained the matter. So when this blameless speech came to their ears, the proud frogs were disturbed in their hearts and began to blame Puff Jaw. But he rose up and said, LL 147 to 159, Friends, I killed no mouse, nor did I see one perishing. Surely he was drowned while playing by the lake and imitating the swimming of the frogs and now these wretches blame me who am guiltless. 
Come then, let us take counsel how we may utterly destroy the wily mice. Moreover, I will tell you what I think to be the best. Let us all gird on our armor and take our stand on the very brink of the lake, where the ground breaks down sheer, then when they come out and charge upon us, let each seize by the crest the mouse who attacks him, and cast them with their helmets into the lake, for so we shall drown these dry hobs 3602 in the water and merrily set up here a trophy of victory over the slaughtered mice. LL 160-167, by this speech he persuaded them to arm themselves. They covered their shins with leaves of mallows, and had breastplates made of fine green beet leaves, and cabbage leaves, skillfully fashioned, for shields. Each one was equipped with a long, pointed rush for a spear, and smooth snail shells to cover their heads. Then they stood in close locked ranks upon the high bank, waving their spears, and were filled, each of them, with courage. LL 168-173 Now Zeus called the gods to starry heaven and showed them the martial throng and the stout warriors so many and so great, all bearing long spears, for they were as the host of the centaurs and the giants. Then he asked with a sly smile, who of the deathless gods will help the frogs and who the mice? And he said to Athena, LL 174 to 176, my daughter, will you go aid the mice? For they all frolic about your temple continually, delighting in the fat of sacrifice and in all kinds of food. LL 177 to 196, so then said the son of Kronos. But Athena answered him, I would never go to help the mice when they are hard pressed, for they have done me much mischief, spoiling my garlands and my lamps too, to get the oil. And this thing that they have done vexes my heart exceedingly, they have eaten holes in my sacred robe, which I wove painfully spinning a fine woof on a fine warp, and made it full of holes. And now the moneylender is at me and charges me interest which is a bitter thing for immortals. For I borrowed to do my weaving, and have nothing with which to repay. Yet even so I will not help the frogs, for they also are not considerable. Once, when I was returning early from war, I was very tired, and though I wanted